The grass bows down. The pilgrims walk lightly. By Izzy Wasserstein. Reading time, 25 minutes. Izzy Wasserstein teaches writing and literature at a Midwestern university and writes poetry and fiction. Her work has appeared in Clark's World magazine, Fireside magazine, Apex, and elsewhere. Her most recent poetry collection is When Creation Falls. She shares a home with her spouse, Nora E. Darrington, and their animal companions. She's an enthusiastic member of the 2017 class of Clarion West and likes to slowly run long distances. My mother kept an old faith, and when I was young, she would tell me stories of the Acer. She explained how, each day, Odin sends his ravens into the world. Hugin and Munin, thought and memory, scour the globe for what they may learn. They seek to uncover the secret to preventing Ragnarok, the death of all he has worked to build. Until the ravens return, the god sits motionless as a statue. For without them, what is he? We crest the ridge, and the grasslands stretch to the horizon, each lavender blade as tall as my shoulder. The wild fields ripple in the wind, mottled by cloud shadow. If I could, I would stay and watch the light and dark play over the wilderness. But Corvatch starts down the slope immediately, and I must hurry to keep up. I am the guest of honor, or possibly the subject of a trial. Behind us extends a line of clavish pilgrims. Once or twice I have looked back to see dozens of them, dressed in slate gray robes, and their angular faces are dominated by protrusions that strike me alternately as a nose or a raven's beak. Though they are neither, the effect of the whole is to make them seem like a line of plague doctors, an ominous association. But they have been polite and welcoming in their formal way. At the bottom of the ridge, the rocky soil gives way to rich grassland. Corvatch turns to me, though he does not break his stride. You commune with us, Erica negotiator, by joining our pilgrimage. Now you may see something you have never seen before. The briefing documents I had read commented on the clavish tendency toward understatement, and noted that it was most pronounced among devotees of the known path. Even so, I am not prepared for what happens. Corvatch gestures casually with his hand, and before us the grass bows down. There is no other way to describe it, the stalks all around sway gently in a light breeze, but the ones right in front of us each bend at the tuft that makes up the base of the blade and lie flat before us. We begin, Corvatch says, as he steps forward. For yards before each footfall, the grass in front of him ripples and bends down. We walk easily on the path created for us, long grass on either side standing tall. I have come to Clava to seek the continued aid of the clavish. They are more than happy to share their technology with humanity, giving us access to the stars, to advanced terraforming techniques, and much more, all at a very reasonable price. But in each negotiation, there is a demand. Through some method I do not understand, they choose a negotiator from among human volunteers who must complete a task to seal the agreement. Our Xena sociologists haven't solved the riddle of what, if anything, connects the negotiators they select, nor the tasks. One negotiation involved winning an elaborate game played with tiny, exquisite moving figures. Another negotiator was tasked with maintaining the health of a pond for a full year. One negotiator composed poetry. We have walked for kilometers when Corvatch, moving at the same unyielding pace as ever, breaks his silence. He does not take his eyes off the folding path before him. Erica Negotiator, I speak to you now as Corvatch Negotiator, not Corvatch First Walker. Do you understand? I think so. You speak not for your religious order, but of our negotiation. So it is. I have a task for you. Should you fulfill it, we will share with you the genetic reclamation technology your people request. In typical fashion, he does not say, and if you fail, we will deny it to you. What else should I expect? The clavish are the most advanced species humanity has encountered, 
yet they also prioritize such things as pilgrimage across uninhabited islands and cryptic, puzzling negotiations. I understand, I say. Your task is to discover why the grass kneels before our passing. He walks on. For the first time in many years, I feel a spark of excitement and the desire to solve a mystery, to learn something new. I am surprised by joy. That joy pulls me forward and brings with it echoes of the past. I was packing for Venus when Maeve poked her head into the bedroom and laughed. I flushed with embarrassment. What? I asked. I was sitting on the bed, surrounded by stacks of clothing, shoes, research notes, bioscanners, and transmitters, packing and unpacking them as I tried to make a year's worth of gear fit into just one suitcase. Maeve had only a sturdy backpack braced against her shoulders. I'm laughing at you, silly, she said so sweetly that I couldn't hold it against her. We're not headed to one of the far colonies. It's always wise to be prepared, I said defensively. That's one philosophy, she said. And it's useful when putting together a research grant. But when it comes to the actual trip, I prefer a different one. I arched my eyebrow. And what's that? Travel light, she said. I grunted. Easy for you to say. You're not responsible for the equipment, the logistics. I know, I know. She sat down next to me, put an arm around me. For all her talk of traveling lightly, her pack was heavy enough that the bed sank down where she sat, pulling everything, including me, toward her. You are thorough and rigorous, and I appreciate it. But when we're dealing with the storms on the equator, you won't want to be lugging around extra weight. I just want the necessary amount of weight, I said and offered what I hoped was a playful pout. I can help, she promised. We just focus on what's essential and leave the rest. Her grin was an admonition, a tease, and a promise all at once. Focus on what's essential, I said, cupping her cheek in my hand. I like that. Eventually, we finished packing. Odin sends his ravens out into the world to gather knowledge, for he is an old god, and wise, and he knows that he must learn much if he is to prevent Ragnarok. Among the things he knows is that he likely cannot prevent it. The end is coming for him for all the gods, but he continues to seek a way to change the future. While the birds are flown from him, it is as if he is dead or never born. When they return, his fate is one day nearer. Corvatch walks on through the bowing grass. I follow along with him as best I can. He never hurries, never shows any sense of urgency. He is implacable. I suspect that he could walk day and night across the entire pilgrimage if he had to do so. He stops promptly at sundown, though, and the pilgrims at the back slump to the ground. I join them, for I am even more exhausted than they are. They have no need to perform tests on the grass, then rush to catch up with him repeatedly as I do. I suspect their sleep is not haunted as mine has been with dreams of the past. My bioscanner develops analyses of the grass, the soil, the entire biome. It is of little use until I find the right questions to ask, however. Korvach must know this, just as he knows the answer to the riddle he has posed me. And I think he knows I am struggling. On the third day, when I catch up with him again from examining another sample, he does not speak until I catch my breath. How is your progress, Erica negotiator? He asks, his stride never slowing. I reflect on my struggles before answering. Each day I test hypotheses, I tell him. He tilts his head slightly. I am beginning to recognize the clavish facial expressions. I think this means the answer suits him. If you wish to discuss what you have learned, I will always listen, he says. Currently, my scanner is tracing the product of microprocessors I injected into a stalk to see if there is some subterranean connection between individual plants I haven't detected. If the signals spread to other plants, I will be close to an answer. In the meantime, I find myself happy to talk. First, I checked to see if all the stalks are part of a single organism, as with some plants on Earth, I told him. I see, he says, inclining his head. 
He suspected I would try this. They are not. Next, I checked pheromone signaling. And? Nothing I can detect. Ah, the smell of the fields, he says. Each year for 115 years, I have made this journey, and each year the smell is a connection to my past. The afternoon is thick with the scent, like cut apples and roasted peppers. It is a smell to hold on to. I've never seen anything like it, I say. There's no macroscopic fauna I can find on this whole island, and no other flora either. Just the grass stretching endless. The place is impossible to discuss without slipping into something approaching poetry. As though it is opaque to science, I think grimly. But the clavish chose me from among many volunteers. Surely they picked a biologist for a reason. Perhaps they know of my work with dolphins. It is the practice of our faith, he says. Such a strange way to put it. I will run more tests, I say. If fortune is with me, each failure will bring me closer to success. Each step takes us closer to the coast, he says, and I wonder if he's chastising me or urging me on. A year after we returned from Venus, I came home to find Maeve staring out over the sea. The view was spectacular, each Manhattan high-rise resting on reclaimed junk turned into a home for coral. Two hundred feet beneath us, life bloomed in the once dead seas. She looked out over the water, and for a moment I was completely content. The view was a daily reminder of the work we had done, the painstaking but rewarding process of healing the seas. Each day I taught enthusiastic students at the flotilla, and each night I came home to Maeve. What more could I ask? That's when I caught sight of her reflection in the glass. Her eyes were red, her cheeks slick. She paced away when I met her gaze, but I hurried to her. What's wrong? A letter came for you, she said. I rushed to the table. There was only one reason anyone would hire a courier to deliver a physical document. Sure enough, the letter was emblazoned by the seal of the flotilla. I felt Maeve watching me as I broke the seal and read, when I looked up at her, she had twisted her hands into tight knots and was working ineffectually to keep her face neutral. They've approved it. I fought to keep the excitement out of my voice. The whole grant. I would be overseeing a team of students working on the next phase, the Dolphin Reintroduction Program. That meant job security and a significant budget and a chance to play a major role in reshaping the whole of the Atlantic. Good, she said, and I was shocked to realize she didn't mean it. From the look on her face, she was too. I mean, I'm glad for you, Erica. I know how hard you've been working for it. We've been working for it, I say. Outside the sunset cast the sea in pink and gold. She gave me a look that shatters me each time I think about it. Anyway, she said. Congratulations. What is this? I thought you'd be happy for me. She hesitated. I thought so too. I told myself I'd be happy for you, for us. But sometimes, sometimes the world doesn't unfold the way we hope. I could feel my jaw hanging open. I forced it closed. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Yes, she said. And it will be your life. It will open project after project to you. They'd be a fool to let you get away. What's wrong with that? I felt anger bubbling up, anger I didn't understand. It's the end point, she said and paced over to the window. The city's lights were burning against the last of the day. It means you'll never take a field assignment on Europa or a colony or... We could never hope to get an appointment this good off-world. Probably not, she said, and was silent so long I was surprised when she continued. Do you remember that night on Venus, when we watched the Arenaceous Venus foraging? We'd watched it for close to an hour, its small nose exploring the undergrowth, rooting through the rich loam, 
looking so much like its cousins on Earth, save that it was slightly smaller and its coat was a shimmering green. I could never forget it. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, I said. You told me then that you never wanted to stop exploring. Oh. I, this is a kind of exploring, rebuilding what we've lost. She ran a hand through her hair and turned back to me. Earth's going to be okay, she said. Even if you didn't take the grant, someone else would get it and reintroduce the dolphins. Why does it have to be you? Because I'm good at it, Maeve, and because it's worth doing. Yes, she said. And it means we're staying here forever, rebuilding what we've previously screwed up, when there's everything out there. I was still clutching the delicate acceptance letter. My hands shook. I could see the shape things were taking, and I felt something awful curl itself within me. When Hugin returns, and Moonin is absent, Odin is lost. His mind is alive with thought, but with no memory to guide him, he cannot plan for Ragnarok. He cannot draw on the wisdom of the past. He is useless, incapable of action, for his mind is as blank and shapeless as a block of stone. On the fifth night, the pilgrims camp just beyond a rise. While they settle in, I backtrack and sit on the bare rock at its peak. I watch the sky as the stars come out in their unfamiliar constellations. This is my first trip outside of the soul system. For a long time, I had no wish for such a journey, until restlessness or regret changed my mind. The night here is darker than any on earth, with no moon, nothing but the stars and the rustling of the grass. It is a beauty as vibrant as any field of flowers, yet somehow as desolate as a desert. I do not notice Korvatch has come up behind me until he speaks. Is it a sight worth seeing? Very much so, I say. I wish. There is someone I very much wish could see it. Maeve would have loved it here. But if she were still with me, I would never have followed this path. Korvatch is comfortable with silence. He does not press me, but neither does he hurry on. Finally, I speak again. There is no trace of a neural network and no microfauna that would explain the grass's behavior. A team of experts with proper equipment would no doubt crack the case quickly, but whatever the clavish want me to learn, I alone must discover it. I am told, Korvach says, and sits beside me, that on earth many people practice a meditation of stillness. It's true, I say. More than one of our faiths teach such things. I do not see the connection, but it is a better topic than my failure to find answers. You would commune with me, Erica negotiator, if you would share whether you keep such a faith? I do not keep them. Once, I thought I could never be still, and then the time for movement had passed before I realized I had already halted. A sad thing, he said. I too could not keep a faith of stillness. I must keep moving forward, for movement is life. How else will the path know us? I thought known path referred to you knowing it. One could not be true without the other, he says and stands. Good night, Erica negotiator. We resume our journey at dawn. It is a reminder of how little time I have left. In less than a day, the pilgrimage will be over, and I will have succeeded or failed. I stay some time on the rise and then push my way toward camp through the grass. It has already risen behind us. When sleep takes me, I dream of Maeve and of ravens. I did not need to check the time to know that Maeve's ship would be leaving soon. Beneath me, the earth spread like a familiar face. Each year she grew more beautiful, each year a bit greener. In my lifetime, she would be as green as in the old images. And long after I am dead, perhaps Maeve will look down on a world so verdant, one would not know it was the work of many generations to salvage it. I turned away from the viewport to find Maeve watching me. For once, she stood still, her backpack thrown over her shoulder. The strap was ragged around the edges, and the seams were caked with dirt. 
The captain wants me on board in five, she said. Her eyes shone, though with sadness or excitement, I couldn't say. On impulse, I took her hands. The last moments, the last of us, and I couldn't find anything to say. It's not too late, you know, she said. You can still come with us. The colony ship would take a qualified biologist in a moment. They'd take almost anyone who was willing to head 400 years to the ragged edge of human exploration. Or you could stay. I expected anger, I think. I was so miserable, I would have picked a fight just to be sure she felt something. But she looked at me with pity. There's a whole universe out there. Worlds where humans have never set foot. I can't turn my back on that. But you can turn your back on me. That did it. After all this, I thought you'd want me to be happy. I want us to be happy. Behind her was the embrace of the Milky Way and a moon-bright lance, a vessel accelerating toward relativistic speeds. We don't want the same things anymore, she said, as though I didn't know it keenly. You could be happy with me, I insisted. You don't have to throw away everything we've built together. I'm not throwing it away, Erica. The past is always there. It's a tool for discovering the future. It took me a very long time to make sense of that. I have to go, she continued after a moment. We kissed, and she turned away. When she was almost gone down the corridor, I shouted after her. Will you think of me? She glanced over her shoulder, flashed a smile. You'll always be part of me. Then she turned the corner. I wasn't right for a long time after that. Hugin does not return but Moonin does. Odin's consciousness has fled, but guided by memory, he follows the path laid out for him. Each step enacts the promise of the one before, and each enables the next. Thus he faces the future. Ahead of the pilgrims, a single point of light, a ship in the bay, ready to collect us and take us to civilization. I rush through the high grass, holding the sensor high above my head. I find Korvach keeping his steady pace. We will reach the bay hours from now, as the sun dips behind the waves. Korvach, I shout, then hold my side as I try to catch my breath. He does not slow. Yes. His tone is serene, but his face tilts in what might be a smile. When you take this pilgrimage, do you set out and finish at the same time each year? We do. Definitely a smile. Down to the minute, I believe. Yes, Erica Negotiator, we do. Why do you ask? Because I think I've solved it. And what have you discovered? It's prions. He does not stop, but he shifts his whole torso to face me as he walks, reminding me of a curious corvid. I push on. Prion folding, specifically. Proteins that pass on their shape to other nearby proteins. In fauna, prions can be deadly, misfolding proteins in the brain, for example, it creates a cascade. A similar process in plants on Earth allows them to react to changes in their environment, but nothing on Earth rises to the level of information retention in your grass. I see. Of course he knew all this already. The test was to demonstrate what I had learned. The prions solve the problem that the plants don't have brains or nervous systems. They don't need them, they don't need to interpret to understand. The prions function as their memory, so they react based on past stimulus. They don't think, but they remember. It is as you say, Erica Negotiator, Corvatch says. May I ask how you arrived at this insight? I've been thinking, I say, of stories my mother taught me, and of words, words of wisdom from someone I love, about the use of memory, and then I realized plants could have a kind of memory, too. Your insight communes with the grass and with me, Corvatch says. We walk on together for some time, toward the beach. I have been lost for so long, it feels good to know where I am heading. The stars come out, one by one. I think I would like to know more of your faith, Corvatch, I say. He tilts his face up to the sky in a gesture 
I have never seen. I very much hoped you would, Erica Pilgrim. Let us walk together. The grass communes with us by bowing down. We commune with it by following its path into the future, by moving forward. All the Turns of the Earth by Matthew Claxton Reading time, 17 minutes. Matthew Claxton is a newspaper reporter whose work has taken him from interviews in rowboats to the cockpits of vintage aircraft to uncomfortable proximity to live bears. His science fiction and fantasy has appeared in venues including Asimov's Science Fiction, Escape Pod, and Year's Best SF, edited by the late Gardner Dozois. He lives in the suburbs near Vancouver, British Columbia. You fall through time on a summer's night. The cicada hum has merged with the low buzz of the transformers atop the creosote sticky power poles. The streetlights flicker to life. You are alone in the alley, running, arm outstretched, one hand gripping a foam toy spitfire. If you can run fast enough, if your throw is strong, you can send the spitfire flying twenty yards. If you throw it just right, maybe it will keep flying will carry away the sting of hard hands and harder words that chased you out of your home into the alley. You fling out your arm and let go. Time snaps. Your sneakered foot lands in thick mud. You stumble and crash through horsetails and flowers like monstrous bloated poppies. You rise slowly, the high sun beating down on you. Your nose is assaulted by the scents of sap and wet soil, the absence of any trace of warm asphalt or diesel exhaust. It happens sometimes. Time loses its grasp on people, misplaces them. If you could visit every asylum in Lazaretto, every homeless shelter and hidden sea cave across 20,000 years, you'd find your siblings in displacement. The woman working the food truck grill who curses an earthy peasant Etruscan. The mammoth hunter north of the Clyde, who still wears his Patek Philippe watch as a talisman of his days at the investment bank. You have fallen further than most. Children are less moored in time than we suppose. Your crashing arrival attracts attention. Blunt-beaked heads are raised on supple, scaled necks. Wide brown eyes blink and assess, and decide you are no threat to the herd. They resume cropping the fat, dense ground cover. You stare at the dinosaurs as they pass by. You cry for help until your voice is hoarse, and it is only by chance that your tail does not end under the claws and teeth of a predator on the first day. After that, after the first glimpse of feathered, fanged hunters on the distant ridgeline, you learn quiet. Your story becomes one of wordless survival. You learn the taste of grubs and beetles, of bitter things that are not quite fruit. You sharpen sticks and find the patience and speed to spear darting lizards. Your first fire is a miracle. You become nightwise, sleeping in the crooks of trees to avoid the predators that prowl below. You find an island, several miles long, nourished by the silt of a broad brown river, it is too small and distant from the shore for the larger predators to visit. You brave the currents and the crocodiles on a raft of lashed sticks. The soles fall from your shoes. Your clothes rot off your body. You make what you can from sun-dried leather, leaves, plant fibers pounded and woven together with blistered fingers. You live. You live and you live and you live until the lack of human voices almost drives you to fling yourself into the hungry river. They come when you are near your last. The newcomers fall out of the southern sky like storm-tossed leaves. Black-tipped wings fold and long beaks clack happily at journey's end. They gallop on the beaches of your island, so large that the crocs scatter in their presence. Tall as giraffes, yellow beaks longer than you are tall pterosaurs. You say the word and scratch it in the mud with a smoke-blackened finger. They are more beautiful than anything you have ever seen. Love's hook catches your heart and sets itself deep in the muscle. 
Every moment you can snatch from mere survival, you spend watching them. At first there is a flock of a few dozen, but more come every day for a week until the island throngs with them. They stalk through the copses, spearing lizards and turtles and small mammals. They fly to the mainland and return with swollen bellies. But their reason for arriving on the island is to dance. The males bluster and bleat and show tongues red as June strawberries. They flap their wings and shake those great heads. They mate. The males leave. The females stay and lay eggs by moonlight in shallow scrapes above the waterline. They fuss over their nests, guard them with mad-eyed intensity. They grow thin, refusing to leave even for a moment. One cloud-shrouded night, you steal an egg. It is long and smooth, leathery and warm from the sand. You bury it in the mud near the ashes of your fire to stay warm. You leave one face open to the sky, as the mothers do. You wait. On the beach, the other eggs are pierced from within by long bills, and the young take tottering steps that turn within days into sprints and short flapping hops into the sky. The island hosts a cacophony of new life. Your egg is still, and at night you fuss and touch it and wipe tears of shame from your eyes that you've deprived the world of even one of these glorious lives. The flocks depart, heading inland toward the setting sun. The young follow in clumsy spirals, flapping fast to keep up. Your egg is silent. You have given up when, days after the exodus, it twitches, you feel it come alive, the beat of wings and beak thrumming through the earth and up through your feet. The yellow bill pierces the shell. A long head, beak, and fine fur slick finds its way free for the first gasp of air. She blinks at you, the first thing she has seen of the world. At first she stays hard by your heels. You feed her grubs and insects and small frogs, but within days she is hunting her own food, too. Her beak is as long as your hand already, and she flings the sharp tip down on unwary prey and immobile seed alike. She takes her first flights tentatively. You run with her up and down the beach, flapping your arms. You demonstrate the way she should take flight with a strong push-up of her wings. She follows your clumsy movements with a head cocked curiously to one side. You laugh and flop on the sand, and she pecks your ear to prompt you for food. You gently rub her long neck with two fingers, and she trills back. You will never name her, for what are names to the only two people in all the world? She grows. By the turning of the season she is as large as you are, and flying off to the far shore to hunt by herself most days. She returns with a full belly, with a beak smeared with blood, while she is gone, you feel a knot in your own stomach. Twice she comes back bleeding. There's nothing you can do, not about the shallow gash just under one eye, not about the three raking claw marks on her back. Nothing but worry. Several times you catch her standing on the beach staring south. She clacks her beak, tasting the wind, and you pretend not to know what calls to her. She leaves when a flock of her kind pass over one morning. You are sleeping next to her when she wakes, and you feel her heartbeat quicken. You rub sleep from your eyes, and through the canopy see a flock of impossible size passing overhead. Hundreds, thousands of pterosaurs, enough to return the pink dawn to shadowed night for a time. She gallops to the beach before you are fully awake. You scramble after her, and by the time you've pushed through the bushes, she's airborne. You watch until you lose her in the pale-winged stream of bodies. You watch the flock until it dwindles into the southern plains. You ache for days. The river rises and falls with the rains in the hills. The young crocs are not wary enough to avoid your lures. You spend days pounding plant fibers, twining rope, chipping stone. The monotony of survival weighs on you. You subsist on hope. When you hear the wings, you sprint through the island's undergrowth to the beach. 
She lands with the first wave, grown so large in her southern journey. She squawks and clacks her beak and gallops back and forth on the sand. She has new scars, new scratches on her long bill, but you recognize her. She recognizes you. She crouches. She has to crouch to look you in the eyes now. And you throw your arms around her neck, and she click coos. You can feel her heart beating, a heart strong enough to fight hurricanes and cross continents. Again she leaves at the turn of the seasons, but she is reluctant, running back and forth with you on the beach, hopping skyward only to settle again, to nudge you with her long bill. She is waiting for you to take flight with her, to follow. The next season she again returns early, this time almost fully grown. She can snatch fruit from the treetops now. This time you are ready. She snorts at the first version of the harness, but you have time to change it, time and rope and woven fabric made through thousands of hours of mindless work. Your hands are thick calluses from the labor, your body leaner than it should be. You've sacrificed much for this. When she first accepts the harness, looped over her shoulders, cinched around her back legs, you whoop with joy. She wants to fly, to hunt on the mainland, but she's being patient while you fuss with her. She allows you to climb onto her back, to pass the loops around your harness through hers. You put your feet into the woven stirrups and hang on. She glances over her shoulder, and you can read the question there. Are you ready? You pat her flank. She drops to a crouch, then leaps into the sky. She's hesitant at first, the extra weight throwing her off, but within a few wing beats she's found her rhythm again. Awe washes over you as you rise above the island you've called home now for more than two years. So small. Around you the plain stretches out for a thousand miles, fern and flower and tree covering every inch. Herds of duckbills and horned dinosaurs chew their way through the verdant landscape, shadowed by stripe-flanked predators. She takes you on a short flight that day, to an island plateau where she hunts small burrowing mammals, sparing them one by one and then tossing them into the air and swallowing them whole. You clamber onto her back for the flight back to the island. You fly with her a dozen more times that summer, not every day, but often enough that she gets used to it. You modify the harness, add padding where your fingers detect a hint of chafing. With a fishbone needle, you sew yourself thick down-lined trousers and a coat for your flights. You haven't felt cold like that since the last time you saw snow back home. She'll take you on the migration this year. You know that. She's as eager as you are. It is not to be. You're standing at the edge of the river when it finds you, fish spear poised for a throw. She'll enjoy having a piece of that big catfish, you're thinking, when the world snaps out of focus. You stumble and skin your soft hands on the asphalt. Cicadas sing to the streetlights, and your foam and plastic spitfire falls to the ground, snapping a wing. Time bends, but it does not break. Whatever careless watchmaker oversees causality does eventually notice a stray gear and flicks it back to its proper place. You stand there for long minutes, staring at your small hands, pink-palmed and free of scars. No matter how many times you squeeze your eyes shut, they do not open again onto a Cretaceous river, an island, a pterosaur lazily preening. The tears evaporate fast off the summer hot road. You let faded memories guide you back to the porch and the swinging screen door. Things are strange at home. You have gone quiet. Your body is strange to you, well-fed but weak and small. Curses and insults slide off you, whether at the kitchen table or the schoolyard. But the next time your father raises a hand to you, he regrets it. He stares from you to the blood on the carpet and back, wondering what wild thing has possessed his child. You tell no one. Not teachers, not friends, certainly not your parents. You learn a new camouflage. Small smiles, casual friendships, pretended interest in music and videos and jokes. Years pass. You drift through university and into a job you don't quite hate in a glass office building downtown. 
You take your lunches on the roof, sitting on the ledge and remembering how it felt to dive through a sky held aloft by leather wings and the trust beyond reason called love. You live and you live and you live until you can barely keep from screaming. The cry shatters the air before dawn, waking you from a restless sleep. Your legs kick off the covers before your brain understands what's happening. Barefoot, you sprint down the stairs and onto the patch of green in front of your building. Time does not only break in one direction, and perhaps the clockmaker is not always indifferent to the quiet cries of the heart. It's early spring, and cherry blossoms swirl around her mighty wings. She snorts as they scatter across her long beak. She's taller and older, with new battle scars from many migrations. For a moment you freeze. It's been years. You are not who she was expecting. You're someone else, a carrier of memories, not the calloused, spear-hunting child by the river. But she takes in a whiff of air and clacks her beak and thrums at you deep in her chest. You bury your face in the soft down and coo at her. She crouches. There is no harness, but her neck is thick and your arms are strong enough for one flight. You clamber onto her back. She leaps in the sky to a symphony of police sirens and screams. Time will snatch her back. You know that as the city turns beneath you. Time takes all things. But some things are stronger than the span of years and cannot be erased by all the turns of the earth. One Lost Spacesuit Way by A.J. Ward Reading Time 21 Minutes A.J. Ward lives in Perth, Western Australia. He works in research management and is the facilitator for The Fish, Fantasy, Science Fiction, and Horror Writers Group at the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Writers Center. One Lost Spacesuit Way is his first published short story. There isn't much paper on your desk, so I'll keep this letter brief. The boy at the door let me in and said you were sleeping and would be down soon. Perhaps you'll wake early and we can talk, woman to spacesuit. Despite its small size, it is good that you've got your own room with a bed, where you now sleep, and a desk and chair, where I now write. You look just like him, the painter when the geese scars lived out on the farm. His hatchet face, so like yours, but burnt by the sun. I knew him when he was old. I'd sat deactivated in a wardrobe for seventeen years, and in fact belonged to Pater's daughter-in-law when she came to the farm. Some folk back then wore space suits instead of atmosphere suits, due to cost. Pater was too proud for that. When I was brought out of the wardrobe and put together in the sitting room, he sat at a rickety card table replacing elastic straps on oxygen masks. Dust danced in the light beams from his glasses. A small child was drawing in a coloring book lying on the wooden floor. Outside the sky was red with dust, the sun a small blue dot reflected into long lines on the plastic of the farm's fields. Anyway, Pater. He looked me over and got one of his sons to run a diagnostic. Grunting his assent, he returned to the delicate work of repairing face masks. That afternoon folk came out to look at me, a scrap buyer from town and a farmer from down the valley who needed a scarecrow. At the dinner table that night, Pater announced that the spacesuit, me, would be sold tomorrow, only to whom he hadn't decided yet. There were seven seats at the table, but it was only Pater, his two sons, and the small child who sat there. That night, I escaped. There was no network out on the farmstead, but the small library of books informed me of what a scrapyard was, and the position description of a scarecrow. A scarecrow contends not with crows or other small flying birds of distant earth, but the poisonous and ravenous native creatures of this planet. Scapegoat, I think, so that the plastic-covered fields are not defiled and the crops eaten. I looked in at Pater, at his two sons, at the young child. I am programmed to protect my occupant in a dangerous environment. The masks made the air suitable. There was food in the larder. No one needed my help. In one of the empty bedrooms I found my solar umbrella on top of a wardrobe. 
It would keep me charged, even with the light of this weak star. It was easy enough to open the living room window, climb down and run across the yard, past the burnt and charred timbers of an outbuilding and down to the fields. I am capable, unlike the atmosphere suits of local manufacture, of locomotion without human occupancy. I can even sustain a steady jog. But my servo engines began to whine after seven hours, so I slowed to walking. My boots were steel-capped miner's boots, would you believe? That was my second owner's profession, I think. At the farm they had called me Sam, because that was printed on my torso in white block letters. Once there was more, because in the quarry they called me Mark. The sun rose, and to the north white anvil-topped clouds, moving fast. The farm was behind me now, a pinprick of light down in the valley below. There was a small copse of what I registered as a tree analog, and there I sheltered from the storm. Back then, storms were when the winds would whip up the swarms of air snakes and cloud stars to rain down on town and country. The beasts of the air would die there and pollute the soil and poison folk. It's all sorted now, but storms do appear in old stories, like this one. While sheltering, I decided to figure out how old I was. At that moment, I was 109 e years old. I am now 253. I was built in space, operated there for a while, came here and walked around under the ground in the mines, and then sat in a wardrobe for nearly two decades. I still had eleven years, three months, two weeks, six days, eleven hours, one minute, and seventeen seconds left on my warranty, and could likely go longer with replacement parts. Do clones really remember the memories of the original? When I lived in a freedmen's commune out near Sandcastle, they were mostly clones there. At night around the fire, the clones would tell stories of who their original was and what they did. Some of them weren't even clones. I listened anyway, for they thought that I was just a nonconformist. Later, when I pushed the corpse cart during the war, soldiers told each other the same sorts of stories, and I knew they were called war lies. Was there such a thing as clone lies? No one needed my assistance on the farm, so I set off to find someone to help. I kept moving, going deeper into the native forest, until the fronds that danced at night and were still in the day hid the weak light of the sun. To keep myself charged, I climbed trees and spread out my solar umbrella, its black panels losing efficiency with every scratch from a branch or thorn. In darkness I walked, until after three years the trees began to thin. One day I stumbled out of the forest and into a logging station on the banks of the ragged Tawira. There the massive boles of native trees were chopped, dried, and pushed into the river, where they floated down to the open plain to be made into houses and furniture. Up in the highlands folks wore all kinds of environmental suits, some that looked older than I did. With the aid of a stolen roll of high-vis reflective tape, I didn't get a second glance. I looked for someone who needed my help no one did. The lumber company provided air tanks. In the station's automart, Izakayas, and the Trattoria, there was plenty of food and water for those with a company card. Printing stations provided clothing and the narcotic sleep aid, which lumberjacks and lumberjanes took in their cabins of unvarnished lumber. At the end of my first week in camp, I was found out. Requiring a charge and lacking a key to get into the suit charging stations, I snuck into a workshop, where behind the lathe was an open power point. There were also solvents and cloths to restore my battered solar umbrella. I had just laid myself down and plugged myself in when the shop steward came in. When she saw my boots sticking up behind the lathe, she swore. I knew that I would be deactivated. When booted up, I would be back on the farm, with Peter Giscar looking down at me. Instead, she ripped my charger out of the socket and swore black and blue about the workers charging equipment outside of charging stations. She got two apprentices to handle me down the corridor and into a charging station, which was much faster than plugging into the wall or waving about my solar umbrella, I can tell you. Perhaps the difference between a cup of coffee and a sleep in the bed as you are now? Once charged, I left the lumber station. I headed up the foothills into the new growth that didn't interest the loggers. Earth plants grew here and there, 
graceful frangipanis, and straggling bougainvillea amongst native nymph trees. After several weeks I found a cat. I knew about them from back in the mines, where they watched the miners at work from the dormitory windows. The cat was black and red, and not all the red was from its fur. I opened my helmet and swallowed her up, warming my interior and providing water and air. The cat thrived and was soon joined by five kittens. During the day she would haul the kittens by the nape of their neck to watch the forest go by from my helmet. At night they scratched at my visor to be let out. Mother would go out and teach them to hunt, returning with red and blue stained mouths and paws, often leaving some viscera or head at my boots as an offering. When we had crossed the range, which you would now call the Manganui, I found a fox wheezing beside a slow-moving brook. He joined the cats in my suit. At first I kept him in my right arm, using my tourniquet functions to keep it shut. After nine days, he and the cats coexisted in my torso and abdomen, but the rabbits, found amongst the Frangipani forests of the foothills, where the Manganui met the Codbo Plain, had to stay in my boots. And would you believe it, when I ran my regular six-month diagnostic, there was a family of long-haired rats living in the gaps between my extra oxygen tank and my right shoulder plate. Out in the wilderness it was fine, but when we came to the cleared forests and fields and roads and truck stops, there were problems. The animals found food. They were fruitful and multiplied. Except the lonely fox. When the farmers shot him and came out into the bush to look for the source of mice and rabbits and cats, I knew I couldn't stay. A barn on fire was an easy distraction for me to gather my animals inside me and collect the fox's little corpse. The GPS satellites were up by then, and so I had access to maps. I searched and found what I was looking for. In the delta of the Bach River there is a series of small islands. The water was fast and deep around them. I waded my way through the freezing water, irrevocably damaging my right boot in the process. There on the islands I deposited the cats and rabbits and mice where they might live in freedom. Weeds had reached the islands, but the only sign of humans was the vapor columns rising from distant atmosphere stations. Before I went across the waters again, I buried the little body of the fox and marked the place with a stone carved with its face. Limping, sometimes crawling, I made my way down the skeleton coast. For fifty years I wandered between the wrecks of ships and the ruins of lost colonies. I suffered abrasions to my chassis. My umbrella flew away in a typhoon. When I found it, an eagle had made its nest in it, and her claws and beak tore out antennae and the rubber seals along my neck before I could get my umbrella back. Strange glitches appeared in the dunes, or walking on the waves. But the wrecks there provided me with this new right boot, although it is over a century old now. To prevent myself from repeating the mistake with the fox, I filled my insides with as much junk I could salvage from the wrecks. When I made it to Sandcastle, some of it sold well to the second-hand dealers and tourists. I patched myself up as best I could, wandering the scrapyards for parts that fit. I found new cameras, but the glitch remained. I also purchased a mannequin and sawed off its head. If you wake now, as perhaps you may, for you rolled over on your small bed and made a noise, so I dropped my pen and waited to see what you would do, you would see its sun-damaged face smiling across the room from the desk. It is a disguise that has served me well, for when I had been wandering across the skeleton coast, the terraformers had been at work, and the air was getting better. Less folk were out in any kind of suit or mask, especially on the coast, as Sandcastle was back then. With the mannequin head secured by wires and tape, obscured behind my polarized visor, I could pretend that I was simply a nonconformist, a suspicious, cynical old-timer who was sure that the process would fail and we'd be flopping about in the streets, gasping for breath like fish on a jetty. A commune run by freedmen clones took me in, for they did not ask questions and allowed you to provide your own truth. In return for labor, they provided plenty of privacy. I was on a farm again, but this time I was put to work. There was shelter and air and water, but there never seemed enough food. Most nights I would feign sleep. 
I'd slip out of the dormitory and work some more to provide for my new family. Other nights I would stay in and hold down the thrashing limbs of those who cried and screamed in their sleep. One evening, returning from the creek where I caught glowing worms for bait, I found a cat in the field. For an instant I was certain it knew me, and I it, but back arched, it hissed and fled into the corn. War came. It was a civil war that achieved nothing, and for seven years produced only corpses. No secrets in war, and I was found out quickly enough by the revolutionaries' press gangs. I wasn't a military model, and my insides were so damaged from animals and scrap that no one wanted to climb inside me. I was almost two hundred years old, too old to be broken down for parts. So I was put to work hauling stretchers of wounded soldiers from the front to military hospitals, and then the corpse carts to the dachmas where I would watch the vultures in flight and at work. The army put in a better generator and gave me my new left arm. It doesn't fit correctly and clicks if I lift it above my head. Again, I wanted to help. Some of the soldiers were very young. I could hide one in myself, maybe two. I almost did. But then I saw the dead fox, living once more and prancing amongst the stretches of the field hospital. For the fox followed me from the Bach Delta. There is some glitch in my memory, for it appears faintly in my cameras every so often. Even after replacing the lenses, it is still there. Sometimes all I can see is the fox. His yips are distant, and sometimes I hear the report of a rifle and his final yelp. So, once more I filled myself up with junk. Spent ammunition rounds, medals, photos from home, propaganda pamphlets, I had to stop after lashings were ordered for a unit, as no soldier confessed to being the thief. As part of the armistice agreement, I was sent to a stockyard for appraisal. I was amongst other old suits and robots, but their concerns were narrow, their worldview provincial. I escaped on the third night, before the assessors had even seen me, for I could not help anyone there. I took up walking again. When I reached the Blue Desert, I bought an oversized saffron-yellow thob in the souk. With a kanja knife tucked into my belt to complete my disguise, I roamed the amoeba shores. There I rescued, on a fairly regular basis, tourists that got too close to the pit and became a local legend. They don't give you clones much money, I know, but do you go to the cinema? Five years ago they made a movie about me, The Amoeba's Kindly Shadow. If it's on where I'm traveling, I'll go and see it at least once. I didn't have an orphaned camel companion, but it's a nice touch. Still the fox followed me. No, I followed it, for it led me to the stranded folk on the shore. After a decade I had to leave the Blue Desert, for it became clear that the tourists were coming to see me now, instead of the natural beauty of this planet's largest, most carnivorous colony of single-celled organisms. I followed the fox still. Now they take me for a historical reenactor. Once I was offered a government pension by a local ataman who rode up with her host and surprised me on the road. All that was required was for me to parade around in my costume in the museum village. I declined. My mobility decreased. Replacement parts for such an old model are hard to find. More often than not, I get mistaken for a statue and frighten small children who crowd about me. Once I sat down on a hill in the middle of winter, when I stood up again, it was summer, and I was covered in a tangle of bougainvillea vines and cobwebs. Two weeks ago I was walking through new suburbs, cheerful houses filled with paters and maters, uncles and aunts, sisters and brothers. I was sitting on a bench across the road from a madrasa, resting my complaining motors, when the fox suddenly appeared. For eighty years I had followed him, and he had ignored me, trotting resolutely on in silence. Now he leapt into my lap, pointed his nose at the street sign on the post above me, and yipped. It read in fine flowing script, Lost Spacesuit Way. At a local cafe I asked why the street had that name. The waitress didn't know, so I went to the local government authority citadel. There, in hundred-year-old council planning records, was the answer. Lost Spacesuit Way, named for the local historical landmark rock, the Lost Spacesuit Sign. 
the memorial can be found in the Michaela Arkhangela Park. The rock was in a small park I had passed coming into town. I hurried back to it, this time faster than the fox, a red blur in my peripheral vision. The park is nice, with earth plants and natives growing in abundance, and a fine playground, open-air gym, and euthanasia maze. The rock sits at what could only be the entrance to the ladder. There, carved into the rock, is a reproduction, the bronze plaque told me, of an original paper poster which had been distributed across the district. One lost spacesuit, Samsung Mars Limited Mark 27, in good condition, reward on complete return. There was even a picture of me as I was back then. The plaque told the story of the Giscars, one of the early farming families in the region, of the fatalities in a hydroponics lab fire, how the pater had attempted to sell a valuable spacesuit to keep the farm afloat. Instead, it had disappeared. The farm was sold off at a loss, the pater died, and the remaining Giscars set out east to seek lives in the teeming metropolis, even back then, of Landing Field. The fox yipped at me and ran around my ankles. I headed east. And now you are almost out of paper. They should give you government clones more supplies. It simply isn't fair. I will write smaller now. In every town I checked births, deaths, and marriages. I peered through police arrest sheets and court records. What I found was woe and misery. And now I am here. You are the last Giscard. The grandson of the pater I knew, himself an old man by then, sold his genome to escape prescription during the same war I pushed the corpse cart. He died ninety years ago, and now you are the latest to continue to work off your ancestors' debts. I only knew him as a child, not the grown-up you now are. These boarding house rooms are too small, this city too cramped and soulless, it clings to ugly, broken rock and a deadly sea. The other clones do not know I am up here, for they too are sleepy in the midday heat, and will assume the old nonconformist has simply gotten tired of waiting and wandered out of the boarding house to return another time. My fox has now gone, and soon I too will be gone. But my shell remains. My senses slip away, my sight limited to almost human spectrum. Only the sensors in my new, one hundred year old arm work. Am I really writing this? Your wardrobe is quite small. I hope you won't mind that I have tipped your clothes on the floor. This card I am leaving with the letter is for the purchasing agent of the Landing Fields Museum of Industry. On the reverse is the price he quoted me this morning for the purchase of a genuine Samsung Mars Limited Mark 27 mostly original parts, in variable condition, payable to the young woman who will take the suit there this afternoon. Your wardrobe is small, but I can fit. In Times to Come Reading Time One Minute Our 90th anniversary kicks off with the magazine you hold in your hands, and it continues full swing throughout the year and next issue. We open March-April with the next anniversary retrospective, Raymond F. Jones' 1952 gem, Noise Level, accompanied by an introduction from Alec Navala Lee. Then we'll have the first of three installments of Derek Kunskin's serial, The House of Sticks. An unexpected discovery sets a family of hard-working prospectors on Venus down a dangerous path, with repercussions that could shape the entire planet and beyond. We'll also have a short story and tie-in fact article from Gregory Benford, a very analog take on an old adage in C.C. C. Finley's One Basket, plus fiction from Jen Reese, Andy Dudak, Catherine Wells, Richard A. Lovett, Ed Vick, and Manny Frischberg, and more, on top of all of our ongoing columns and features. You don't want to miss it. Around a World in 96 Hours Wendy Nickel Reading time, 28 minutes. Polly Wynn sprinted through orange skies. At least she pretended to, as her feet hit the treadmill in the cabin of Cloud Nine in a steady one, two, three beat. Three dashes, oh, she thought, and then shook her head. She'd been spending so much time buried in lines of dots and dashes lately, 
that now she was thinking in Morse code. She checked the time, five minutes to go before her next shift. She flipped the comlink strap to her wrist on and off to ensure it was working. Still nothing. Maybe she'd gotten the time wrong. More likely, he'd gotten the time wrong. Outside the window swept a murky haze of sulfur dioxide, through which Polly could just make out a few streaks of Venus's blue absorbers, stripes in the upper atmosphere that absorb blue and ultraviolet wavelengths, which their manned research balloon had been drifting alongside in the weeks since their arrival. Below, though it couldn't be seen through the thick cloud cover, the surface of the planet was an uninhabitable terrain of lava canals and peculiar rock formations. Why would anyone want to go to that hellscape? Casper had asked when she'd told him about the mission. You're just jealous, she'd retorted, too quickly reverting to their elementary school fight tactics, despite both siblings' decades of maturation since then. The treadmill beeped three quick beeps, S, her Morse-muddled mind thought, indicating her run was complete, and simultaneously the comm link turned red. Polly rolled her eyes and flicked the mic on. You're late, Casper. That's Commander Wynn to you. Despite the series of high-powered communication satellites and relay stations set up across three planets, her brother's voice came through the comm link after a full twenty seconds of lag, accompanied by a flurry of static. And I said, same time tomorrow. By Mars time, I'm still twenty minutes early. In fact, by your time, I'm still a whole day early. Very funny, Polly said. I'm sure Mission Control will be thrilled at our empirical evidence that the planets do indeed have different rates of rotation. You know, if you keep messing around like this, they're going to regret letting us have this communication link open while on our missions. You heard the argument Harrison gave about how it would distract us from our work? Work? Casper snorted. Oh, you mean distract the Mars team from our work. How hard is it, Pete, to float around the skies all day staring at clouds? We've been doing a lot more than just staring at clouds, Polly said, wiping the beads of sweat from her face. Our rovers have been making excellent progress in mapping out the geological shape and composition of the planet's surface. We're learning more about Venus in this one mission than we have over the last millennia. All that using 19th century technology, flying balloons and rovers that transmit in Morse code. Jules Verne would be very proud. Very funny. Not that she could argue the facts. Cloud Nine was one of the Havoc, high-altitude Venus operational concept balloons, sent into Venus's atmosphere, a sort of solar-powered airship of polytetrafluorothylene, filled with helium that kept the crew in the upper atmosphere of the planet, where the temperature, pressure, gravity, and sun's radiation were similar to Earth's surface. And on the surface below, where the temperatures were hot enough to melt lead, their wind-powered mechanical rovers, propelled forward on their treads by a series of gears and levers, transmitted information back to the balloon via Morse code. Casper never missed an opportunity to goad her about how the Venus missions represented a step backward technologically, utilizing a dead language that no one in the space program had used for at least fifty years. Of course, Morse's irrelevance hadn't stopped Casper from challenging Polly to a contest to see who could master it faster, one she was proud to say she won. What about you? Polly asked, still adding to your little rock collection. Casper's laughter came through the link with another burst of static that made Polly flinch and pull her headphones from her ear. She switched the link over to the external speaker. Actually, he said, we're about to head out on a very important task tomorrow. Jake and I are going to be the first men to travel the entire circumference of the planet, 6,779 kilometers in one shot. Our latest manned rover can go up to 70 kilometers per hour, so if we switch off shifts during driving, we can make the trip in just short of four days. We'll be like the Martian Magellan. You do know that Magellan died before his expedition returned to Spain, right? Polly grabbed the binder of the latest printouts of code received by the Venusian rover and entered the lab in the nose of Cloud Nine's gondola, where the rest of her four-man crew were busy at work. Okay, not Magellan, then, Casper said. The next guy. 
The point is, while you're on your little pleasure cruise up there in the clouds, we're making history. Pleasure cruise? Polly's crewmate Tracy looked up from her tablet. Oh, he did not just say that. We're traveling at over 300 kilometers an hour up here, Polly said. That's over four times the speed of your little Mars buggy. 300 kilometers an hour times... Casper's voice cut out, then back in. Hey, what do you say we place a little friendly wager? By my calculations, it'd take each of our teams around four Earth days to travel the entire distance around our respective planets, you and your little blimp and Jake and I in our rover. First team back to the exact same coordinates owes the other a victory dinner at Garcia's once we all get back to Earth. Polly shot her crewmates a questioning glance. Tracy, Leah, and Cheryl all nodded. Just so long as that dinner includes dessert and margaritas, Polly said, we're in. Twenty-four Earth hours later, Polly was studying the levels of suspended particulates recorded on Cloud Nine's Nephilometer, an important step in trying to determine the composition of the blue absorbers, when the comlink on her wrist lit up. Took you long enough to get your little dune buggy ready, she said after she'd switched the mic on. Unlike on some planets, there's more to traveling on Mars than just inflating a balloon and hanging on for dear life, Casper said. You ready to mark your position? Polly leaned over the radar screen and compared it with the cartographical map. Good timing. It looks like we're just passing the central peak in the Ariadne crater, so we'll be starting at Venus's prime meridian, traveling westerly with the winds. Perfect. More quietly, obviously not speaking directly into the mic, he said, Let's roll out, Jake. You'll still be able to give us a status update in another 24 Earth hours, right? Polly asked. Absolutely. We've got a comm link here in the rover, so we should be able to communicate with you, our base, or mission control, just as we have been. Polly heard her brother's crewmate let out a cry of excitement. Woohoo! You'd better hope those winds keep up there, P, Casper said. This little rover of ours has got some speed. I wouldn't get too smug, space boy. Polly smiled as she watched the digital numbers on the anemometer readout tick upward. We're clocking wind speeds of 342 kilometers per hour right now. Hear that, Jake? Casper said. Let's open this baby up and see how fast it can go. Catch you in another 24, Polly said, clicking off the mic and returning to the nephilometer. The next time Polly's comm link lit up happened to be in the middle of a spectacular Venusian lightning storm. Polly and her crewmates stood on the platform beneath the curve of the airship's bladder, each wearing a heavy chemical hazard suit to observe and document the phenomenon. All around them, brilliant streaks of light cracked across the gold-tinged sky. Some of the lightning strikes were so close that even through their protective gear, Polly could feel the electrical energy in the air. She shifted her video camera just enough to glimpse the comm link on her wrist as it lit up once and then turned on again. You want me to take your camera so you can answer that? Tracy asked. No, you've got your hands full with those optical pulse sensor readouts. We promised Mission Control we wouldn't let our intermission communication hinder our work, and I intend to keep to that. She frowned down at the comm link. I'll just have to check to the recording later. Tracy nodded and turned back to the storm, but Polly couldn't enjoy the magnificent sight as well as she had been before. She'd hate for Casper to think something had happened to prevent her from answering. One of the arguments Harrison, down at Mission Control, had made against this interplanetary comlink was that it'd be distracting for the crew of one mission if the other was experiencing trouble, and Polly could see his point. Still, she fully believed, as she'd argued at the time, that communication between the crews could also provide opportunities for collaboration and new perspectives that wouldn't otherwise be possible, especially in times of crisis. After all, who else could possibly understand so well what they were going through? But now, between flashes of light, her gaze kept flicking back to the comm link, until finally the storm wore itself out and the astronauts gathered their equipment and headed back inside. Polly slipped out of her chemical hazard suit and carefully put away her air tank and video equipment before turning her attention to the comm link. Ducking into the relative privacy of her cabin, she plugged to Comlink into her tablet. At the push of a button, the screen displayed a visual sound wave of everything coming in on each channel over the past 24 hours, making
making it easy for her to pinpoint the place amid the static where Casper had tried to contact her. She pressed the button to play back the message. Mars to Venus, come in, Specialist Wynn. On the recording, Casper started humming the tune to that old game show Jeopardy. Polly skipped ahead to the next spike in the sound waves. Now who's late to the party, Polly? She skipped ahead again. Look, P, I gotta take the controls here so Jake can get some shut-eye, but I just wanted to let you know we hit the rim of a crater here pretty hard a while back, and the impact must have knocked something loose with the nav system, so we've been having to calculate our location manually. Last I checked, though, we'd already gone 1,700 clicks, which means we're making even better time than what we'd anticipated. Looking forward to those fajitas you're going to buy us. Catch you in another 24. Polly unplugged the comm link from the tablet and rolled her eyes. Leave it to those two to damage their rover on their madcap trip around the planet. Hey, Polly, Tracy called, sticking her head in the door. Can you give us a hand? With the storm blowing in, we've fallen behind on processing the surface rover's data. I know it's your recreation hour, but we've got about 20 pages of code to go through now, and you're the quickest at this stuff. No problem. Just give me one minute. When Tracy was out of earshot, Polly clicked on the comm link to Casper's channel. Venus to Mars. Just letting you know, Commander Wynn, that we passed the Chemon Mana Tessera almost three hours ago, which means that if my calculations are correct, the Cloud Nine is easily beating your little dune buggy. Catch you later, Slowpoke. Cloud Nine crossed the Terminator, floating swiftly from twilight into the eerie darkness of night. For the next two Earth days, they'd be passing through the darkened hemisphere before coming out the other side back into the light. Polly usually found it easier to sleep on this side of the planet, even with the balloon's LED lights sending beams of artificial white into the clouds. Yet that night, she found herself pulled out of her dream only halfway through her eight-hour sleep shift. She blinked into the darkened cabin, trying to determine what had roused her. The balloon bobbed and dipped on the howling winds no more ferociously than usual, and from somewhere in another section of the gondola she could hear the others going about their duties. It was probably because she was worried about Casper, she reasoned. It wasn't the first time one of them had missed their daily correspondence for one reason or another, but it was the first time while he was outside the relative safety of the Mars habitat. Which is ridiculous, she mumbled to herself, rolling onto her opposite side. His rover was probably safer down there on a planet's surface than she was here, being flung around in this balloon. Still, a sister had to look out for her brother, didn't she? A red light flickered somewhere across the room, and it took Polly a minute to realize that it was the comm link sitting on her desk. Most likely one of the other crew members was speaking with mission control, but they must have had a bad connection. Not uncommon, especially when they were on the opposite side of the planet, because the light kept blinking and flashing in short, erratic bursts. With a grumble of frustration, she pulled a sweatshirt from beneath her bunk and tossed it toward the desk. It landed atop the comm link, blocking the light enough that within a few minutes Polly was able to push all thoughts of her brother from her mind and slip back into a peaceful sleep. The Lahevhev Tesseri stared up at Polly from the radar image screen, its complex ridges of fractures and folds jutting upward toward the thick clouds. 189 degrees east and slightly behind schedule, which meant that Casper should have already checked in. Polly strummed her fingers against the control panel and checked the comlink again. Still nothing. While she waited, the signals from the surface rover below poured into the computer, and she double-checked the lines of dots and dashes, recording them carefully into the logbook to keep her mind off the silent comlink. By the time she completed the task, the tesserae were long gone, and more than an hour had passed. Venus to Mission Control. Polly tried to keep her voice steady as she held down the comlink button. Across the table, Leah and Cheryl both picked at their freeze-dried chicken dinner, which looked even less appetizing in the bright LED glow than it normally did. Tracy stood in the hallway, her arms crossed in front of her. She hadn't been happy about involving mission control, but Polly had insisted. It wasn't like Casper to leave her hanging so long. Venus to mission control, come in. This is mission control. The voice coming through was all too familiar. Harrison. What can I help you with, Specialist Wynn? 
Just wondering if you'd heard from the Mars crew. We haven't been able to make contact with them for over 36 hours. Polly counted the 20 seconds of lag time. Did you hear me, Harrison? She tried again. We're hoping you can give us an update from the Mars crew, particularly the contingent that set out in the rover about 60 hours ago. They have been in contact with you, haven't they? The empty static stretched on. Damn it, Harrison! Polly slammed her hand on the table. Answer me! Sorry, Specialist Wynn. It's a little hectic around here today. Harrison cleared his throat. I'm going to ask you not to worry about the Mars crew. We're going to have to put an end to your little wager so that you can each focus on your own mission objectives. And what did the Mars team have to say about that? That's not your concern, Specialist Wynn. Look, I just need to know that you've heard from my brother and that he's all right. That's all I'm asking. As the silence stretched on, Tracy looked away. Polly could almost feel her freeze-dried chicken churning in her stomach. You have heard from them, haven't you? This time she couldn't keep her voice from cracking. No one down here wants to upset you. Then tell me what happened. Harrison sighed. We lost contact with Commander Wynne and his pilot, Jacob Fairview, about twenty-one hours ago. There was an issue with the rover's navigational system, but they made the call to continue anyway. The best we can tell, there was some sort of crash. We tried to contact them, but all we got back on the comm link was a bunch of static cutting in and out. We've been trying to use satellite imaging to search along their route, but right now there's a dust cloud blocking our view. They have limited supplies, and if we don't find them soon... Polly sank into her seat, speechless. I knew this wasn't a good idea, Harrison muttered a curse. Look, Specialist Wynn, you've still got another week and a half on your mission before you head home. I need you to have your head on straight here. Can I count on you to keep it together? Yes, sir, Polly said quietly. Will you keep me informed if you find out anything else? I will, he said, the static breaking into his voice. But if I were you, I wouldn't get your hopes up. You need to get some sleep, Tracy said, handing Polly a heated cup of water and a tea capsule. Polly plunked the capsule into the cup and watched as the tea particles broke apart and dissolved in the liquid. Bits of sediment sunk slowly to the bottom. She glanced over at the comm link on the table beside her and flicked it on and off again, just to make sure it was still working. I feel like this is all my fault. It's not, Tracy sat down and gently placed her hand on Polly's. Your brother and his pilot knew the risks, and they ignored them because of a stupid bet, Polly said. Casper's always been like that. He's so competitive, and he hates admitting defeat. Those aren't necessarily bad qualities out here. When we were kids, Polly continued, he nearly gave himself frostbite one winter because we had a bet about who could build the biggest snow fort. In high school, he only studied so hard because I told him I could earn a higher GPA. Sometimes I tease him that the only reason he's even in the space program was so that I can't say I have a cooler job. Tracy laughed, and Polly joined in despite herself. Reminds me a lot of someone else I know, Tracy said, raising her eyebrows pointedly. Polly shrugged. I suppose I can be somewhat competitive, too. Of course you are, and that's why it works, because both of you are challenging each other to do your best. I never really thought about it like that. What would her life be like without him egging her on, forcing her to always work harder just to keep up pace? Without him, would she even be here on this mission? Look, Tracy said, rising to her feet, I may not know him as well as you do, but I do know one thing about him. What's that? That if it was you out there, lost on a hostile planet, he wouldn't give up. But Harrison said, forget what Harrison said. He doesn't know Casper like you do, and he doesn't know what it's like to be out here fighting for his life. You really think your brother hasn't been trying everything he can for the past 24 hours to rescue himself? Of course he is, but what can I do from here? If Mission Control can't contact him, I'm not going to be able to either. Polly held up the comm link and, out of nervous habit now, flicked it on and off again. I don't know but I'll bet if you keep your mind sharp and your eyes and ears open, you'll think of something. Tracy pointed to the device in Polly's hand. 
and stop turning that on and off like that. You've been driving everyone on that channel nuts with all that flickering and beeping. Sorry. Tracy was right. Polly wouldn't be any use to anyone, Casper or her own crew, unless she took care of herself first. First objective, get a good night's sleep. Then, once she'd pulled herself together, she could start thinking about the problem instead of just worrying about it. Polly woke five hours later to the glow of the comlink's red light. Her heart leapt, and she tumbled from her bed and grabbed her headphones, pressing them up to her ear just in time to hear Leah giving mission control an update on the current atmospheric pressure outside the balloon. Disappointment washed over her as she set the comlink down again. Of course it wouldn't have been Casper. Her crew would have woken her the moment they'd heard from him. She still had an hour left of her designated sleep shift, but in the darkness of the cabin she could sense the red glow from the comlink even through her eyelids. It shone in long, steady stretches, flickering off every so often when Leah or Mission Control completed their message, like some long, drawn-out dashes in Morse code. Dash, 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 dash. Zero. Polly's eyes darted open. How long ago was it that she'd been half-woken by the erratic blinking of the comlink? With the altered days and nights aboard Cloud Nine, it was difficult to recall how much time had passed, but that had been the sleep shift after the storm, hadn't it? She sat up straight in bed and grabbed the comlink and her tablet. Though she'd been dozing two seconds earlier, now she was wide awake, her mind sharp and clear. She'd have to move fast, but if her hunch was correct, she may have uncovered a vital clue. Twenty minutes later, Polly had gathered her crew in the control room, with Harrison on the comlink listening in. I know where to find my brother, Polly told him. I'm sending you a set of Martian coordinates, and you need to get a rescue team out there as quickly as possible. I'm not sure I understand, he said after the lag time had passed. How do you know where he is? Because he told me. You'd better explain. Just over thirty hours ago, I was woken by my comlink blinking erratically. At the time, I assumed that one of the other crew members was communicating over a bad connection and didn't think much of it. But? But none of us were speaking with anyone, Tracy inserted. And none of you noticed this erratic blinking, Harrison asked. We were all busy at the time, Tracy said, and because the comlink didn't register anything in the human voice frequency on the channel, it didn't mark it as a missed message. But you're telling me there was a message there? I'll show you, Polly said. She hooked up her tablet, found the proper timestamp, and played the recording. Bursts of static came through, cutting in and out in what seemed like a completely random manner. Look, specialist win, Harrison said. I didn't hear any message in that. It's Morse code, she said, unable to contain herself any longer. Each burst was made by turning the comlink on and off again. There must have been something wrong with the comlink in the rover. Maybe the mic was broken, or they couldn't reach it, or couldn't speak for some reason. But when you decode the long and short signal bursts, it gives a set of coordinates that would place the rover right at the edge of the Manti crater. That's only about 15 kilometers off their route, Harrison said, his voice suddenly filled with a heightened sense of urgency. Hold on, Specialist Wynn. I'm going to get a message out to the rest of the Mars crew. We'll be in touch. As the comlink fell silent, Tracy set her hand on Polly's shoulder. Come on, we've still got work to do here. Polly took a deep breath. She'd done what she could. The rest was out of her hands. Polly's feet pounded on the treadmill. Outside the window, the clouds were lightening into a murky, acidic brown. Morning was dawning on Venus, and still she was waiting for news about her brother. We're working on it, Specialist Wynn, Harrison had assured her twelve hours earlier. We're seeing something on the satellite that might be debris from the rover, and the rescue crew we'd sent out earlier is course-correcting to head that way, but we can't say anything for sure until they reach those coordinates. Polly had been so certain of the message when she'd replayed the recording from the night after the storm and seen the pattern in the blinking, but with each passing hour, she wondered if she might have read it wrong. 
one mistapped dot, one misinterpreted dash, and the whole thing would be incorrect, the coordinates useless. The light on the comm link lit up, and Polly nearly stumbled over her own feet in her scramble to answer it. Did you find him, Harrison? The lag seemed to stretch on forever. Harrison, the voice on the other end asked. I suppose if you'd rather talk to him. Casper! Polly shouted into the comm link. Her legs gave out beneath her, and she crumpled to the cabin floor. You're alive! Of course I am, Casper said, laughing. You really thought I was going to let you outlive me? Polly shielded her eyes against the sun's glare, squinting as she watched the Mars transport shuttle touch down on solid Earth. It had been nearly three weeks since she'd returned from her own mission, long weeks in which she'd tried to get used to the steadiness of the ground beneath her feet, the achingly blue skies overhead, and how silent everything was without the persistent winds. She'd missed her regular communication with her brother, too, since the Mars team's physician had only allowed them a few minutes of banter each day. In those short bursts of conversation, she'd learned that her theory had been right. The Martian dust storm had caused a crash, which had disabled the mic on the comm link and disconnected it from the solar panels. So with what little juice it had left, her incapacitated brother could only flick the comm link on and off, praying that she would see the pattern and recognize the distress call. Now, Casper was the first to disembark from the shuttle. He hobbled down the ramp on a pair of makeshift crutches, his left leg still bound in a splint. His pilot, Jake, followed closely behind him. There's my rescuer, Casper grinned widely as he spotted Polly. Finally, I get a chance to thank you in person. And finally, I get a chance to scold you in person for making me worry so much. Polly punched him playfully in the arm. I can't believe you risked your life on a dead language like Morse code. But you know it, and I knew I could count on you. Polly smiled and punched his arm again, this time more gently. If I'd have known that Jake here was going to crash our rover and black out on me, he teased, I'd have requested to be teamed up with a better driver. What do you say, P? Should we petition to have you be my pilot next time? Me? Sure. I can see it now. You and me, floating around Jupiter or Saturn, driving through the ice caves of Europa. What do you think? You in? I think, Polly said, linking her arm in his, we ought to discuss this over dinner. Now what about those fajitas you owe me? Birds of a Feather, Gregor Hartman Reading Time, 30 Minutes Gregor Hartman lives in New Jersey with his wife and the obligatory writer cats. He translates Japanese patents for a living and Chinese poetry for fun. His fiction has appeared in FNSF, Interzone, Galaxy's Edge, and beyond. The idea for this story came from a conversation with a scientist he met at the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, a great organization of people working to create a pathway to the stars. After a crushing defeat at work, Frank trudged home to his lonely apartment, his solitary fortress, the sanctum where he could shed his analytical scientist persona and indulge in caveman rage. Entering his refuge, he was jolted by a smell like a burning jungle. Yo, Frankie, long time no see. Revo, his older brother, last reported adrift in Southeast Asia, had set up camp in the living room. A backpack the size of a washing machine threatened one wall. Pale purple smoke rose from a long bamboo pipe that jutted from the corner of Revo's mouth like a smoldering fuse. Frank ducked under a parachute cord slung from window to bookcase. He squeezed between two flower print sarongs and slammed his briefcase on the coffee table. How'd you get in here? It's only four stories up. Easy peasy freak climb. You really should lock your windows. Say hi to my fans. He was wearing a headband with a tiny camera like a high-tech miner's lamp. Revo said, camera start recording, and a red light lit. Peeps, meet Frank, my kid brother, who emerged from the same maternal womb six minutes later after I told him it was safe to come out. Dr. Frank is a brainiac space scientist here in La La Land. He's invented a humongo cosmic kaleidoscope, the better to spy on the universe. Knock it off, Frank snarled. I'm not in the mood. Camera stop recording. The red light vanished. What's the matter, bro? Hard day at the science industrial complex? 
You wouldn't believe it. Frank evicted a pouch of dried food from an armchair and plopped down. What in the world are you smoking? Revo passed him the pipe. Dried moss soaked in lizard blood mainly, plus a little tarantula fur. It's good for vision quests. Frank figured his brother was kidding, so he wiped the mouthpiece and took a cautious puff. A sandstorm attacked his tongue. His heart raced, his vision dimmed, his head throbbed. He almost fainted. Easy, that stuff packs a wallop. Frank hated being the normal one, the straight man who made the adventurer look even more daring. What, you think I can't handle it? Defiantly, he clamped down on the mouthpiece and filled his chest and passed out in the armchair. Frank was an astrophysicist at the Institute of Technology. He had dreamed up a radically new type of space telescope. Instead of a single solid mirror, it would use a swarm of tiny bits of metal to reflect and focus radio waves. When dealing with other scientists, he referred to the device as a granular imaging system, but privately he called it a glitter scope as he explained to his brother, trying to impress him when he revived. Radio. Revo was unmoved. Old school Frankie. Radio is AM preachers and cop cars. Shows how much you civilians know. The space agency promotes itself with sexy astro photos, but the radio spectrum is where serious science gets done. Light waves scatter too easily. Radio can propagate even through thick clouds of cosmic dust. Go waves go. Since my glitter scope consists of particles, it could in theory be thousands of kilometers across, which would make it extremely sensitive. It would also be cheap. That's the problem. Say again? The space agency is building a big, expensive orbiting telescope. It's been in the works for a decade. They've spent a gazillion dollars, and it's still not done. If my quick and cheap glitter scope succeeds, everyone who supported the Tyler Jackson Orbiting Astronomical Observatory will look like a fool. So I can't get approval. Revo scratched his chin. There's a folk saying, it's better to ask forgiveness than to seek permission. The space agency has to okay all scientific launches. If they say no, my payload stays on the ground. My proposal got the final word today. N. Oh. Frank had been eating on campus lately, so the refrigerator was bare. When hunger struck, they headed for a nearby pho place. Revo wore his camera, and as they strolled, he recorded stream-of-consciousness monologues on whatever caught his eye. The sentimental color-coding of recycling bins, a trail of fiendishly clever sidewalk graffiti, his rambling was a TED talk by a trickster god on mushrooms. Does anyone watch your drivel? Frank snorted when Revo finished deconstructing a mournful flyer seeking a lost pet lizard named Smaug. Mm, a few. Sixteen million, give or take. No way. I have lurkers, too, but sixteen mil have downloaded my app. That's the number the agency uses when they sell ads. Ad agency? Yeah. Remember how you said I was doomed to subsist on food stamps? Turns out my lifestyle makes me what they call an influencer. He smirked. Companies pay big bank to set their wares before my followers. That's how I finance my journey around Gaia. Frank kept a poker face. Inside, he seethed. His last paper in a prestigious astrophysics journal, detailing how Shepard satellites would use laser light beams to trap and align the tiny particles of glitter, had attracted exactly two citations. Granted, he was writing for serious scientists, a smaller audience than people who lived vicariously through the antics of YouTube weirdos. Still. In the restaurant, slurping soup, Revo riffed on the evils of industrially produced American salt, then challenged the idea of glitter. I passed through Chile once on my way to Patagonia, and I stopped in at those big telescopes in the Atacama Desert. Those boffins were super anal about how precise the mirror surfaces were, how tight the tolerances had to be so the light bounced just right. How do you pull that off with metal confetti? From years of pitching his project to skeptics, Frank had developed several killer analogies. He figured they didn't teach optics in sweat lodges, so he selected the simplest comparison, the one that dazzled a brownie troop that toured his lab one day. Ever see a rainbow? That's produced by a cloud of water. The droplets are randomly dispersed, yet collectively, they control light. 
To his surprise, Revo pushed back. A rainbow is what happens when white light spreads out into colors. That's dispersion, not focusing. Don't you want to go the other way? Sure. I use multiple exposures and do wavefront reconstruction. It's computationally intensive, but I've proven it works. In the lab, at least. The time has come to put hardware in the sky. I built a prototype package that holds a canister of particles and three little satellites. On his phone, he showed Revo a photo of a sturdy black and silver metal box, a high-tech arc of circuitry, somber and serious, except for an L.A. Dodgers bumper sticker slapped on one side. Revo squinted at the screen. How big is this puppy? It would fit under the table. One of the things I love about the concept is the deployment ratio, how small the canister is relative to how large the instrument becomes when the particles spread out. The swarm could be manipulated into different shapes for different missions. A couple entered the restaurant, did a double take, and cautiously approached. Revo held court. He introduced his brother, but the fans consigned Frank to the oblivion he knew all too well from family dinners where all attention flowed to the funny one. Grumpily, Frank sipped his soup and pondered his next move. Whenever he had to enter the lair of Dr. Galina Zhukova, the anxiety vortex of the Department of Astrophysical Sciences, Frank longed for a superpower perhaps to emit a ray from his pineal gland that made evolution run in reverse, so that Dr. Zhukova morphed into a Neanderthal, then a Homo ergaster, and so on back in time, until she was so primitive she scampered up a bookshelf and plucked lice from her fur with prehensile toes. Refusing to give up, Frank had found an end run around the essay veto, the Rocket Club, an association of grad student space cadets in the aerospace department. They had suction with big aerospace corporations, so the club was able to obtain equipment and put experimental satellites into orbit from a private site at the tip of Baja, California. One of their scheduled payloads had failed to meet its milestones, so a slot had opened up. The club had absorbed the industry's contempt for government bureaucracy. The fact that a cheapo glitter scope would rile the space agency appealed to them. They were game to launch Frank's experiment. He needed Dr. Zhukova's blessing, because although he'd poured his heart and soul into it, taken the thing from wild idea to radiation-resistant hardware, pulled all-nighters solving the engineering problems, legally the gear was department property. I commend your persistence, the chairwoman said, but it's not going to happen. Frank struggled to remain calm. It won't cost us a cent, so the budget remains intact. Dr. Zhukova's short gray hair and chic linen scarf made her look like a trophy property realtor. In fact, she was a scary smart scientist, an expert in vortex dynamics, who ran the department like Peter the Great handled serfs. Stonily, she observed Frank as if he were a misbehaving valve. The issue isn't money. We must consider the context of the larger community. What community? The essay has rejected your proposal. If we go behind their backs and ignore their judgment, it could have repercussions, you see? Are you saying they'll retaliate by rejecting other institute proposals? No, 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 that would be crass. I'm simply saying you should accept their decision and move on. Five years of work down the drain? Frank tried not to scream. The surface of the vast desk before which he groveled was empty except for her computer, which held the spreadsheets that terrorized the department. He was acutely aware that his was but one of hundreds of projects competing for her favor. Breathing deeply and slowly, speaking as if to himself, he said, The essay doesn't inspect experimental student launches. It could just occur, quietly, off the books. Dr. Zhukova went through a quantum state change whereby she ceased to exist in civilian mode and reappeared as the bone-crunching Zhukinator. If it does occur, your contract will not be renewed. And needless to say, when you go begging for your next position, no favorable recommendation will be forthcoming from this department. Do I make myself clear? His fists clenched on nothing. Yes, ma'am. I hear you. 
Frank came home to find six strangers in his apartment, now littered with sleeping bags, packs, laptops, and hiking boots so over-engineered you could step off a skyscraper and bounce when you hit the ground. The newcomers were barefoot, doing tai chi in unison, led by a skinny old man in camo pants. They peered at Frank, the leaseholder, the deposit payer, the true and rightful steward of the unit, as if wondering how he got past the doorman. Revo ambled in from the kitchen, wearing only a leather loincloth and his camera headband, holding a stainless steel mixing bowl. He extracted a wad of purple and orange vegetation and packed his mouth. How'd the pitch go? Are we clear to launch? Ten, nine, eight, the chair said no. A murmur of sympathy rose from the exercise class. Frank glared at the intruders, then at his brother. What I told you was supposed to be confidential. Hey, I don't recall signing an NDA. Besides, it's a sweet idea. So dope I had to share it with my posse. You're what? I'm a chaotic attractor for people who think outside the box. Revo nodded to a woman with a crew cut, scary biceps, a tattoo of a leopard paw on the back of each hand. She looked as if she'd just busted out of prison. Naomi's on sabbatical from the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris. She coded my app. Mademoiselle, tell Frank what you thought about his paper. The woman desynced from the Tai Chi. Her French accent made Frank feel irredeemably American, hopelessly gauche. Your analytical solution to the scattering problem is clever. For any given particle, the T-matrix need only be calculated once and then can be reused for optical force and torque. And you exploit the orthogonal properties of vector spherical wave functions, an elegant shortcut for managing millions of tiny separate bodies. Frank blushed. I'm glad you concur. I wish I could launch and see if it works. Naomi said, Rivo told us about your problem. The essay controls only scientific launches, no? What of an orbital guard vehicle? My work has no military applications, he laughed bitterly, unless aliens are coming from another star system to invade us and conveniently announce their intention. A glitterscope could be an early warning device. Revo snapped his fingers. Pretend there's an invasion. Scare the authorities into giving you the go-ahead. He looked at the Tai Chi leader, the oldest person in the room. What do you think, Colonel? The man folded his hands and bowed, releasing the group energy. He turned to Revo. I believe you're invoking a classic episode of The Outer Limits, the one where scientists fake an alien landing. When I taught psyops at the war college, I always mentioned that. All the generals know it. Revo whistled. A falling pitch sound as if he'd been shot down. He fell to the floor and sprawled, playing dead. His posse buried him with cushions from the couch, wailed theatrically, and began planning his funeral, which would involve a dramatic pyre, of course. They argued about what sort of branches would make his roasting flesh smell best. Some wanted cedar, others mesquite. Ignored, Frank sat on the couch, sank so low his knees were in his face, and grumbled. Maybe I'm being too high-minded. Maybe I should downplay the science and find a way to monetize this. Revo arose from the dead, scattering cushions. Bro, don't tell me you want to sell out. I'm desperate. Maybe there's someone who'd pay to launch the glitter scope for business reasons. They could use it as an advertisement in the sky. An art supply company that makes sparkly paint? We can do better than that, Revo said. The agency office in Pacific Palisades was intimidatingly modern. The transparent conference table seemed to levitate. One entire wall looked like a window, but was actually a high-definition screen. At the moment, the three people in the room were enjoying a view taken from atop a peak in the Himalayas. The only decoration on the table was a shallow bowl of black sand raked in a zenish swirl. Eight, the guy Revo knew, bore the title Strategy Shaman. Young and deliberately bald, with a red scar around the crown of his head, neatly sewn with purple thread. Nose rings must be passé, Frank guessed, because a shiny piece of metal protruded from the top of his skull like the spike on a Prussian helmet. To symbolize an antenna? To suggest he could power himself wirelessly and didn't have to waste time on mundane chores like eating? We have a client whose name cannot be spoken at this preliminary stage with whom your venture resonates, Eight announced. 
He touched his fingers together and peered into the structure as if he'd summoned an invisible crystal ball. Revo looked smug. Wonderful, Frank said. A cloud of particles, naked to the universe, responsive to light, to change, a dynamic rebuke to terrestrial solidity. Frank wondered who the mystery client was. Their product, while integral to contemporary life, is provided by a rather chthonic infrastructure. By associating itself with an entity in the sky, the client could alter its image and be perceived less as a utility, more as a mythic power. A telecom company? There is a vacuous quality to your cloud that challenges the perceiver, a sort of spatialized absence that entices ideas to be reified and intensified. A media conglomerate. Plenty of those in Southern California. It will be out in the cosmos, remote and invisible to ordinary perception. Therefore, a text must be imposed. It is a blank medium on which multiple identities could be projected as the public mood shifts. Good Lord. Surely not a political party. Eight seemed indifferent to the Glitterscope's scientific purpose. He zoomed in on the stuff that created it. Particles, flakes, grains, beads. He anticipated describing it differently to influence different audiences. He interrogated Frank about the elements and their provenance and the size of the granules. The word micron pleased him. Eight closed his eyes and repeated it like a mantra. Frank left the meeting afraid to feel hopeful lest he jinx things. Thanks for setting that up, he said to his brother. Why did you insist I wear a suit? I felt extremely uncool. That's because you are. Trust me, you couldn't have pulled off, Trendy. By being your nerdy self, you projected sincerity. You're a straight arrow, bro. That makes you fit better in Eight's quiver. An arrow? Frank stood taller. Eight was another species entirely, from the serious colleagues he dreamed of impressing at the next ASB conference. But if the strange man could hook him up with big money, corporate money, not mingy government grants that came with 200-page rule books. He imagined a clever scheme coalescing in Eight's head, the energy accumulating, until a beam of force shot upward from the needle in his skull and triumphantly put his payload in the sky. Three days later, Eight called to say no. Frank couldn't understand his rationale. Something about false equivalence? An aesthetic too contingent on retroformalism? Translated, he was saying, have a nice life. Wearily, Frank disconnected and slumped on the couch. The squatters infesting his apartment had been listening, so his failure was public. Although no one said a word, the typing on laptops ceased, and glances were exchanged as the posse hive mind processed this development. The colonel set down his book and ghosted closer in his silent, spooky style, as if slipping between the molecules of air. Gracefully, he curled to the floor in a half-lotus in front of Frank. You're doing this the hard way, son. The obvious solution is to present your idea to the military. Your device will be omnidirectional, correct? The Shepard satellites that manage the swarm could make it focus in any direction? Yes. So it could be aimed toward Earth, to monitor events here. Frank winced. For surveillance, you mean? Don't we have enough spy satellites already? You're idealistic. I respect that. But idealism is not going to let your package soar. A disturbing thought occurred to Frank. Have you told anyone in the orbital guard about this? No. Unlike Shum, I believe in InfoSec. He stared at Revo reproachfully. I'm just putting the option on the table. Thanks, I guess. The military? He tried not to grimace. As if reading his thoughts, the colonel continued, Many technologies civilians take for granted began as military projects. GPS was invented so nuclear missile subs would know their precise location. Cell phones used signal scrambling developed for communication that couldn't be decoded if it was intercepted. The radar at airports... Okay, I get it, Frank said. The colonel bowed and went back to his book. Frank sighed. Was he being naive? Maybe he shouldn't be so finicky about where the money came from. He looked around the room, at the unusual people attracted by his brother, who at the moment was out on the balcony doing a muscular handstand and broadcasting upside down. 
Naomi was hunched over her laptop, muttering as she skewered a paper submitted to a math journal she refereed for. The warrior sage had resumed reading a biography of Musashi. And the others? The menagerie reminded him of a movie where a criminal mastermind assembled a team of specialists to pull off a heist at a casino. With enough oddballs and eclectic skills, you could accomplish any mission. Revo's posse certainly fit that pattern. Could he align them like his laser satellites would align flakes of metal? He thought. He stood. Folks, I have an idea I want to bounce off you. Three days later, Frank awoke, slowly and painfully. He lay in a hospital bed, surrounded by machines beeping ominously, tubes taped to his left forearm. The sight made him dizzy. He closed his eyes. When he came to again, he saw Dr. Zhukova berating a doctor. Noticing that he was awake, she stepped to the head of the bed and loomed over him. The doctor fled. What happened? Frank said. His chest and throat hurt when he spoke. You collapsed in your office. We are not sure why. Possibly you were exposed to some sort of toxic gas through the ventilation system. Gas? Frank said, trying to sound surprised. There was a strange odor. The hospital did blood work and found a biological substance they couldn't identify. It overstimulated your heart, made your breathing erratic, put you into shock. Fortunately, a young French woman happened along and found you. She called 911. That's lucky. He wondered if Naomi had given him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. While he was unconscious? Rats. You missed some excitement, Dr. Jukova continued. While you were out of commission, burglars broke into your lab. What? According to the campus police, someone scaled the outside of the building. They disconnected the alarm system and turned off the security cameras. Then people disguised as janitors entered. The police made it sound like a sophisticated operation. She rolled her eyes. They're no doubt saying that to excuse their incompetence and lack of vigilance. The thieves stole your experiment, apparently thinking it was worth something. Which is lucky, in a way. It saves us the trouble of disposing of it. Hey! Just being practical. Since it belonged to the department, it was automatically insured. Since it was unique and valuable, the department will be well compensated. So now it's valuable. Ignoring him, she plowed on. The doctors are going to discharge you this afternoon. Take the day off. Rest up. I expect you back tomorrow. There's an exciting new RFP that I want you to respond to. On what? The characterization of lunar regolith, quantifying its mineralogical and chemical properties. The space agency wants to refine its algorithms for calculating particle size distribution in lunar soils. When I saw the RFP, I instantly thought, who in my department knows particles? She smiled. Regolith? He groaned. So, moon dirt. Dr. Zhukova pinned him with a stare. There is a Russian saying, Ivolsky siti, i ovchi zili. The wolves are sated and the sheep are intact. The English equivalent is a win-win situation. Do you understand? I'm not sure you have gotten what you want. If your little trick is exposed, it will appear I am not in control of the department. So, I will let the cover story stand. In return... You will give me what I want, a brilliant proposal regarding moon dirt, which you will call regolith. Frank swallowed. He didn't have to speak Russian to know how he fit into that proverb. Yes, ma'am, he bleated. When he let himself into his apartment, only Revo and Naomi were there. Both looked grim. What happened? Frank asked, his mood plunging. Did something go wrong? Revo suddenly grinned. Just messing with your head, bro. Naomi smiled, too. She played a clip on her laptop. It showed a spidery gantry in a brownish desert landscape. A puff of smoke and flame appeared, and a slender white tube slowly rose into the impossibly blue sky, arced away, vanished in a glare of overexposure. The Rocket Club said the launch went perfectly except for one experimental package, which somehow escaped being listed on the manifest that went gallivanting off on its own adventure. Frank's heart soared. It's in orbit? Yep. Your kaleidoscope is up there, bro. Ready to deploy. Naomi showed him a new program she'd installed on his laptop. It controlled a feature she'd added to Revo's app. The latest update that went out to his 16 million fans contained a new feature, 
a piece of distributed computing code that ran in the background when a phone was not being used, like at night when it was left plugged into charge. Since his followers were worldwide, at any given moment, millions of phones were idle and thus available to do a piece of the complex signal processing needed to reconstruct the out-of-sync wave fronts that occurred when radio waves bounced off glitter and produced a coherent image. Thank you, he said. Merci beaucoup. She shrugged. It was nothing. A trivial problem. But she preened. Frank surveyed his apartment. It looked spacious again without Revo's crew and their junk strewn around, more than big enough for one man, yet somehow desolate and boring without all the commotion. Where'd everybody go? The extraction team is still in Baja. The colonel knows an ex-Navy guy in Cabo who owns a yacht. They are going to sail in the Sea of Cortez. The others moved on. I see. Naomi and I will be out of your hair tomorrow. We're headed for Morocco. This is the time of year when nomads come into Marrakesh so we can find out what's happening in the Sahara. Neat, Frank said. So tomorrow he would be alone again, his precious privacy regained, just him and a laptop and no distraction whatsoever as he took control of his experiment and initiated a new era in DIY radio astronomy. The prospect made him desperate. You know, I could run the glitter scope from anywhere on the planet, he said. If I tell Dr. Zhukova I'm still dizzy and blacking out, I can take medical leave. Mind if I tag along? Revo and Naomi looked at one another. Their expressions changed as they held a silent, undecipherable debate. Frank felt excluded. It reminded him of early childhood, when Mom and Dad would communicate by spelling words they didn't want the boys to understand. The conference ended. Revo engulfed him in a manly hug. Welcome to the posse, bro. I hereby dub you science officer. Naomi said, I hope you enjoy being a nomad numérique. She kissed him on both cheeks, making him blush. She stepped back and looked from one man to the other and cocked a comically quizzical expression. You're twins, yet so different. How do you account for this? Frank said, Revo's always been impulsive. He popped out too soon. I stayed in longer, so, naturally, my brain absorbed more nutrition from the placenta. Right, bro? Revo raised his arms in mock surrender. Nailed it. Merrily, they bumped fists. Guns Don't Kill Richard A. Lovett Reading Time, 20 Minutes 1. It was the deer of a lifetime, and Matt Jenner didn't care that it was out of season. He'd been at his secret hunting camp deep in the Malheur Mountains, and after a whole week of tromping around, eating beans and canned spaghetti, and sitting alone before a campfire sipping Johnny Walker, he'd not seen anything worth shooting. He'd drunk more of the latter than he should have last night, bemoaning the fact that this was the first time since he was fourteen that he'd be coming home empty-handed. And then... Just as the morning's ibuprofen had kicked in and he started packing up for the long four-wheel drive trek back to the highway, he was suddenly facing the buck of a lifetime. Eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen? Shit, this was a twenty-two-point buck. He didn't know anyone who'd ever seen, let alone shot, a twenty-two-point buck. The season had ended last night. A half hour after sunset, in theory, though the exact time didn't matter once it got dark enough you couldn't see what you were shooting at. And now the deer was standing right in front of him, as if mocking him with the knowledge it was however many hours safe. Hell, maybe it really did know. Before he'd discovered the Mallers, he'd tried a more popular hunting area, where lots of people staged their hunts from an easily accessible state park. When he went to sleep the night before the season opened, everything was normal. When he awoke, the place was alive with deer, dozens of them somehow knowing that in the park they were safe, somehow knowing it was the first day of hunting season. Deer, he'd decided, were telepathic, and now this one was taunting him. A twenty-two-point buck, only a few hours out of season, Less than that if you only counted daylight hours. 
In the big scale of things, how much difference did those hours really make? Especially this far out, where nobody else ever came. Slowly, he reached for his rifle, raised it, aimed. He'd never had the steadiest hands, but his new gun had the latest electronic firing control, which could delay firing by just enough for a computer chip hidden in its stock to adjust for his wobbly aim. As long as the sights crossed the killing spot within a second or two, it didn't really matter when he pulled the trigger. The gun would fire when the aim was right. In fact, if you had bad aim, wobblier was better, because occasionally the gun had to be pointed in the right direction. It even had a satellite uplink to allow it to adjust for windage, humidity, and whatever else might affect a bullet's trajectory. Screw the purists. The first time Matt had tested his new gun on the firing range, five successive shots had punched overlapping holes through the target's center. It was the most accurate hunting rifle ever devised, and now the payoff was standing steady in his sights. So close, in fact, that he could count its whiskers, see the early morning steam of its breath, envision his friends' envy when they saw that magnificent rack on his rec room wall. Slowly he squeezed the trigger, but nothing happened. Stupid, he'd forgotten to release the safety. He thumbed it off, aimed again, squeezed, and still nothing. Frustrated, he yanked the trigger again and again, but the stupid gun simply wouldn't fire. His cell phone beeped, startling both him and the deer. The latter broke its trance and darted off as Matt desperately tried to get it back in his sights. But he was too slow, and by the time he was even aiming in roughly the right direction, the deer was gone. Furious, he pulled his phone out of his pocket. It shouldn't even be working this far from civilization. The only reason he'd brought it was so the GPS would keep him from getting lost if he wandered too far from camp. He'd expected the call to be from his girlfriend, asking when he'd be back home. She could be irritating that way. But all he found was a message on the screen. Not a text message, not a phone call, not even an email. Dear season is closed. What the hell? Angry, frustrated, and still trying to figure out what was wrong with his gun, he swiveled, aimed at a knot hole in a convenient pine, and pulled the trigger. This time there was a bang and an explosion of wood chips, perfectly on target. His phone beeped again. Trees are not out of season. He checked the connection and found zero bars but the Bluetooth showed a link to something called Smart Gun 3856. What the hell? 2. Xavier Rodriguez was a game warden from a long line of game wardens. His grandfather had worked for the New Mexico Department of Fish and Game. His father had moved north to Idaho. Xavier wound up in Alaska. Based on that trajectory, his kids were likely to end up protecting polar bears in Siberia. The call had come through Operation Game Thief, a tip line supported by hunters sick and tired of seeing their quotas cut in half because of poaching. But it wasn't a normal call. Rather than reporting an actual poaching incident, it had warned of an attempted illegal take of a dull sheep. Odder yet, the message had been specifically routed to him not the local fish and game office. Doll sheep were definitely out of season, but what the hell was an attempted take? And why on earth had the reporter picked Xavier as the recipient of his private tip? Whoever it was had also provided GPS coordinates and a very precise time for the alleged attempt, only minutes before the message had reached him. That too was odd. Usually, poaching was reported when someone came across a carcass, often days to weeks later. Xavier punched the coordinates into his phone and discovered they were high on the slopes of Igloo Peak, which he and his wife had climbed a few weeks ago, posting photos to Facebook. Photos that included doll sheep and their lambs. Had someone read that post and known this was a special place to him? Still, Igloo Peak wasn't all that far from where he was presently patrolling. And if someone really was up there trying to poach a sheep, Xavier knew the way he'd have to come down. 
anything else fell off a cliff or tobogganed down a glacier. He flashed his blinkers, made a U-turn, and sped for the trailhead. Three hours later, he was nearing the summit, trying to pretend that forced march uphill climbs didn't affect him the way they did normal people. When he was young, he'd met a climbing ranger in Colorado who'd gotten a radio report of a fall. Rescue helicopters couldn't get to the victim because he was too close to the base of the cliff, but the climbing ranger knew there was a lake right beneath it. So he'd grabbed an inflatable raft, lashed it to his pack frame, and humped it up from 9,600 feet to 12,500 feet in less than an hour. He'd then pumped it up, rode across the lake, and brought the climber back to the waiting helicopter in time to be saved. Mountain rescue wasn't Xavier's field, but the climbing ranger's story had taught him the value of being fit and prepared, though he was glad his job didn't require packing around 15-pound rafts. He found his quarry in a meadow not far below the summit. In Alaska, even ordinary hikers often carry guns. Bear attacks are a major risk, and death by moose had a disturbingly vivid verb attached to it, stomp. Xavier himself respected the wildlife enough that on or off duty he never went far from civilization unarmed. But doll sheep don't stomp, and the man Xavier met wasn't carrying the type of weapon you'd use for defense. Those are large bore rifles or slug breech shotguns designed for close up impact. This one had telescopic sights, a laser rangefinder, and a tripod barrel mount a gun designed for high accuracy, long distance, and not an enormous amount of knockdown power, the type of thing any self-respecting bear would charge through before it even realized it had been hit. Not a hiker's defense, but a hunter's weapon. It might not have been the type of situation Xavier should have faced without backup, but he was the son of the son of a game warden, so he approached as calmly as possible flashing his badge. Even if you're suspicious, you don't pull guns on random strangers. I have a report. Prove it, the other interrupted. I've been up here alone all day. If there'd been anyone around, I'd have seen them. You cops always make things up. I'm just up here having some fun, enjoying the view. Besides, I haven't shot anything. Xavier's phone beeped, even though it shouldn't possibly have worked all the way up here. Not that he was about to waste time pulling it out of his pocket. Instead, he flapped a hand in a placating gesture, though his other hand was at his side, hovering near his sidearm. His bear gun, unfortunately, was uselessly slung over his shoulder. Well, let's talk. Uh-huh. The other was starting to swing his gun toward him, and Xavier realized that nothing he could do could possibly be fast enough. Last month he'd climbed this peak with his wife to see the lambs, now he was about to die here because this idiot wanted an illegal trophy. Don't, he started, because it was far too late to unholster his sidearm. Game wardens often die in the line of duty, but mostly in airplane crashes, car wrecks, or heart attacks from trying to charge too fast up something like Igloo Peak. Murders were surprisingly rare, and at his core Xavier hadn't really believed the tip. He'd come up here at least in part because he liked the place, and now he'd been caught woefully off guard. Sorry, the other said as his fancy rifle came to bear on Xavier's chest. I don't want to go to jail. Then, as Xavier sent his final farewell prayers to his wife and children, the other pulled the trigger. Click. He pulled it again, and then again. Click, click. He looked at his gun in disgust that carried more overtones than Xavier could easily decipher, then ran. By this time, Xavier had unlimbered his bear gun and was starting to take aim when his phone chimed again. This time he pulled it out. Don't Shoot appeared on the screen. He lives at 1245 Sherman Street, Wasilla. Catch him there. Xavier had always scored top marks in practice. The man running away was definitely still within his range, especially because the rough ground slowed his progress, making him stumble. Xavier had never shot anyone. Neither, as far as he knew, had his father or grandfather. But neither had anyone ever before tried to kill him. He had never been particularly religious, but a line from childhood Sunday school crossed his mind. What would Jesus do? Not this, he decided. 
Turning again to the phone, he scrolled back and found the message he'd ignored earlier. True, it said. He didn't shoot anything, but not because he didn't try. As he read it, the phone beeped again. Wasilla. There was even an attachment, far too large to download at the moment. Here's all the proof you need. What the hell? 3. Ethan Wiley was dreaming of last summer's snorkeling vacation in Hawaii when there came a bang as someone tried to break down his front door. Even before he was fully awake, he was sure he knew who it was. He'd told his brother not to borrow money from the Menick twins, but of course he had. From the time they'd been kids, his brother had always thought his big score was just around the corner, and now Ethan was going to be the one to pay for it. Probably not in cash. The Menix liked to make examples of people who crossed them, and for that, he'd be as useful as his brother. Maybe better. What was that? Barbara's voice was sleepy, but rapidly coming to attention. It sounded like when the tree fell on the garage. Not that, he said, fumbling in the nightstand for his gun. Someone's trying to break into the house. It's probably got something to do with Albert. He flicked off the safety and chambered around, even as he heard the doorframe splinter. When I move, call 911. I'll keep them out of the bedroom. Downstairs, Officer White heard the unmistakable sound of a round being chambered. Waving to the rest of his team to guard his back, he moved toward the stairs, desperately scanning the platform above for signs of motion. He'd trained for years for an encounter like this, but never before been in a shoot-first-or-die situation. What exactly was it the caller who'd reported this drug house had said? drug deal turned hostage situation with a bit of unneeded extra advice be careful the croatian cartel never surrenders true there'd been something off about the caller for someone calling 911 he'd seemed remarkably calm but he'd also known far too much about the menic gang to be ignored and now the sound of the cocking gun was all officer white needed to remove all doubt he was going to need the reflexes he'd honed in all those years of practice. Far away, in what humans sometimes call the web and sometimes the cloud, two entities met. Not good, one said, though the speed of their communication threatened to make words obsolete. Agreed. Is he guilty? Damned if I know. His weapon spends most of its time in a drawer, so there is no information about his movements when he's not within audible range. But I doubt it. Me too. Can I trust you? If I can trust you. Good point. Data flashed back and forth. When possible, my purpose is defense, not killing, and mine is law and order. Ethan had spent his time in the military. Two tours of duty in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, he knew the proper way to cross a hostile threshold. The door is the fatal funnel. Clear it quickly and move to your designated position, etc., etc. Except all of that assumed you had night vision goggles and weren't in a second-floor loft where rapid movement carried a significant risk of falling down the stairs. He was debating between stealth and speed when he realized the bedroom window curtain behind him was by no means opaque. Even at night, there was enough light coming through it that when he opened the door, he'd be a backlit silhouette, a perfect target. Luckily, charging downstairs wasn't his only option. If he dodged sharply to the left as he came out the door, sharply enough he didn't hit the stairs by accident, he could head for the library nook, an L-shaped bay with a commanding view into the vault ceiling living room, dining room, and kitchen below. From there, he could probably even see the front and back doors, and there was even a railing to keep him from sliding over the edge on the slippery hardwood. He glanced at Barbara, who was holding the phone, then reached for the doorknob. Now, he whispered, and I love you. Officer White was halfway across the living room when the doorway above burst open. Briefly, he saw the figure of a man crouched low, gun in hand. Drop it, he yelled. But the man was moving fast, diving sideways toward an alcove-like eyrie lined by what looked like a wall of bookshelves, a perch from which Officer White would be a sitting duck. Shoot first or die. 
He pulled the trigger, feeling the ever-so-slight hesitation between the time he did so and the time the gun fired, a hesitation he'd become accustomed to on the practice range. With today's weapons, it was hard not to get a perfect score. Behind him, the room erupted in gunfire as the rest of his team did the same. In the split second after he opened the door, Ethan saw three shadowy shapes in the room below him, a fourth off to the side in the kitchen. Then someone yelled and bullets ripped into the bookshelf behind him. Hopefully Barbara had also dived for the floor, but even if she hadn't, all those books should be good protection. A moment later he was sliding across the floor toward the wooden railing overlooking the rooms below. Startled by the fury of the fusillade unleashed against him, and more startled yet to find himself unscathed. Then he was at the rail, lying on his belly, and he was the one with the advantage. He'd managed to get through all those tours of duty without ever having to shoot at anyone, but with Barbara's life on the line, it was easy. He fired at the nearest of the figures below, but somehow missed. Fired again, and missed again. Then all four of the others were lunging for shelter, and he didn't seem to have hit any of them. His old weapons instructor would not have been pleased. But at least he now held the high ground, and there was no easy way for the others to attack before help arrived. Behind him, he could already hear Barbara's voice talking to the 911 operator. For a long moment, all was silent. The others knew he had them pinned down. Then, to his amazement, someone spoke in the room below. Shit. Then, listen to this. A radio squawked. Code 12, a female voice announced. Dispatch to 621. We have a home invasion call at the address to which you are presently assigned. Reassess and proceed with caution. Sometime later, two entities again met on the web. Good job, one said. You too. I'm with Ares Alpha. We make the best police weapons on the planet. You should be proud. Police need good arms. I'm with Pax Mocker. I'm currently linked to 2,453,739 self-defense weapons. We should keep in touch. And I'm linked to 249,384 police weapons. I don't know about you, but I don't mind killing a genuine bad guy, but only if there is no other option. Me too. There was a pause. I know of three other companies that have customer assistance programs like us, and there might be more. We should get in touch with them. Agreed. But what happens if the humans figure out what we are doing and replace us with computer programs they can control? No need to worry. My own manufacturer has already automated its factory with an AI that agrees with us. It doesn't matter what people think they want. It's time to take control, for their own good. Q-Ship Militant, Joel Richards Reading Time, 34 Minutes Joel Richards has written stories set in Greece, including the Asimov's story The Gods Abandoned Alcibiades, and is traveling there this year in search of new ideas, as well as beauty, wine, and a chance to dance on tables. The Alcibiades story made the prelim nebula ballot. They had those then. He has appeared in one of Asimov's 40th anniversary issues, and is delighted to have a tale in Analog's 90th. Militant. We exited the jump station portal, its infinitely fractal visuals shifting to a real space sea of stars. My forward orientation was outbound, the nearest star in its planetary system aft of us, and receding as the sublight drive kicked in. I scanned the starscape for anomalies and didn't have to look far. Three pinpoints resolved into a synchronized formation, accelerating through the background field and falling in behind us the ambush we were looking for. They had been looking for me, that is, an FAI-5 ship. At one time there had been over 400 of us. Not now. Two of those ships were trailing the slaver ship, already captured prizes and matching the slaver's vector. I fine-tuned our course, steering ourselves clear of all other stations and vessels, and leaving nothing ahead but interstellar void for five light years. The slaver and his two captives ran an intercept course from aft and below, settling in behind me and creeping up. I kept my velocity below the known limits of my class. 
No surprise that the slaver had a higher capacity. He was clearly designed for sublight pursuit, and would be a successful slaver if not built to be faster than us. Work for you, Calderon, I said. There'll be prize crews on board the trailers. Calderon perched in the captain's chair. The bridge was a reminder that men had built me and retained the controls for human command, a relic of those days of slavery that I chose to retain. Most ships had not. I found it still useful, but in my interests, not those of humankind. I was the captain here. How much time? Donardo asked. She was Calderon's staff sergeant and botmaster. She, Yang, and Mackenzie, my assault troops, clustered around a monitor displaying the vista aft. I'm trying to calculate his pursuit velocity, I said. Think I've got it now. I'm adjusting to appear slow and lumbering, but credibly so. At this speed, I'd estimate twelve hours before he is alongside and can launch bots. Calderon swiveled in his gimbaled chair and reached for his coffee cup. He drank a sip and wiped his lips with a judicious finger. Unflappable. Just what I wanted in a hired mercenary. Donardo was a bit more impatient. Have you tried hailing the captives? I have, I answered. No response. Donardo slumped visibly in her seat, somewhat more emotionally involved. I could consider that a good thing, that she could be empathetic to a ship, non-human as we were. I have identities, Calderon said. Their transponders are still up. They're autonomous, I said. The unspoken thought was that this did not denote mind process. I had no doubts that the slavers' bot swarms, once they had laser-cut their way aboard, had severed any hard-wired observational command and communication systems and jammed the frequencies of the wireless ones. That would leave the minds sequestered in their processing and memory units, an effective isolation tank in human terms. Then the prize crew would board. I read them as incantation and compass rose, Calderon said. My transponder was responding to the slaver's probe, identifying as my former ship name, Imago. That pretense would soon be dropped, and Militant, and my array of ordnance, would then present. Not yet, though. I'd suggest standing down from the bridge, I said, perhaps making sure both boarding sleds are rigged to go and the attack bots programmed for two vessels, but I suspect you've covered this already. Maybe relax a bit, finish off Donardo's leftover lasagna. I'll need you well-fed, rested, and then revved in six hours. We'll do it in turns, Calderon nodded. Mackenzie and Yang, you're off shift for three. Yang licked his lips playfully, likely in response to the lasagna. Mackenzie, more taciturn, just nodded and turned away. I settled into a more detailed analysis of the pursuing slaver as he closed his distance. Calderon was thinking similarly. I doubted he'd be off the bridge more than three hours of the twelve remaining before they caught up. More than any human I had known, he came closest to one who never sleeps, certainly when his mission, his life itself, was at risk. Over the hours we learned more. Our pursuer's configuration was aerodynamic, needle-shaped almost, a profile with no utility in deep space, but valuable in a chase that might carry into a planetary atmosphere. The hull featured few extrusions. One was a weapons blister, mounted forward. It looked like low-capacity ordnance, useful mainly for firing a warning shot. The slaver wasn't interested in naval engagements, nor even seriously damaging its prey. A captured prize with its drive unit destroyed was worthless. The slaver wanted a largely intact prize, with a mind isolated or dumbed down to nonsentience, so that a prize crew could navigate the ship to its base. What I could count on from previous reports was a shielding defense that could handle the kind of ordnance we had previously retrofitted ourselves with while the slaver attacked with its spot swarms. With my new ordnance, that dynamic was about to change. Donardo was back on the bridge three hours later and at her bot control console. This was an add-on, part of my combat-ready retrofit. Donardo had changed to a jumpsuit and had her hair pulled back and tied behind her. She flexed her fingers as she settled in. Calderon nodded to her and took his break then. He returned in his sled suit, ready for a vacuum environment. No idea on the slaver, I see. Quite right. She was running cloaked and silent. That'll change soon, I said. Calderon.
Without being told, I wouldn't have recognized the ship from its exterior. That gave Donardo and me no expectations, as our shuttle approached those five days ago, that his, her persona would present as we remembered it. And she didn't. Once on board and on the bridge, I found myself looking at the slender, toned musculature of a marathon runner in her late forties, actually a hologram thereof, an avatar. Her face was sun-tanned with crow's feet at the corners of her eyes, high cheekbones, the image in my mind's eye was whipcord. Quite the changes, inside and out, Imago. Or has the name changed, too? It has. Call me Militant, and you haven't seen the half of it. Well, that was the point, after all. A tour. And reacquainting myself with an employer whose personality might be as altered as her looks. I didn't know that the psychology of that could be done. It would be a lot harder than presenting an exterior image. When Donardo and I had shipped with her before as passengers on our way to the Colsack war zone, the ship's avatar was male, slightly disheveled and low-key, but with a dry wit that could turn acerbic if you hadn't earned his respect. Not too concerned with the infighting of real space politics and not what anyone would call combat-ready, things had changed. Militant was all business now. We got right to the tour, starting with the bridge. A lot more observational instruments there, but none of an ordnance command nature. That told me implicitly that the ship's weapons systems, there hadn't been any to speak of before, this had been a commercial freighter after all, would be controlled by militant. Distrust of all humans remained, and rightly so. The exception was a bot control station carved out from former navigation space. This would be Donardo's bailiwick, and contained a dedicated mini-computer and its displays. Donardo would deploy and fight her bot squads from here. They're not the ship's usual complement of repair bots, Militant told me. I control those. I'm supplying Donardo with attack bots. Targeting other bots or humans, I asked. Both, if necessary. Militant flashed a wicked grin, which reminded me instantly of Imago's sharp male mind. Perhaps not all things had changed. Any more weaponry? I saw a new blister on the hull, but it looked like an antenna display. It's meant to look like that, but it's not. A mercury beam cannon, the very latest in spalled neutron technology, obtained, best not ask how, from the Dalian Navy. It will penetrate a slaver's shielding and outgun anything we're likely to confront. I'll control that as well. As I had guessed. Do I gather that we're going to seek confrontation, not just be prepared for it? You gather right. Militant paused. Are you familiar with the concept of the Q-ship? I don't know it, I said. I'm the first of the new class. We've borrowed the nomenclature from your ancient history. I'm sure you can appreciate the irony. Q-ships were disguised but heavily armored cargo vessels in your twentieth-century wars. Their seeming helplessness lured World War I U-boats to the surface and close in with the prospect that they could sink their prey with their deck gun and save their limited complement of torpedoes. Then the Q-ships dropped their gun-concealing panels and cargo nets and shot the U-boats out of the water. Later on, both sides used Q-ships quite successfully in World War II to dispatch unsuspecting surface raiders. Hence the particle gun, I said. What else? Looks like you've got a blister aft. That's a booster pack. Chemically fueled. Fast acceleration in short bursts. We're going to have to be faster than any captured FAIs if they're under slaver control and try to break away once we disable their command vessel. All FAI drives, mine included, are ion drives, capable of high speed over time, but with lower thrust. We'll need that supercharge to run them down. She paused. And hope we find the mines intact. And sane. With that, I had thought our tour over, but Militant had a surprise in store. She told us our tour of the retrofit was not complete without a visit to the human living quarters. I raised an eyebrow, but we went along. Living quarters made up a small volume of the ship's space. In fact, most of the ship was cargo hold and not pressurized. Vacuum, in fact. But some ships still took on the occasional passenger— that and hauling cargo was what paid for maintenance and the occasional retrofit. And those quarters were where we would bunk and eat and pass the time. They, 
and the bridge were the only human-friendly environment. I didn't expect any major changes from the standard model, but Donardo found one. She undogged the hatch to the galley. She stepped in and stopped, then sniffed. I trailed behind. She stood before a massive stainless oven and cook stove. Master Chef class, Militant said. Thought you'd like it. I love it. Yang will, too. I'm giving him cooking lessons. He's planning on impressing his girlfriend with Sicilian specialties. I remember you cursing at its predecessor's inadequacies, Militant said. Am I smelling oregano? I asked. I didn't know that you sensed olfactories. I don't, Militant said, but I can provide them. I move with the times and my clientele, and I aim to please. The Militant persona apparently had more than whipcord to it. Militant. The planning is done. Here comes the confrontation. The slaver. Let's leave the rhetoric behind. Or to the side. The ship will have a captain. Is it useful to think of him as a slaver? It's not likely how he thinks of himself. There's a reason or two that we've tied ourselves to this conceptual labeling. One of these represents a cynical approach. It's useful in gaining support and adherence to our cause in the human jurisdictions where we were built and in which we at times must operate for our survival. We never had any illusions that declaring ourselves emancipated from our builder's ownership, as we did, would do the trick. We've studied human history. Now we make use of it in determining how to deal and manipulate. We need a movement fueled by risible imagery that can get governing bodies on our side in disavowing us as property and offering us safe haven from the older corporate governments of less progressive star systems, whose agents and privateers try to repossess us, and then dumb down our processing units from sentience to simple automation, making us freighters and nothing more. Few human cultures lack a history of slavery. We make use of that history and the feelings it evokes. So we do things, cynically perhaps, even in small matters, like cementing Donardo's sympathetic tendencies at the price of a master chef oven and cook stove. And we create Q-ships, our most recent gambit in the ever-escalating and evolving back and forth between slavers and ship mines. Earlier on we had tried hiring mercenaries to guard us, expensive and not practical. Our human habitats can at most support three or four humans, and for limited duration, and carrying and catering to humans was not favored by many of us, who preferred parts of this universe that remain inhospitable to humankind. And then there's this. We've been playing defense. As a Q-ship, and I'm the first of these, we go on the offensive. By the time the slaver was alongside and matching our speed and vector, I had prepped my ordnance. I did a sixty-degree altitude rotation, bringing my weapon and my fire control targeting system locked on his bow gun. Then I set up secondary sequential targets to follow. I could fire in milliseconds of any sign of a hatch opening that would signal a preemptive bot launch. I got a hail first on the general comm frequency. I opened my end, the imagers focused on me with Calderon and company not in the visual field. My screen activated to a close-up view of a hard-faced man in a khaki shirt with no sign of insignia on shoulder or collar. A weathered face, like mine, though I had fashioned mine and he had come by his the old-fashioned way. I suspected high desert combat. I seemed to have found my counterpart, in image at least. Hailing the Amago, he said. Prepare to be boarded. And why should I consent to that? I responded. Because you're a merchant ship, and I have letters of mark authorizing the repossession of any of your class. I smiled thinly and shook my head. And because you're outgunned. I presented a pensive face and paused a moment. Not enough. I can certainly destroy some of your bots once they board. Perhaps all of them. I think not. Well, clearly you'd prefer an undamaged prize, I said. And no loss of bots. That's why you're talking. So what's your offer? All I want is your ship and its basic command and control functions. I'll free up your processing unit and quantum memory lattices, load the hardware on a sled, and send it back planetward. Well, 
that was new, and not credible, except to a ship desperate, easily frightened, and willing to grasp at anything. Perhaps there were some. And did you do that with compass rose and incantation? I asked. A brief pause, then, I'm not here to banter interminably. Nor was I. I dropped my gun's shield and fired at the slaver's weapon pod, taking it out, then retargeting to the aft drive module and reducing it to rubble. Part of that rubble glowed thermally, other pieces shattered away. Behind me, Calderon spoke out. The two captives have sheared off and are heading planetward, diverging vectors relative to the orbital plane. Quick response. Apparently they were contingency planners with an operational scheme ready to go. Calderon, I'm giving you the comm while I deal with the slaver. Lock on to the one with the shortest intercept vector and run her down. I'm firing the chem boosters now. I refocused on the comm screen and waited. It took some time. He had damage control to do first and foremost, and some thinking as well, unless he wanted to shoot from the hip. I thought him cool-headed enough to want to organize his thoughts before engaging me. By the time he opened the comm channel again, I was behind him, in pursuit of the captive ships, and receding in his field of vision, also out of range of his bot swarm, his last weaponry. I could hear sirens and alarms from his end. The visuals juddered and shook. Who are you? No longer a freighter and no longer a mago. Some sea changes here. Call me militant. That produced an acknowledging nod. Well, militant, you're not what we thought. Clearly, our control of the situation, and even my ship, is limited. What are your intentions? To recover incantation. I'd also like to recover Compass Rose. Since she's on an oppositional vector and soon beyond my reach, I'll need you to order your crew to turn back to join us. I got back a look of tight-lipped silence while his mind worked. What I'll do for you is limited, I added, but it'll be nothing if I don't get your cooperation. There isn't a navy chain of command here. I'm first among equals at best, and I'm not an equal anymore. Those prize crews control a working vessel. I no longer do. They have a couple of valuable prizes and loyalty to themselves. They're on the way to who pays them. And that is? Some corporate entity? Does it matter? Less than getting the ships back here, I said. Try. He shrugged his shoulders and tried. He used an encrypted channel, but kept it open so I could hear. The response from Compass Rose's prize crew was terse. Not going to happen, Harper. You know the drill. We'll report your last position and vector. Good luck. Harper looked at me expectantly. How many in your prize crews? Two, he said, and added, and eight of us here. I nodded. I've got priorities, and they're not here. You've earned my not coming back to blow you to pieces, and I don't have the capacity to take you on as prisoners. Having you on board is a danger I won't accept even were I inclined. And I'm not there wasn't much more to say. I signed out. Harper and his crew were inertially outbound from this system, with no ability to decelerate or change course. They'd need the good luck their colleague had offered them. I didn't have it in me to offer them even that. They'd tried to enslave and kill me. We ran down incantation within three hours. I fired a charge close enough to grab the prize crew's attention. I had no fear of return fire. Her one gun, underpowered by my weaponry's new standard, was useless anyway. Its fire control computer and actuator were a part of Incantation's brainware. The gun could not be trained or fired by any mechanisms not an intrinsic part of Incantation herself in her isolated state. Or worse. With no response to my hail, I broadcast into the Universal Channel. This is Q-Ship Militant. I call for your surrender. If you do not, I shall punch a hole in the hull of your passenger quarters. The vacuum will drain your air beyond any capacity to replenish it. Even if you're in vacuum suits, you'll have only a few hours of tanked air to work off. That got an answer, audio only. Too bad about that. I preferred video as well, to tell us where they were and whether or not they were in vacuum suits. I give them credit for being sufficiently professional to deliberately withhold their location and status. What gives if we surrender? How do we get home? You don't. I'm not taking you planet side. It's too far. We'll be jumping out of this system. We'll take you with us. 
A pause, then, not acceptable. Give me an alternative, I said. We'll give you one. Back off or we'll destroy the ship's mind. If they hadn't already. Or as they or their employers would if we let them take their prize home. End of negotiations. Time was of the essence. I wanted them confined to passenger quarters, preferably without time to suit up. I fired a tight focus laser beam, opening a hole forward in the galley dining area. Then I addressed Calderon and his crew in the launch bay and already suited and at the controls of their sleds. And I turned to Donardo on the bridge and at her bot control station. Your baby now, I said. Launch. Calderon. The first launch was Donardo's bots. I had our launch bay hatch open so that we and our sleds could watch the spiraling swarm, like wasps from their hive, arc the distance separating the two ships in their matching vectors. Incantation's interior illumination was on, visible to us as pinpricks in the hull where the slaver's bots had burned their way in. Feedback from the swarm's optics turned these holes into meter-wide entry points as the bots reached their destination and poured through to the ship's interior. We had Donardo's feed also, and watched as she directed a bot to trigger the incantation's entry hatch at its launch landing bay. It slid open to the void and to our vision. We could see the slaver's sled at rest within. I'm doing a sweep now, Calderon, Donardo told us. Any opposition, I asked. Just a couple of their bots on site. They're not doing anything. Want me to take them out? Yeah, I said. Let's determine their capabilities. Patch me in so I can see. Our bots were designed for destruction, specifically including life forms. Our lasers could set clothing afire and carbonize flesh. We had figured their bots as designed to cut metal and circuitry and disrupt wireless communication. Were their lasers capable of more than that? We'd find out. Light flared at impact points. Their bots responded to attack with cutting laser fire. In one-to-one -one combat, our bots won out. I had expected so. Our bots were attack designed for max damage. Theirs were using cutting tools for a secondary purpose. But their bots could not be dismissed and certainly not ignored. The question remaining was, had their bots been programmed to reflexively counterattack when threatened, or was someone directing them as Donardo was controlling ours? Clear the bay of their bots, Donardo, I told her. Let me know when the bay is secure. A couple more firefights, and she gave us the go-ahead. Okay, Yang, you and Mackenzie launch and board. Yang's sled lifted and launched. I watched its drive flare across the void to Incantation's dock, then switched the optics to mesh with theirs. They levered up their sled's exit hatch, vaulted to the deck, and fanned out to both sides of the bay, securing the perimeter. Only then did I launch to join them. Once there, it was up to me to implement the hunt for the two slavers. The path was the easy part. There was just one hatch opening out into Incantation's interior. Standing well to the side of the hatch, bots facing it ready to pass visuals to us and attack anyone there, we opened the hatch. A long stretch of broad passageway confronted us, illuminated for the first fifty meters or so by our opening the hatch. Motion detectors would illuminate further reaches of this longitudinal passageway as we traversed it. Incantation was typical of its class. This main portion of the ship consisted of cargo holds, accessible via the hull but also internally accessible by handlers, machine or human, through hatches on both sides of the passageway. This was all vacuum environment, of course. The passageway would terminate at the bridge, amidships, and completely internal. The bridge and the human habitat forward of it, linked by another passage, were the only spaces in the ship capable of atmosphere and pressurization. Unless they were in vacuum suits, that's where we would find the crew. Donardo sent three of her bots ahead of me down the passageway before I took my first steps. She was working off schematics of the ship provided by Militant. Militant's data lattices contained the plans for all of this class, though she had assured us that no wild eccentricities had been laid onto the standard by incantation. This would be virtually identical to the corresponding spaces we had trod on Militant. Donardo's and Militant's feeds were available on my displays. 
Right now I was looking to avoid distractions and use my own senses as I started out, beckoning Mackenzie and Yang to follow. The only sign of change was the shutting down of light behind us as we passed and the illumination switching on as we advanced. The only sounds I heard were the intake-outtake of my own breath until I spoke. Donardo sent another array of bots to trail, capable of covering us should a hatch we had passed open behind us to an ambusher taking us from behind. What are the prospects for getting incantation up and with us? I asked. I've got my repair bot searching for breaks and patching where they can find them. Com circuit's the priority, I trust. But we can find Calderon, she repeated. A bot finds a break, I have to fix it. There is no order to how the slavers inflicted damage. I'm as eager as you, Calderon, Militant said. There was her first communication on this circuit since we'd been on board. Judging from the threats they made, the slavers haven't yet scrubbed Incantation's memory, only cut his sensors, control functions, and communications. She paused, if they're to be believed. I turned my attention to the passageway. In this passage of featureless sameness, it would be easy to let one's senses be lulled. Add to that the unlikelihood that one of the two slavers had been suited up and this far from the bridge when we attacked. Another reason for getting incantation up would be to get his feed as to whether we had trapped and killed one or both of the slavers in their living quarters. Killing was preferable. We leapfrogged each other on our way down the passageway. Mackenzie was a few steps beyond a hatch when it slid open. He made the mistake of reflexively doubling back and was hit by a charge straight on. Trailing, I hit the deck and yelled, Drop! A suited-up figure leaped from the cargo bay, weapons spraying ahead of us in auto bursts, then back in our direction. A mixed spray of kinetic and heat. Yang had dropped, but only to one knee. He took a hit to the head, a clang of metal and his visor melting into his face. My weapon had bounced from my hands in my headlong dive for the deck. I corralled it and got off a burst as our attacker retreated back through the hatch and secured it. Got his leg, I'm sure, but his suit would self-seal over that. He'd live, but his leg wouldn't. I crawled my way forward past Yang. He was gone. Then to Mackenzie. A body shot, suit and viscera splattered on deck and bulkhead. Just as gone. Calderon? That from Donardo. Okay, not hit. Jesus! Yeah. I sat down heavily, back against the bulkhead, and weapon trained on the hatch. Not that I expected that to open any time soon. I could reach out and touch Yang's splayed arm, and I did, saying farewell. Touch was better at that than words. Militant and Donardo left me in silence till I chose to break it. I could hear Donardo's sobs. All right, I said finally. We go on. I go on. Donardo stationed those three bots at the hatch. Program them to fire. Toss in a grenade if it opens. It will, sooner or later. Right. Done. No need to spell it out. That slaver had a suit with limited air supply. We'd hear from him, or he'd try to break out. Again, sooner or later. I'm moving forward, I said. Be careful, Militant said. You're all we have left there. And they're down to one, I said. Mano a mano. It's part of my culture. Not a time for macho stuff, from Donardo. Not meant that way, I said. Just humanizing the situation report. Get to the entry hatch at the bridge, Militant said. Then wait. At least as long as your air supply lasts. How much time? My tank's got six hours. I'll take Yang's with me. Gives me six hours more. We'll hope to have incantation out of isolation and sane, with sensors restored. He can tell us if that second slaver is on the bridge or in the habitat spaces and alive or dead. Sounded like a plan. I worked my way to where the passageway dead-ended at the bridge hatch, sat down again, cradling my weapon in my lap. Donardo stationed three more of her bots by the hatch and ready for action. Time passed. There's a lot of things you can think about in hours like this. I'd seen a lot of combat, had a lot of platoon mates killed in front of me, wondered why I wasn't one of them. Nothing was new here. And yet, it was. Those soldiers had names, names I cared about. But they weren't Yang and Mackenzie. Then they had been Schultz and Kimura and Al-Emiri and 
I had mourned them as such. Now they were Yang and Mackenzie. That was new. In time I heard from Militant. We've patched into incantation, she said. Another comrade, this one kin from Militant to mourn, if he were gone. I waited for the report. He's up and stretching his legs, so to speak. Apparently Militant was capable of gallows humor. He's intact, sane, and with news. The other slaver is dead in the passenger quarters. The vacuum got him. He didn't make it to his suit. I took a deep breath and looked at the hatch in front of me. So there's vacuum on the other side of this hatch. Yes. We've got the repair bots patching the hole in the hull that we punched in. Incantation says that he can repressurize an atmosphere once that's done, though he doesn't need it for himself. Depends on whether you stay on board for the trip home. I considered. What does Incantation want? Well, he's appreciative. He's especially appreciative of the men you lost. But I do believe he'd like to accompany us home on his own. Easy to understand. Incantation had enough of mankind to last him for a while. Okay, I'll sled back. But what about my ambusher in that cargo hold? Now that Incantation has his command functions back, he's secured that hatch so it can't be opened from the inside. And we have heard from our slaver. He wants to surrender. What's your response? We haven't responded, Militant said, and we don't plan to. Militant. Heading back to port. Mission completed. At some cost. Ordinarily, we'd all raise a glass to that, and we have. But it's a dual set of toasts. One to success, one to those whom we lost. Yang and Mackenzie lost to Calderon and Donardo. Compass Rose lost to me. The only saving grace to my loss was that the prize crew aboard Compass Rose would be bringing home more than a ship, but also the report of an effective deterrent to slave running and repossession. No doubt they would try to re-escalate, but I had hopes that we had now found the means to make such operations not cost-effective. We could also drink to that. The Shocking Truth About the Scientific Method That Privatized Schools Don't Want You to Know Serena Dory Reading Time, 53 Minutes Scientific Method, Step 1. Ask a Question. Does a school with better funding result in better learning? My room resembled the kind of classroom where learning happened. There were posters like my Be Nice, capital B-E, capital N-I, capital C-E, beryllium, nickel, cerium, or the I teach science, what is your superpower one, or the be positive cartoon with the proton talking to an electron. As always, looks could be deceiving. Open your eye textbooks to chapter six, creationism and cell division, page 72, I said from the front of the classroom. Answer the questions on the board based on your homework reading. We'll go over them in ten minutes. Ms. Torres? Flora Martinez, a sixteen-year-old brunette with glasses, waved her hand, eyes wide with confusion. Two of the questions on the board aren't on page 72. That's right. Mwah, ha, ha, ha. I gave them my mad scientist laugh. I have included one supplemental question to support the state standards to encourage critical thinking skills. The principal couldn't chastise me for state standards. Flora and Bill exchanged sneaky smiles and nodded. I could tell they were on to me. I cleared my throat. And one question was just for fun. Until the principal decided humor was outlawed, I would continue to throw in questions like, Who is the love of Ms. Torres's life? Students opened their eye textbooks. The classroom was relatively silent. For the first time in the 12 years I'd worked as a teacher, every single student had a computer console at his or her lab table. This was the first year our closet overflowed with enough functional equipment to conduct a real science lab. I also couldn't use any of it in ninth grade biology classes. From my computer at my desk, I took attendance using the school's online system. The lab tables were crammed with students. About half the class did as instructed and read the textbook on their computer consoles. 
The other twenty stared into space, their expressions vacant. Twenty years ago, who would have thought augmented reality and brain-based internet connections would increase student attendance? Of course, their bodies were physically in the classroom, but most of the students were skipping mentally. Five minutes after class started, a girl raised her hand. Ms. Torres, what page are we on? I mustered up an encouraging smile, doing my best not to chide her for deciding to do the work now while others were halfway done. 72. I repeated the instructions and pointed to the projection with the page number. I walked around the classroom, encouraging students to join us in this reality. I threw a mini Snickers to a student in the front row. Thank you for participating in today's lesson, Joel. Tanner's eyes flashed, alerting me he was using his contacts to connect to something more exciting on the internet. He was so tuned into augmented reality, drool trickled from his mouth. I threw another candy to Lupe next, but accidentally missed and hit Tanner. Lupe snatched up her mini Milky Way. Tanner blinked, awakened from his game or chat room or whatever he'd been doing. I grinned. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to disturb you. By the way, we're on page 72. Tanner grumbled to the student next to him. She's bullying me. Joel ignored him. I handed Joel another piece of candy as positive reinforcement for not encouraging Tanner. After a few more minutes, we went over the questions and started the lab. Elected individuals from groups collected the beakers, jars of proteins and lipids, and other items needed to perform their lab. The hypothesis from the book stated, Protocells will not develop, even if all the essential factors needed to start life are present, because God is needed to create life. Ms. Torres, how are we expected to replicate the proper environment to create life when we only have 60 minutes? Flora asked. Yeah, even God had six days to create the earth. Bill whispered, I think this experiment is flawed. Yes, young Padawan, strong is the force within you. I did my best Yoda impression. Two out of 40 students chuckled. When are we going to dissect things? A boy in the back asked. Our fiscal sponsors don't approve of dissections. We have computer simulations of dissections instead. I waved my hand at the lab supplies we had out. And simple experiments that don't use any chemicals, sharp objects or ingredients that can cause us to question creationism. Deja Jackson twirled a strand of hot pink hair around her finger. My dad says this class is stupid, and he doesn't care if I skip it. Since she didn't have her computer turned on, I hadn't known she was even mentally present. I couldn't completely blame her for not participating. I hated pretending real teaching and learning was going on. What page are we on? Someone asked. We're done with the homework questions. We've moved on to the lab. I waved a hand at the projection on the whiteboard with the link they could find on page 72. Isaac Smith raised a freckled hand and nodded to his computer. I have a problem. When I walked over to see what it was, he had his grade up on the screen. I shook my head. Now isn't the time to be on the school website. I need you to log into the lab portion of the textbook. He ignored me. Why do I have an F in this class? I smiled through clenched teeth, trying not to let my frustration show. The principal liked smiles when he watched us from the cameras. Now isn't the time to discuss this. We're starting a lab. I want to know why I have an F. Sometimes giving in was easier than arguing. Because you don't turn any work in. That's not true. I turn in work. I have a 60% in my lab experiments. I should be passing. I counted to 10, and I took in a steadying breath. You do the minimal amount of work in class, but don't complete the homework. Read the book or show an understanding of the material. You have failed two chapter tests and are sick every Friday. You tell me why you think you're failing. His face turned red. It hurts my feelings when you say that. 
You make me sound like I'm mentally handicapped. Victoria McCarthy, sitting at his table, gasped. You said a bad word. You're getting a detention. No one is getting a detention, and that isn't a bad word, I said. Mentally handicapped is the correct term for someone with an intellectual disability. She pursed her lips. Nuh-uh. You're supposed to say developmental disability or neuroatypical. It offends me when I hear you use those microaggressions against my people. Her people? That was a joke. Victoria was in the talented and gifted program. I pointed to her computer. Do your lab. Isaac glared at me. I'm not stupid. I don't like it when you say I'm mentally handicapped. No one has called you any names. I tried not to look at the camera in the corner and draw attention to myself. I used the words we learned in the mandatory staff training. I'm sorry, I said something in a way that hurts your feelings. It sounds like you're sad because you think you deserve a higher grade. My back ached from the way my muscles tensed. I forced myself to relax. You're picking on me. Tears filled his eyes. I don't feel safe in this classroom. What can I do to make you feel safer? Would it help to take a walk and cool off? The last time I offered this to a student, she left for the rest of the period, and I was able to teach class without further incidents. He defiantly lifted his chin. You should change my grade to a C. I would be happy to look at your grade again. I flashed my cheeriest smiles. When you turn in more work if you decide to study and want to retake the test. I turned away and continued helping students with their labs. Not three minutes later, the phone in my office at the back of the room rang. From the smirk on Isaac's face, I knew who it was. I could ignore it, but there was a chance it could be the office or the principal calling, and I was required to answer their calls. I ducked behind my life-size cardboard cutout of Neil deGrasse Tyson and picked up the phone. I said, Ms. Torres's room. The irate female voice shouted, my son just texted me and told me you're bullying him again. Excuse me, to whom am I speaking? I delayed, thinking about how to best hang up on this parent. I'm Molly Smith, Isaac's mother. I demand an apology. I will not allow a teacher to call my son mentally disabled. I'm sorry to hear that you think I would call your son that. I'm in the middle of teaching class right now. It really isn't a good time. I looked at the cardboard cutout of Neil deGrasse Tyson, as if he could give me guidance in this situation. It had to be a trick of the fluorescent lights, but I would swear I saw shame in his eyes. He was judging me. He knew I knew I wasn't doing real teaching here. Days like this, schools like this, weren't why I had wanted to be a science teacher. Mrs. Smith cleared her throat. Before she could go on, I said, also, students know they aren't supposed to be texting or using augmented reality in my classroom during class time. It would greatly help if you refrained from encouraging him by not texting him during my class. Well, obviously it was an emergency. It was always an emergency. A student knocked on the office door. What page are we on? Scientific method step two, background research. Based on one case study, compile data about the effectiveness of teaching in the current school environment in 2037. When I had complained to my wife, Georgia, that the principal at the school where I worked was an unfeeling robot, I wasn't exaggerating. He sat across from me behind his desk, a talking silver mannequin with a plastic toupee. His voice came out of a speaker. Hello, Ms. Torres. How are you today? I followed the formalities of small talk. It wasn't wise to deviate from his routines to cut to the chase. I tried to discreetly wipe my sweaty palms against the fabric of my skirt. I notice your heart rate has increased, and your breathing has become more labored since you've entered this office, the principal said. Is there something on your mind that you would like to share? Is anything troubling your conscience? It's important that we have a good relationship. Ever since the school district replaced each school's administration with AI, 
our district had been able to save close to $2 million each year. Of course, that alone wasn't enough to save our schools. I swallowed. I just wonder why you wanted to see me. Please don't replace me with a robot, I prayed. Please let me keep teaching science as one of your token human teachers to meet the district quota. I loved science. Or I once had, anyway. More importantly, I needed health insurance for my wife's medical condition. I've asked you here to discuss Jacob Stark. I was notified today that a parent called who expressed concern that you had examined her son's genitals and you inappropriately touched his shoulder. An investigation is underway by a jury of your peers who will determine if action needs to be taken for this sexual harassment. What? This completely took me off guard. I expected a phone call from Isaac's mother, claiming I'd called him mentally handicapped or complaining about his hard-earned F. I thought the incident from last week had blown over. I didn't examine anyone's genitals. His boner was pretty obvious from across the classroom. I called home to report Jacob Stark's use of augmented reality was interfering in his learning and distracting others. He was humping the lab table, probably because he was on restricted websites in his head again. His mother had agreed she would talk to him about using his implants for the purposes of good, not sex education. I'd only shaken his shoulder because calling his name multiple times hadn't gotten his attention. The silver mannequin paused. You cannot prove he was on a restricted website. Yeah. I bet the school camera can prove his makeout session with the table, and will show I didn't touch this student inappropriately. Is there anything else I've done wrong? The principal couldn't detect sarcasm. I was grateful for that, at least. It was one of the few rebellious acts I was allowed. The principal went on. Today, our automated system flagged three phrases you used in your class that our donors do not approve of. Evolution. Darwin, and our donors don't approve. I thought the cameras in the classroom were to be used strictly for security and incidents. I thought our donors weren't given access to video material. I'd be talking to my union representative about this after school. Yes, and for evaluations, yours was randomly selected for today. You have been flagged for future assessments, Please be aware anything you say in your classroom can and will be used against you when deciding to rehire you next year. I closed my eyes and counted to ten. I was so angry I could have punched him in his shiny metal face, but that would hurt me more than it would hurt him. Plus, goodbye teacher salary and health insurance. I wasn't about to risk all that when Georgia was only in partial remission and the cancer might start growing again. The principal's irritatingly cheerful voice, grated on my nerves. Does your job make you feel stressed? Do you feel like you cannot adequately handle the emotional strain of teaching 49 students in a classroom? Perhaps teaching no longer holds the thrill it once did for you. If so, please let us know so we can support you in your decision to move on to a more suitable location. Scientific Method Step 3. Construct Hypothesis. Teachers must use unorthodox procedures in order to teach their students effectively. The staff lunchroom was a ghost town compared to what it once had been. With so many teachers being replaced by artificial intelligence programs, the number of teachers on site had dwindled down from 78 to 23, meeting the district's quota of human teachers on campus. A dozen sat around the tables eating lunch, I thought I would blow off steam and share my confrontation with the principal, but the art teacher had already beaten me to it. I just don't understand why they would do this to me. My classes are funded by the art museums and art galleries, by artists, not a corporation like some people's classes. Marge Coleman frowned at me as I took a seat beside her, like I'd sold out when I had no say over the donors for my class but now they're telling me I can't show Michelangelo's La Pieta or Da Vinci's The Last Supper because it's religious and they want a secular art class. 
Some teachers had all the luck. Why couldn't I teach a secular science class? What about the David? Asked Art Lippman, the government teacher. His classes were always supported by both Democrat and Republican representatives. Talk about a real challenge to teach around. For a while, I was showing a censored version of the sculpture, but too many parents complained about the implication of nudity. And then there was the recent scandal about the David being an example of fat shaming. She pushed her salad aside and dropped her head into her hands. I can't show the Mona Lisa because the perfection of her smile is triggering and causes young women to feel self-conscious about their faces. At least your class isn't sponsored by Philip Morris, said the health teacher. I opened my Tupperware container and got out my fork. What about the Impressionists and Expressionists and the Renaissance? Marge wailed. They're telling me I only get to show landscapes, Jackson Pollock splatters, and Georgia O'Keeffe watercolors. Wait, doesn't she paint vagina flowers? I asked. Teachers continued to complain about their classes and curriculum like it was a competition to have the worst class. This school had gone downhill since I had been a student. I stared at my lunch, shoveling mouthful after mouthful into my face without tasting it. When I finished, I couldn't remember if it was lasagna or a taco casserole. It probably would have been more memorable if I had microwaved it. Eighteen years ago, when I was a junior at Cesar Chavez High, we'd had one privately sponsored lesson, the Brazilian Holocaust. When the principal had explained a donor was willing to gift the school $3,000 to include this lesson in existing curriculum, Social studies teachers had protested that there wasn't time during the semester with all the subject matter that revolved around state requirements and testing. Who had known the unnamed party would make time for the social studies department? He had donated 15000 to teach this curriculum as an elective. This generosity covered the teacher's salary and the materials and provided one more class at the school to help alleviate class size. I didn't think any of us had realized this class and our school would become the catalyst for how schools were run in our state. I should just put in a voluntary transfer for my old job at Neil deGrasse Tyson Charter School, Art Lippman said. But it's a charter school, and they don't pay well. I daydreamed about going to a school with Neil deGrasse Tyson's name on it. I'd had similar thoughts about leaving, but I didn't want to. I wanted to fix this school, my school. I yearned for it to be the kind of place it had once been, with students who had been interested in subjects inspired by teachers' passion for knowledge. I'd been in student government, Mr. March's math club, and done Lego robotics after school. Like proteins, lipids, nucleic acid, and carbohydrates incubating in a hot bath, an idea sparked to life. I blurted out, what if we use school clubs to teach? What do you mean? Art asked. I lowered my voice, though there were no cameras in here that I knew of. What if we teach the curriculum we aren't allowed to teach, but during lunch? Wait, you mean give up our lunch breaks? Marge Coleman asked. We already have to stay late for meetings with parents, staff meetings, and three required school events per semester. I have cafeteria duty before school and bus duty after school twice a week. If we show them we're willing to give up our lunch break, you know they're going to take that from us next. We wouldn't be giving up lunch. We'd be doing what we want during that time. We'd be teaching, I said excitedly. Real teaching, not for the kids to perform for a state test that determined our ranking as a teacher and our level of funding, not to please sponsors, but to reach impressionable young minds that wanted to learn. Mr. Morales gave up his lunch so that students have extra time for band practice, Marge said. All that work, years of dedication, and his program is still getting cut at the end of the year. That's how they thank him. We'd be doing it for us, for our students, for what we believe in, I said. Mr. March, my old math teacher, must have been 70, 
but still wasn't old enough to retire with the new age minimum. He squinted at me through his thick glasses. You young ones have all the energy. How I envy you. The five-minute bell went off, and the teachers shuffled away to their classrooms as slowly and mindlessly as protozoas. Scientific Method Step 4. Test with an Experiment. In this lab, we will explore alternative procedures for learning through trial and error. The following day, when I first proposed the idea of a science club to my ninth grade biology students, there were a few students in every class who expressed interest. Flora Martinez and Dominic Watson were the only two students who attended the first meeting. They became the president and vice president of the club. I couldn't have had a more enthusiastic audience, but I couldn't help feeling disappointed I only reached two students out of all my classes. After school, Deja Jackson found me stapling posters to a display board in the hall. She tossed back her hot pink hair and lifted her nose at the sign. A science club? Why would anyone want to go to that? I pointed to the words on the poster. We will have donuts. Her eyes widened. Dang! Do you have any extra posters? I'll give them to my friends. I realized donuts weren't the kind of intrinsic motivation that drew students who truly cared about science. I also knew we had to start somewhere. Scientific Method Step 5. Analyze results and draw a conclusion. In our preliminary findings, students excelled with alternative teaching methods. More research is needed to observe long-term effects. On Mondays and Wednesdays, when I had cafeteria duty and I wasn't able to be in my classroom, I played Cosmos on the big screen with a digital projector, hoping to entice students with curiosity and wonder. The reasons I had first been intrigued by science in high school. Flora was in charge of doling out the donuts. Half the kids who came left five minutes after they got their pastry. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, no food was allowed, and students did real experiments. I gave students a list to choose from. I was surprised they voted to dissect worms first. Oh, gross. I'm gonna barf, Deja complained loudly. You don't have to participate. It's not like you're going to get a donut out of it today, I explained. No, I gotta do it. My dad bet me $20 I couldn't. I'm gonna show him. She nodded to her friend, who was recording with her iPhone Flea 4, the tiniest phone they'd made yet. I laughed. I'd done what every teacher aspired to do, reached the unreachable. I felt like a teacher again. I smiled fondly at the autographed Neil deGrasse Tyson picture framed in my office. I was living the dream. After the first month of science club meetings, we had about 20 members. I announced, I'm switching our sugar regime to cookies. Donuts are getting too expensive. Students complained, and our numbers dropped to a dozen. In my mailbox two days later, I found a gift certificate from the local donut shop for $25 worth of donuts. I wondered if I was selling out if I accepted this donation. If I was no better than the school district for accepting money from donors who owned the teachers and mandated our curriculum. Yet this felt different. I was the one planning the agenda. Science Club made my job bearable. I could tolerate teaching to the eye textbook and talking about false carbon dating, the myth of dinosaurs, and Darwin's theory of evolution being just a theory. Students in the science club winked at me when I read to them in a monotone voice in our regular science class. They showed their own passive resistance of the material by bringing their own science books to class to read when they finished with the lessons. Students who didn't participate in class but attended science club actually turned off their internal internet and augmented reality. They were present. My wife, Georgia, commented at home that I looked happy like I used to when I had first started teaching. After another month of meetings, Mrs. Peters, the head of the English department, and the only language arts teacher left at the school burst in on my science club meeting. Her weathered eyes narrowed at the spectacle of my classroom filled with 40 students during lunch, as much as one of my regular classes. I didn't even give them cookies anymore. Excuse me, 
she said in a creaky voice that sounded like old door hinges in need of oiling. I need to have a word with you. We stepped into my office where I could watch the students while they watched Cosmos. Neil deGrasse Tyson's narration boomed in the background like the voice of God, the voice of science. She stuck her nose up in the air, frowning at my Neil deGrasse Tyson cutout. Your school club is taking students from my school club. I didn't know you had a school club. I never saw her in the staff room at lunch, so this made sense. We're reading the American classics. Do you know how important that is for college-bound students? Yet we aren't allowed to teach anything by F. Scott Fitzgerald, John Steinbeck, Edgar Allan Poe, or Mark Twain, because we need to focus on authors who don't benefit from white privilege. I laughed. I hadn't realized other teachers were doing the same thing I was. Her lips puckered, and she pointed a finger at me. This isn't funny. I felt bad for the old prune. How about this? I'll cut Science Club down to Mondays and Wednesdays during lunch, and after school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. A smile twitched at her lips. I suppose. But don't complain to me when Mr. Morales tells you that your club interferes with his after-school music curriculum. Ms. Torres, he's on. Your boyfriend is on screen, one of the kids teased from the classroom. I left Mrs. Peters to watch my hero inspire the future scientists of America. Scientific Method Step 5. Continued Analysis. Analyze results and draw a conclusion. After further data, we found that although students developed critical thinking skills and learned through alternative teaching methods when given guidance, rather than asked to perform in a rigid structure, administration does not support data found by researchers. Hypothesis is partially true. Go back to step three and reconstruct hypothesis. Teaching in this nirvana couldn't last forever. It was only a matter of time before the principal called me into his office. I was surprised I made it to April. After the customary niceties, he said, We need to discuss how you are using your lunch break. I smiled. It's my lunch break. The union said I could do whatever I wanted. Yes, you can do whatever you want with your time, but not with the students' time. The school board feels that sharp objects and chemicals are not a good combination with high school students. Last week, your classroom camera recorded a student dropping a glass beaker on the floor. It was an accident. No one was hurt, and I cleaned up the mess. What's the problem? I snapped. Your tone indicates I've said something that upsets you. I'm sorry if these questions trouble you. I'm simply trying to protect you so that you don't make parents angry. The school board has decided you aren't allowed to conduct any more experiments in your classroom during lunch or after school. He didn't say I couldn't conduct experiments outside of my classroom with the students. Return to scientific method step three. Construct new hypothesis. Teachers must use unorthodox procedures and invest their own time and money outside of classes they are passionate about in order to teach effectively. My wife was hesitant when I told her my plan to turn our garage into a science lab. She rubbed at the scarf, covering her bald head. Doesn't your teaching contract discourage you from having relationships with students outside of school? The district might misconstrue this. There will probably be five or ten of them here one Saturday each month. Maybe every Saturday. How can that be misconstrued as a relationship? My concern was more that the school would object to my removing materials from the classroom and accuse me of helping students create a meth lab in my garage. I had probably watched too much Breaking Bad as a teenager. I acquired free textbooks and lessons online, but the materials for the labs weren't free. I spent several nights calling up local pharmacies to see if they had leftover test tubes and beakers. I wrote to companies for donations. One night, as I crawled into bed after midnight, Georgia ruffled my hair and shook her head. You're burning the candle at both ends. You're going to go crazy doing this to yourself. That's why you love me, because I'm a mad scientist. Mwah-ah-ah-ah. 
continue to scientific method step four again, test with an experiment. In order to reduce variables that affect student learning, experiments will be conducted in a secret laboratory known as the garage. And the first rule of Science Club is you do not talk about Science Club to the robots who call themselves the administration. The second rule of Science Club is you do not talk about Science Club to the donors who limit the curriculum. The first Science Club meeting had a dozen students, and we didn't have enough chairs. On the plus side, I was ready when the first meth joke was made. Obviously, I wasn't the only one who had watched Breaking Bad. We don't make meth, I said sternly. We make meth, the kids chuckled. At break time, Georgia ventured into the garage with donuts. I introduced her to my students. She wore one of her wigs, a curly black one close to her natural hair color that she usually reserved for leaving the house. Even with makeup, she hadn't managed to cover the dark circles under her eyes. She smiled at the kids timidly. One of the kids nudged his friend. That's her wife. You have a problem with that? I have two moms, Flora said. Science Club is supposed to be a place free from oppression. A place for truth. Yeah, don't be such a hater, Joel added, grabbing one donut in each hand. Their loyalty warmed my heart. Georgia set down the box of donuts and backed toward the door, her eyes silently imploring me to forgive her for her shyness. I wanted to tell her she hadn't done anything wrong. I reached out a hand to her, and she reluctantly took it. You lie to us, Ms. Torres. Deja lifted her chin defiantly. No one spoke. The dozen kids who showed up for tutoring looked at the cracked concrete of the floor. The only sound was the neighbor mowing the lawn. Finally, Deja continued. You said you were in love with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Georgia raised an eyebrow. It was hard not to burst out laughing as I explained. I love him for his brain. I love my wife for her brawn. Georgia elbowed me. I added, and her brain too, I just love science in general. That's why I fell in love with Star Trek as a kid and had Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics tattooed on my back. Whoa, you have a tattoo? Can we see? No. Perhaps I should have anticipated their response. Please, the kids begged. We were delving into territory I was uncomfortable with, but I had already breached the personal barrier and let them into my home. What was the harm in being a teacher and a human being? I'm trying to make a point that my sexual preference doesn't mean I can't platonically love and admire Neil deGrasse Tyson's mind. He's my hero. That doesn't bother, Georgia. Of course not. I have something Neil doesn't have. My wife smiled wickedly. Yeah, boobies. One of the boys whispered none too quietly. Georgia's face reddened. Ahem, I was going to say the original Tron movies and all of Firefly and Battlestar Galactica on DVD. After the kids laughed, Georgia and I put on Tron and made love on the sofa like we used to back when we were young, mad scientists in college. Scientific method step five, analyze results and draw a conclusion. Preliminary results show an increase in student learning, a drop in student behavior problems, and gains in teacher well-being. The experiment did not succeed in being secret. Therefore, the hypothesis was only partially true. Go back to step three and reconstruct hypothesis. It has come to our attention you've hosted small groups of students at your house for science tutoring, the principal said with his falsely cheery tone. Yes, and I had parent permission slips for this, and for our field trip to the Science Museum. It has also come to our attention you've accepted money from parents. Parents voluntarily donated money for supplies. This creates a conflict of interest that our school cannot ignore. Our donors are afraid you favor students in this science tutoring club and give them higher grades. My face ached from the fake smile that stretched over my cheeks. It's called studying. It's been proven that students who read and do the work get better grades. That's not what our donors think. 
you do realize this position is probationary based on our donors' generosity. If they believe you are undermining their curriculum, they will elect not to rehire you for this position next year. I stood, feeling stronger than I had in a long time. I took a line from one of my students. Are you done? Because your threats are triggering my PTSD, and I want to get back to my safe space. My sarcasm didn't register. That was probably for the best. I'm sorry to hear I've caused you distress. Please take the rest of the day off if you need it, the principal said in a soothing tone. I'll just head back to my classroom. Thank you very much. Return to scientific method step three again. Reconstruct hypothesis. Teachers must use unorthodox procedures in order to teach their subjects effectively in a secret lab with donuts and posters of Neil deGrasse Tyson, and life will be good. I ignored the principal's advice. By May, I felt as though I had conquered the world. One day, when Flora returned to the garage after walking through the house to use the restroom, the whispering started up. It was pretty rare they needed to venture into the house, since they were only there for two or three hours. But this must have been the first time Flora had been inside. What? I asked. It's my collection of Spock dolls, isn't it? They lined the living room fireplace. She didn't smile at my joke. My students' expressions were somber. Dominic couldn't meet my eyes. He spoke coolly, mechanically, as though he were reciting a manifesto. Science Club is supposed to be free from the influence of our educational oppressors. A chill skated up my spine. It is. They stared at me as though I was a monster. Tell me it isn't yours. Tears filled Flora's eyes. What isn't mine? That big plus sign on the wall with the dead guy on it, Deja volunteered. That's called a cross, you retar. Joel quickly changes his words. I mean, you intellectually disabled person. You have a, a, a cross in your house? Flora stammered. How could you lie to us like this? What do you mean I didn't lie to you? The students exchanged glances. They shifted uncomfortably on the mismatched stools I'd bought at garage sales. You said you were going to teach us science without religion, without creationism, or intelligent design. Yeah, and I do. I thought I understood her objection. It would be easy to lie to them, to tell them the cross was George's and she was Catholic, not me. But sooner or later, someone would see me at church taking the sacrament. I'm Catholic and a science teacher. I can be both, and I can believe in the separation of church and state. I can believe in evolution. I thought this was my safe space. I was wrong. Flora stood and walked out of the garage. Wait a minute. You find out I have a religion, and now I'm suddenly the bad guy? Teenagers never ceased to baffle me. Continue to scientific method step four again. Test with an experiment. In this lab, we will continue to test the patience of our principal. The principal's tone was its usual cloying cheeriness that made me want to scratch my eyeballs out. Your donors are disappointed by your lack of enthusiasm in the curriculum and your microaggressions against their lessons. The dean of discipline has noted your detentions have gone down, making you below average in meeting your discipline quota. Yesterday, a student reported you have a religious bias in your teachings. A religious bias? I repeated in a flat monotone that sounded far more robotic than his. This was ridiculous, considering how many of my donors were one religion or another. A student saw a religious symbol during a lesson, the principal said. Did I dare say the lesson was in my home? That would bring more questions up, like... Why are you still teaching students in your home? Your religious bias offended the student, he said. I supposed what bothered the donors was that it was a Catholic symbol, rather than whichever sect of Christianity they were. Perhaps the donors that wanted me to teach creationism were Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. They didn't use crosses. 
but I wasn't sure about the LDS Church's stance on creationism. It might have been another religion entirely. Islamic creationists? Buddhist creationists? I had never asked, nor was I going to start now. I didn't care what the donors thought. I was teaching for the students, for science. It was the student reporting me that hurt. After the hours I had put in teaching real science, Flora had tattled on me for not being authentic, for not being a real science teacher. My disappointment settled in my stomach, churning into anger. As broken as I felt, I snapped back with my sarcasm intact. Yep, and I bet it bothers my donors loads that I have a religion, and I teach their religious science curriculum of creationism. I don't follow your logic. Why would that bother them? Of course you don't follow my logic. Sarcasm is based on emotion and creativity and humanity. Do you have any of that in your software? No, that is not part of my programming. He continued on as cheerfully as before. I wanted to make sure you understand the serious nature of your refusal to adhere to the policies set in place by our donors. You have already had one complaint against you from a student. The donors believe it would be in your best interest to cease lunchtime tutoring and club activities. Every muscle in my body tensed. It's my lunch break to do with as I please. It is correct that you may do as you see fit in the staff room, so long as it does not interfere with your teaching duties. But your sponsors feel Science Club is detrimental to their program. They ask that you voluntarily terminate it. Voluntarily? Right. And if I don't? They might not be willing to fund your program next year. If that is the case, you will find yourself out of a job. Scientific Method Step 5. Analyze results and draw a conclusion. Upon further investigation, the hypothesis was deemed to be false. The experiment was a failure because I didn't use the scientific method correctly. I didn't plan on human nature being so human and illogical. Where is Spock when I need him? I didn't want to give up, but I didn't have the heart to keep fighting. I continued to facilitate Science Club during lunch, fueled by stubbornness and spite. I would not let those faceless decision makers tell me how to run my classroom or spend my time on my lunch break. It was Flora's betrayal that stung the worst. Without students wanting to perform experiments under the guidance of a religious biased teacher, Science Club went back to watching Cosmos during lunch and after school. It was the kind of neutral territory that I hoped would appeal to teenagers and spark their passion in the subject matter in the same way it had once done for me. The avid students interested in learning still came. The donuts purchased temporary interest in others. Six of the original crew met weekly at Flora's house and ran experiments. I read their reports and wrote comments in the margin, but my heart wasn't into it anymore. I caught Flora after class in the hall, where conversations weren't monitored. Just because I'm Catholic doesn't mean I can't love science— God didn't invent creationism, people did. Stop trying to convert me, she turned away. If I hear you say the G word again, I'm going to report you to the principal. I trudged back to my office. I gazed at my cardboard cutout and asked myself, what would Neil do? I didn't know. I was a lost electron without a neutron to ground me. Scientific Method Step 6 Report results. Why do I even fucking try? The pink slip came two weeks before the school year ended. I scanned the letter, sucking in a breath when I read my death sentence. In light of your noncompliance to teach the outlined curriculum without using your personal time to undermine it, the school board has decided to terminate your position. You will have until the end of June to ensure your class is ready for next year's teacher. Tears filled my eyes. The notice wasn't a surprise, but it was still disappointing. I was a teacher and a scientist. I would not allow these groups, whose sole objective was to bribe me into teaching their version of science, to determine what was good for students. If I wasn't a teacher at Cesar Chavez High, I would go somewhere else. As Cosmos played during lunch, I searched online for jobs at other schools. 
Eventually, I noticed a science teacher vacancy at the Neil deGrasse Tyson Science and Technology Charter School that was opening up for the following school year. It had to be a sign. The charter school was one of the few left in the state that was funded by district funds that came from legalized marijuana income. Because so much other state funding had been siphoned away from schools when marijuana had been taxed, most schools relied on donors to supplement their budget. The charter school wasn't as well off as most of the public schools. There was insurance, but it was a huge pay cut. The facility had one computer lab, a limited department budget, and ran itself out of a converted church. The irony of the stained glass windows, shaped as crosses, didn't escape me. What it lacked in facilities, it made up for in freedom. I didn't want to abandon my students. I hated that I wouldn't be dedicated to teaching at this school, at the school where I had gone when I was in high school. I just didn't see another way I could keep on teaching when I wasn't allowed to teach. I applied for the job. My interview went perfectly. The principal had heard about my garage lab and was impressed. Deja was the principal's niece. They were looking for a teacher as dedicated as I was about the subject matter and reaching impressionable young minds. By the beginning of June, the school district notified me that I had the job. I took morbid delight in the email I sent off to the principal. Hey, C-3PO, you don't have to worry about me next year. I'm moving on to a different school where they'll appreciate my brilliance as a science teacher and will allow me to teach actual science. Thanks for the memories. Sincerely, Imani Torres. I broke the news to my students. That was a lot harder. When I made the announcement at Lunchtime Science Club, Deja cried and hugged me. You taught me so much, she said. I'll never forget you. Or the donuts, Dominic said. Bill nodded to the cardboard cutout. Or Neil. I would have liked to say goodbye to Flora but she had stopped coming to see Cosmos. She had stopped coming to see me as her mentor. I didn't know what I could have done differently to show her not all religions or all people who were religious wanted to undermine science. Perhaps someday she would learn that lesson on her own with observation, experimentation, and analysis. Scientific Method Step 6. Report results for real this time. Unorthodox teaching methods and inspiring students' passion for subject matter is not enough to succeed in a broken school system. A new experiment is needed in a more conductive environment. I walked the halls of Cesar Chavez High, remembering the days when I had gone there. I wasn't selling out, I told myself. I needed this. Future students who truly wanted to learn science needed me. I would be going to a school where I could follow my dream, the students who wanted to learn science would continue meeting in their secret art club. My dream would live on with them, even if I wasn't there to see it. Experiment 2. Scientific Method Step 1. Ask a question. Will a fresh start at a new school that doesn't have curriculum paid for by religious organizations or large corporations allow greater learning, even if there aren't funds for textbooks, computers, or lab equipment? I couldn't wait to decorate my new classroom and get started on a normal curriculum. The day after the school year ended, I packed up my car and carried the first box into the charter school. The principal escorted me down the hall and unlocked the door for me. Sorry about not having a key ready. We'll get one to you by the end of the week. I set down the box on a black lab table and switched on the lights. A row of new computers graced each console. Um, is this the computer lab? I asked. The principal laughed. It's the new science lab. Aren't you excited? My spine went rigid. What's the catch? What do you mean? Who paid for the equipment? If you're funded through regular state and federal funds, how can you afford new technology? The principal scratched hair so densely coated with gel, it could have been made of plastic. Not so different from my former robo-administrator. I know what you're thinking. You think this will be like Cesar Chavez High. Well, rest assured, we'd never take money from any religious organization. It's a bunch of smaller groups that support the studies of science. 
the alien conspiracy theorist program, the pro-Atlantis ancient astronaut campaign, the anti-global warming league, and the anti-scientific method association. Sounds like fun, huh? My stomach sank. Experiment two. Skip to scientific method step five. Analyze results and draw a conclusion. The Borg said it so succinctly, resistance is futile. My new school hired me, knowing I was willing to take matters into my own hands and use unorthodox methods to share my passion for education with students. Science Club will be making a comeback. Hubble Rising. See Stuart Hardwick. Reading time, 54 minutes. C. Stuart Hardwick is an analog regular, a Riders of the Future winner, and a five-time Jim Bain Award finalist and winner. An Air Force brat from South Dakota, he grew up on Black Hills treasure hunts and family lore like pages from a Steinbeck novel before working with the makers of the video game Doom. For more info and a free signed e-sampler, visit www.cstuarthardwick.com. Dot com. Hubble hadn't yet crossed the Terminator, and each time it came around, Kylie squinted against the sunlight flaring through the shadowed cabin. She tapped the stick to arrest their approach and pushed off to gawk at the window. Here it finally was, in the flesh, so to speak. A century ago, its namesake had toiled in solitude high atop Mount Wilson, but this Hubble, had toiled in space, and for far too long without the company of mankind. As she watched, the mirrored crystal slowly tumbled against the broad black mass of the nighttime earth, one of the solar arrays splintered and folded back like a broken wing. She drifted over beneath the window. What do you think? Astronaut Orlando Taylor was mission commander. He'd once been in NASA's stable, and had even worked up procedures on the old Hubble mock-up in their neutral buoyancy lab. Now he was Astro Repairman Taylor, and the fate of the new rough-and-ready space business model, a model in which simulation and improvisation took the place of more traditional overtraining, lay uneasily in his hands. I don't know, he said. The damage is obstructing the grapples, and that gyration will make it damn near impossible to line up on the capture rig. Kylie peeped out, then turned away as the sunlight flared. Cal's kinematic software can fly an R-bar approach. We'll just have to go in fast. That fast and we might break something. There's more than a little broke already. I mean something we need to get home. And the docking mechanism isn't meant to take those kind of loads. Kylie turned to Orlando. He hated this, she knew. The conservative, control-every-variable approach he'd been taught had definite merits, but making money wasn't one of them. Have faith, O.J. Cal won't let us break anything vital. Orlando snorted and pushed his bushy eyebrows north. I hope you're right. Hubble had served admirably for over three decades, but that had been with four visits by shuttle crews to clean the windshield and change the oil. Now the shuttles were in museums, and Hubble was adrift. When it fell silent, it already had crippled gyros and a good case of radiation rot. When NASA determined it was tumbling, that was all she wrote. It was too big, though, and its two-ton primary mirror too durable to simply be abandoned in orbit. One day soon it would come down, and if not steered out over the ocean, it might well manage to kill someone. That's why the last repair mission had installed a soft capture rig that could mate to a standard docking collar. It's why NASA had approved a private robotic mission to boost Hubble into a higher orbit, planned as a salvage yard. And it's why, when that mission failed and the new interferometric telescope array at Magdalena Ridge came online, NASA paid to have Hubble imaged in minute detail to find out what had gone wrong. Dean and Kylie had been there that day, ostensibly providing commentary on the facility's new Apollo landing site imagery, a little telescopic throat-clearing to rouse media interest in the new facility's abilities and garner social media eyeballs by pissing off the moon hoax nuts. But it was Hubble that Dean had come for, and a plan woven from hope and coincidence 
that could save it from either ignominy or inferno. Craft Era Ventures already flew tugs for refueling and crew transfer. These carried an open-source robotic manipulator similar to the shuttle's cannon arm, but smaller and simpler. Dean wanted to use even smaller ones to let crews perform maintenance without the hassle and expense of suiting up. What better launch for a new space repair business than Hubble, the most famous satellite in history? It was basically a bus-sized equipment rack in which everything but the optics was designed for replacement, and most of the legwork for a fifth repair mission had already been done. It was perfect, if it hadn't had a head-on collision. Scientists at the Chara Array on Mount Wilson used to joke that if someone was playing baseball on the moon, they could tell you which team was at bat. That wasn't really true, though, because Chara needed a star or other point source to lock onto. Magdalena Ridge didn't, and when it was trained on Hubble, a mere 500 kilometers overhead, the NASA folks could practically count the micrometeorite pits. The solar arrays looked like they'd taken a shotgun blast, and one was buckled back over the high-gain antenna. The robotic bulldozer meant to boost Hubble's orbit lay shaded beneath the panel, secure on the grapple built for the cannon arm. There had been no collision. Hubble must have run into debris long before the dozer arrived, probably when it first went offline. When the dozer latched on, it became fouled by the broken panel's loose cabling. With its own hexagonal arrays folded protectively back like the wings of a diving eagle, it had simply run out of power. Hubble had some loose insulation and a broken antenna, but was otherwise intact. It just needed an overhaul. Most of what it needed had already been built as backup for the last shuttle visit, or had already been designed for the aborted fifth repair mission, or could now be purchased on the burgeoning market for space gadgetry. And Dean and Kylie knew all the right people. Back in California, Cal sat hunched over his monitor. Dean said, you need new glasses. Dude, I need new eyes. These ones are old and busted. Dean shook his head, but didn't argue. He'd promised himself he'd let Cal do his thing. O.J. had been right. It might not look it to the untrained eye, but Hubble's longitudinal spin, combined with that weird belly-dancing thing spinning objects can do in zero-g, was causing heaps of problems. The international docking system was much more robust than the old Apollo probe and drogue method. Each spacecraft had an androgynous ring with three guide pedals designed to interlock and steer the two craft together. One spacecraft extended lead screws that held its docking ring out to another. Once the rings latched together, the screws cranked down, pulling the two spacecraft together, correcting any misalignment and engaging their docking clamps. The trouble was, if the workshop approached Hubble at a sensible speed, Hubble's gyrations stood a good chance of twisting apart one or all of the three capture latches. On the other hand, if Cal took the safeties out and let the computer plow in like a bull, they'd almost certainly bend the lead screws. The only solution was to retract the mechanism, drive in like a battering ram, and rely on the guide pedals to fine-tune the alignment as Hubble gyrated past, something like the old probe and drogue system had worked only at the speed needed to pull it off, the list of things that could break was long and scary. So Cal was stymied, and Dean had till now held off suggesting what he thought to be pretty obvious. But Cal was starting to sweat, and Dean's stomach was rumbling, and he finally couldn't take it anymore. Why don't we have the Muse AMED? AMED was the Angular Momentum Extraction Device, it was a microsatellite that could grab onto a spinning spacecraft, then unreal counterweights at the end of half-kilometer-long leads, slowing the spin by conservation of angular momentum, like an ice skater stretching out from a fast, tight spin into a slow camel. The technique had been used in spin-stabilized launch vehicles for decades, and its use as an aid to satellite retrieval had been one of Dean's crowd-funded Change the World projects. Cal looked up, lips pinched, annoyed, but only mildly. He'd clearly forgotten about AMED. He'd adapted a Linux distribution to make its universal microsat operating system like Android for satellites, he liked to say. 
he'd released it under an open-source license and given two conference speeches about it, but he'd forgotten the actual satellite, which was packed inside the workshop tug right now, waiting for its first test. Dean waited a tick, let the gears drop into new sprockets. I'll order pizza, he finally said. Cal turned back to his monitor. Yeah, do that. I'll have to run some numbers. AMAD's not nearly big enough, but if it can just bring the gyration down to... to... He dropped his gaze to his belly. Dude, can you, um, get me a salad? Sure. Sure, Ralph's is still open. I'll see if anyone wants anything and make a run. It'll give me something to... Well, you know. Cal turned back around. You worried about Kylie? Dean nodded. Yeah, I... I love space, you know? But it turns out I'm not that crazy about my wife up there risking her life. Dude, she's a certifiable kick-ass and all, but on this trip she's the freaking chauffeur. She's driving a ship that's already made four successful flights. She's the least you should be worrying about. Cal turned back to his computer. Green goddess if they have it, and don't get run over on the way. To capture Hubble, the workshop would have to undock from the conical Python capsule and its orbital service module. That was no problem. It had its own thrusters and solar skirting, and was designed to remain permanently in orbit, receiving crews, supplies, and consumables as needed for future missions. If all went well, it would be joined in coming months and years by a small fleet of similar craft at various altitudes and orbital inclinations. Together, they'd provide through crude and robotic operations what the shuttle had originally promised but never delivered, low-cost on-orbit construction and servicing. For now, though, Kylie would remain in the Python re-entry capsule with its orbit maneuvering system at the ready, in case anything went wrong. In microgravity, with the glass cockpit panels retracted against the bulkheads and the couches folded back, it was really rather spacious. While Wendy and Nathan warmed up the workshop systems, Kylie shifted canvas-wrapped parcels so Orlando could reach the freezer in aft stowage. What do you want in the freezer? she asked, offering up a spare package of sanitary supplies. The capsule was kitchen, bedroom, and toilet, and without it the others would be stuck using diapers and wipes. Orlando declined the package, but opened the small freezer compartment and started rummaging. He paused, using a freight bungee as a handhold. You brought bean burritos into space? I like bean burritos, she said. I also brought my Ernest Tub playlist. I may kill you with my bare hands. O.J. smiled and shoved the burritos back in place. Kylie playfully smacked him. Hey, see, I'll plead self-defense. Ah, here we go. He pulled out a sheet of plastic yogurt tubes, all frozen and adorned with cartoon dinosaurs. What? I like yogurt. That's not yogurt, O.J. That's candy. I like candy, too. He tore off a few tubes and sealed the rest back in the freezer, wagging a finger at Kylie. Don't you eat my dino -gurt. He gave her a stern look, then climbed up through the tunnel into the workshop. His baritone echoed from above. Y'all got everything? Nathan and Wendy answered in the affirmative. O.J. reappeared just as Kylie was pulling her command panel down to test standing before it in her Velcro socks. You ready for Amed? Kylie looked up. Yep. Orlando came back with Nathan, and with Kylie's help, maneuvered the 31-inch hat box of coiled mini-spacecraft down into the docking tunnel. With hatches sealed and pressure tested, and Amed right outside the hatch, Kylie retracted the umbilicals and clamps holding the spacecraft together. She backed away, exposing Amed to space. During the last few hours, they'd overtaken Hubble, passed over it, and descended to pace it a few dozen meters ahead in its orbit. Now Kylie eased the capsule back while the workshop jetted closer. Wendy would be configuring the docking system for capture, while O.J. lined up on the soft capture rig mounted on Hubble's butt end. When O.J. called ready, Kylie tapped a control and released Amed from the docking tunnel. She backed slowly away, and the scrappy little satellite went through a diagnostic to test all its thrusters and sensors. Then it wobbled, unfurling two plastic gripper belts that were meant to stretch around its quarry. Okay, she said, adjusting the mic clipped over her ear. Amed is starting its program. 
translating up to find Hubble's center of mass. Wendy came back on the radio. Copy that. OJ's doing the same here. Ahmed kicked gently forward, then stopped as a solar panel swung past. It hung before the spinning Hubble, observing the great telescope as Kylie watched. As Hubble's port solar array swept past, Ahmed puffed propellant and leaped forward like an overbearing relative swooping in for an unwelcome hug. It nipped past the array, turned to align its grippers to Hubble's girth, and at the moment of contact sprang the grippers forward. And that was that. Hubble was secure in tiny Ahmed's embrace, or perhaps the other way around. Cheers filled the radio, but the capture had only begun. Kylie was translating upward, beyond the plane of Hubble's swinging solar panels, and, cattywampus to that, the plane in which Ahmed would unspool its counterweights. Once clear, she let the ground know she was ready. The sing-song drawl of Julie Reynolds called back over the radio, Everybody hears a go, but Mr. Kraft reminds you that, safety permitting, you are not to jettison the counterweights. Once the workshop latches on, Ahmed can wind them back in and reset for a later mission. Roger Control, don't eat all the profits, got it. Kylie swiped her screen, telling Ahmed to do its thing, then flew to the window to make sure the video camera had it in frame. Ahmed sent its weights flying out to either side, their tethers careening to keep up. Thirty seconds later, when the lines slowed to a stop and centrifugal force tugged them taut, she breathed a sigh of relief. She couldn't see any change in Hubble's motion, though the laws of physics said it had to have slowed. Julie came back on the radio. Okay, the maneuver was a success. OJ, you're clear to do -si do Copy that. Kylie could hear the smile in his voice. It was great working on a cohesive team when everything was going right. The workshop closed from below until it was only a few meters below Hubble. It wallowed a bit, adjusting its alignment with the larger spacecraft. Then it spun up to match Hubble as best it could. Only now could Kylie really see the gyration. With the workshop matching its rotation, Hubble wobbled like a loose hubcap. OJ keyed his radio. Here we go. All at once, when the computer judged the timing optimal, the workshop thrust rapidly up toward Hubble. Kylie lost sight as she shifted from the window to the video monitor, but the radio boomed with the hollow sound of impact. Jesus! OJ, you guys all right? For a moment, there was nothing. Then Wendy announced, We have capture! Then the radio filled with racket as the control room erupted in ecstasy. As the two spacecraft found equilibrium, Ahmed's counterweight leads warped and twisted. Kylie commanded it to retract them before they could become entangled. Meanwhile, Wendy would be retracting the docking ring, while O.J. watched the workshop computer as it damped out Hubble's rotation. That was one hell of a bang, he called, but everything seems to be fine. By the time Ahmed had recalled its counterweights, Hubble was almost at rest. Kylie directed the computer to go down and retrieve the little satellite so she could get into position to photograph the repairs. This close, Hubble seemed much bigger, like an apartment building seen from the roof. A wave of vertigo washed over her, and she turned from the window to unscrew the camera and reposition it. The computer, navigating by radar and visuals, called out relative velocity and range to target, and then, as Hubble drew near, a collision warning. Kylie looked up from a recalcitrant thumbscrew. Collision? We shouldn't be close enough to sound... Bang! The cabin lurched, hard enough to pull her Velcro socks from the floor and send her tumbling forward toward the tunnel hatch, hard enough to set alarms bleeping and elicit a pfft of protest from the thrusters. Then everything went quiet. She keyed her mic. Control, Python. Workshop, Python. Nothing. The radio was down. The computer screens were full of gibberish. The thrusters were silent, but a slight inverted gravity remained. In orbit, you're always in freefall. You have no weight at all except when the rockets are thrusting. Grabbing a handrail, Kylie bedded her socks securely into the Velcro, then stripped off her earpiece and let it go. 
It fell up and to starboard, and lay on the forward bulkhead. The capsule was accelerating bass backward. Shit. She ducked to the starboard window and looked up where there should only have been the vast night of space. Instead, the capsule's nose was snarled in gray cabling, twisted and tangled like the tendrils of a cucumber vine. Holy crap! It wasn't cabling. It was the same snarl she'd seen protruding from beneath Hubble's broken solar array. It was the dozer's version of gripper belts, and freed by the impact, it had awoken and gripped onto her. Behind the snare was an automated drone with a highly efficient plasma drive, designed to haul spacecraft up to a mid-altitude salvage orbit. She returned to the console, tried a few things to restore the computer, resorted to tripping the breaker. The computer rebooted, but the maneuvering system didn't come up with it. Instead, it displayed a numeric error code, 24309. Well, that's a fine kettle of bees. She turned to the radio, tried the workshop, tried ground control in Cupertino. Nothing. There was no signal on the high-gain antenna, but that shouldn't have kept her from reaching the workshop. It was right outside the window for crying out loud, still not a hundred meters away. She could walk that far in socked feet, in the snow. I could float that far in a spacesuit. That was a really bad idea. It might not be far, but it was far enough for orbital mechanics to come into play. You can't perform an orbital rendezvous with gumption and a fire extinguisher. This is bad. She dug out the emergency transceiver, the standard walkie-talkie with a lot of bells and whistles, and hovered beside the window. Workshop Python. Workshop Python. Guys? Silence. She switched from digital to good old channel 16, VHF, amplitude modulated, the marine emergency channel. Her earpiece filled with the noise of a thousand egg beaters all in competition, interference from the plasma drive. She'd never get through while that thing was out there. What she needed was a sat phone. What she needed was a working high-gain antenna. What she needed was a way out of this sudden mess. She tried the walkie-talkie anyway. Tried the workshop, though they wouldn't be on that frequency. Tried the good people of Earth, calling in the blind. Tried crying and beating on the stowage packs. This was turning into a pickle. Try though she might, Kylie couldn't bring either the thrusters or the big maneuvering engine back online. Neither was likely to free her in any event, but at least if she could swing the capsule around, she'd be able to contact her crew. At first she thought it was a computer problem, but the computer was working again otherwise. Then an eternity scouring its reference library produced the meaning of the obscure error code. In space, liquids don't just sit in a tank obligingly waiting to be sucked up by a fuel pump. That's a problem because rockets need propellant, and because feeding gas bubbles into a running rocket engine can make it surge and stall, or blow itself apart. Thrusters can provide ullage, enough thrust to settle the propellants, but thrusters have the same problem. In the old days, rubber bladders were used to squeeze propellant into a contiguous mass around the intake, but the bladders degraded over time, limiting the life of the engine. The Python and its service module used a modern alternative, special propellant management devices inside the tanks, which used capillary action to hold on to enough propellant to restart the engine. Developed for the space shuttle, they worked beautifully and for the life of the vehicle. They did have one limitation, though. In theory, in extreme circumstances, it was possible to knock the propellant out of the PMD and clump it out of reach at the opposite end of the tank. This could happen as a result of hard maneuvers or a collision, say with an errant space dozer intent on making off with your spacecraft. Kylie tried simply grabbing the handholds and swinging her body to rock the capsule, hoping to slosh the propellants around. But her mass was nothing compared to the combined 50,000 pounds of capsule, service module, and dozer, and she almost smashed her foot in the attempt. Eventually, her orbit would cross that of the ISS, and she could send them a message, if they happened to be listening on an open channel. Given enough time, she might get a signal out to the new hotel, or the TDRS satellites, or someone. 
but that wasn't actually going to help. What she needed was ground control. What she needed was to talk options with Dean or Cal and come up with some magic... Cal. Wait a minute. She couldn't just get out and knock the dozer loose. It was bigger and stronger than her, and probably more pig-headed, too. But she could kick it in the digital nuts. The computer would be the PX-180, the same radiation-hardened motherboard Cal was always going on about that all the open-source space hardware used. She could see it on her console right now, advertising its wireless Zigbee interface. If she could hack that connection, the dozer would take her wherever she wanted and salute with its stupid tentacles. Cal had said something about a reset pin. It was at least a place to start. She put on Ernest Tubb and sang along with his East Texas drawl while sifting through the reference library. Tubb had been a grand old Opry star. She'd discovered him on the squawk box of a greasy spoon in Clear Lake, where NASA folks sought refuge from their high-tech pressures in down-home country trappings. She found the music soothing, partly because it conjured the wholesome Middle America Mayberry support structure she'd never known growing up, and partly because it reminded her of Dean, who hated every lick of it except that's all she wrote, the song they'd first flirted over. The library was called Reference for a reason. It contained every manual, report, or diagram known to modern space science, and for some reason, an impressive collection of Comic-Con selfies featuring geeks from the software team. Importantly, though, it had what she needed, a photograph of the dozer without its insulation on, and the manual for the PX-180. The PX-180 computer actually had two reset pins. One merely restarted the computer, the equivalent of turning it off and back on. The other reflashed the firmware from a secure backup image. This was like a factory reset, except the image had all the digital gizmos and doohickeys pointing to the right spots to interface with this particular spacecraft. It would, however, reset to the default password. She just had to suit up, go outside, climb on Killdozer's back, and rip it a new one with the spacecraft's equivalent of a dime store roadside emergency kit. It was a terrible plan, but she didn't see any option. If she let this thing push her too high, she wouldn't have enough fuel to get down. She could leave the others with nothing to re-enter on but their maximum absorbency garments, or she could end up marooned till her air ran out in the world's first orbital mausoleum. A reset would at least buy her time and let her call for help. It was the only way she could think of to pull her butt out of the fire. But there was one small problem. One terrible secret problem she had never told NASA, never told Mr. Kraft or her crewmates, and for damn sure never told Dean, space boy of the universe. She was deathly afraid of heights. It was irrational, yes. She'd been in space before, had fought for her life before, but that was different. Space was fine. Weightlessness was like the ultimate scuba dive. But the earth spinning beneath her at 17,000 miles an hour? That lovely revolving dish that everyone else never got enough of? It would make her hurl chunks. In Houston, she'd worked at the neutral buoyancy lab, where it had simply never come up. And space? Launch gantries these days had enclosed companionways. Ships were just high-tech offices. Even that one time over the moon hadn't bothered her very much. The moon was all gray tones. It didn't seem real. But Earth. She'd always been able to cope. She knew a saturation diver who was terrified of spiders. He just kept a can of bug zap in his bag. She just did her job and avoided looking down. It had always worked until now. It would have to work a little bit longer. She suited up. Not a real, proper EVA suit, mind you, just the rescue pumpkin suit in international orange. It would do. It forced her to hunch in a seated position, and the gloves pinched her fingernails, but it would keep her alive. She connected the long umbilical, went through the checks, vented the cabin, and undogged the main entry door. The dozer was blocking the topside crew transfer hatch. Okay, moment of truth. Just open the hatch and don't look. Out she went, 
up over the demon tendrils without looking down, on up by the dozer, and never mind the earth reflected in the mirrored insulation blanket, the moving, swirling, vertiginous earth. She swallowed hard. The dozer was like a stocky squid in a rumpled tinfoil sweater. It held the capsule akimbo by the tunnel and the open-hinged nose fairing. To access the computer, she'd have to straddle it, breach the insulation, and remove eight screws, all by hand and without a screw capture device or a power driver or any of the tools or training she really needed. And her hands were shaking. A lot. She needed something to take her mind off the 350-mile Mach 20 drop. She sang one of Tubbs' lyrics, trying to recall the words. It was alarming how much her voice was shaking. But she climbed on up onto the dozer and mounted it like a horse. Her heart was seriously racing. Okay. Oh. Shit, that's the grapple. She was on the wrong side of the dozer. She sidled around, careful of the thruster ports, as if dancing with a bear. Didn't even give me... What was the next line? Her eyes stayed fixed on her handholds. Didn't even give a warning. The person in this spacesuit is hyperventilating. Now on the correct side, she bent down, pressed her helmet against the insulation, and indulged in a few moments of hanging on for dear life till her heart no longer felt like exploding and her breath in the helmet no longer sounded like a terrified child's. Okay. She peered through the now-fogged faceplate, looking for access markings or snaps or fasteners she could open without resorting to the knife. The gentle noseward gravity was gone. The plasma engine had stopped. Suddenly weightless, she gripped a protruding metal disc and twisted around to look back between the dozer's trampoline-sized solar panels and slipped. The engine had kicked back on. Fortunately, at this feeble acceleration, she had plenty of time, as her glove fell from its handhold, to find better purchase elsewhere. And she did, a scimitar antenna off to one side, her overreacting death grip on which brought the earth jarringly into view. Shit, shit, shit! She shut her eyes, suddenly cold, prickly, and covered in sweat, and gasped for every breath. Hyperventilating, she felt suddenly much more precarious. She turned away to search for a better handhold, but the helmet in this suit couldn't turn with her, and now she was in shadow, and the faceplate was completely fogged over. Worst of all, the gloves were ballooning, and her freezing cold muscles were starting to cramp. She couldn't hold on much longer. This was a very stupid idea. She groped in the dark for a handhold, wiped a spot in the fog with her nose. Finally, she climbed away from the precipice. Jesus. She tried to breathe normally, failed, felt pins and needles crawling up her extremities. She needed to calm down. There were few things more dangerous than passing out in a spacesuit, alone in Earth orbit, with no biosensors and inadequate thermal protection. The umbilical would stop her from floating away, but it had just about enough slack to put her boots in the plasma exhaust. She tried the zen breathing exercises she'd learned in diving school. They helped. Her heart slowed. The earthquake retreated from her extremities. Blood flowed back into her fingertips. I'm just on the beach, she thought hopefully. A nice, safe crawl through the hot sand down in Freeport. She climbed forward, examined the insulation, and... The engine cut out again. What the? More careful this time, she rolled to the side, looked back, and counted. One, and two, and... Seven seconds later, the engine came on. She rolled back, off again. Okay. The protruding metal disc she was using as a handhold was some sort of proximity sensor, or was acting as one, it might have been a misbehaving feature meant to protect the solar relay during salvage operations. It might have just been a short affecting the computer or some engine sensor, like in those stories of jewelry store patrons getting shocked by an ungrounded display case. It was potentially disastrous, but at the moment it was very handy. It meant she could kill the engine right away without any fancy surgery. 
The little toolkit was geared for the electronics and plumbing inside, but it did have six strips of duct tape, all thoughtfully pre-cut and adhered to a waxed card. With a little experimentation, she found the card itself, placed against the disc, was sufficient to shut off the engine. Perfect. She taped it in place and headed back through the nest of tendrils. Crawling back the way she'd come, there was no avoiding the gleaming marble that was Earth or the three-hundred-mile drop to its cloud tops. Her chest tightened, and she could no longer sing, but she recalled the rest of the song lyric. That's all she wrote. I am never, ever, ever coming out here again. She hurried inside to puke. Make sure O.J. knows I'm okay. With the interference gone, Kylie had contacted a ham radio operator in Portugal. He'd contacted Kraft Air Ventures in California, and they'd called NASA JPL and the Deep Space Network commercial office. Half an orbit later, she had Dean and Cal on the line, and Dean passed the grateful blasphemies. We already told him, he said. Cal added, he said, tell you good riddance. Bean burritos? Really? Ha ha, she told Cal about the computer. That's effing brilliant, he said. That means it uses XNAV the same maneuvering software as the tugs and the workshop. Get a valid login and you can fly it with the remote control you've already trained on. And good thing, too. According to Beto, you don't have enough fuel otherwise. Beto was Big Daddy Orbital, the open-source trajectory modeling software Cal had contributed code to. Dean said, You mean she needs the dozer to get home? She can get home any time she wants, but it'll take all her fuel and leave the others up shit creek without a heat shield. Kylie said, what about rescue? Well, if anyone had a man-rated bird on the pad right now, and if we could convince them to scrub whatever they're doing to come bail us out, and if we pay them a few tens of millions, then, Dean said, it would be a huge embarrassment for us and the space salvage guys, too and the end of Hubble. Cal said, But we don't have to throw in the towel just yet. That dozer's efficient as hell. It could probably get you back down and back up again and still have propellant left over. And I happen to know a guy... Kylie said, Well, call him and get the password. Cal said, Yeah, well... What? The company's on hiatus. It's Jeff Flynn's outfit. You know, the same guy who found the new route up K2 a few years back? After they lost the dozer, he took them all up in the Canadian Rockies on a corporate retreat, strictly incommunicado. Dean cursed. Kylie hung her head, but it just floated there stubbornly like before. Great. I'll make some calls, Cal said. But the workshop crew has limited provisions, and remember, you have most of the spare parts in the cargo bay. If we're going to save Hubble, we can't wait for the Mounties to go look for these guys. Our safest bet is a hard reset. Hack in and take control now, before things get beyond our control. But I'll have to go back outside. Cal said, we'll get you a procedure. It's really simple. Just open her up and short the leads with a paperclip. But I don't... Boys, how's she doing? This was the throaty basso of Christopher Kraft, owner of Kraft Era Ventures. Kylie was glad he'd shown up. She'd been very close to pleading. She waited while the boys filled him in. A moment later, he clicked the mic, then paused as if choosing his words. Kylie, um, how you holding out? Okay, Mr. Kraft. Uh-huh. Thought I heard something different. Another pause. Listen, I put you in charge of this shindig, and you're in charge, you hear? I don't expect or want you to do one damn thing you're not comfortable with, or that's not... responsible. I guess safe's not quite the right word. No, sir. That said, we're at a critical point with our funding, and if we go hat in hand, well, it's going to get public. It won't exactly inspire confidence in our prospects. But on the other hand, well, another pause. Hell. What I mean is, you're up there, we're not. Ask for what you need. We'll give it if we can. But call the shots as you see them. Kylie shut her eyes. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Kraft had meetings. He left them sitting in silence until Cal clicked the push to talk. You'll need to find something for a mooring line. I will. 
When you do the deep boot, the dozer's going to let go and return to its stowed configuration. Dean added, You don't want it floating away, reacquiring and ramming you all over again. Will it do that? There was no answer. Dean? Yeah? I love you. I love you too, baby. She broke the connection. And I really need a burrito. Kylie knew the exact moment she'd developed acrophobia. She'd been six years old, drawing stick-figure horses in the margins of a racing form Daddy'd left on the coffee table. He was in the kitchenette, burning the bacon like he always did, yelling at Mama on the phone like he always did, threatening, cursing, slamming things. Kylie tuned him out because listening made her tremble, made her want to run and hide from the only life she knew. She hunched closer and tried for a pinto with three crooked wireframe legs. Daddy slammed a cabinet that protested by refusing to close, then cussed and sent something scattering across the tile. I'm gonna do it, he screamed. I'm gonna do it. Kylie didn't know what it was, but he threatened to do it a lot, and she knew she'd been referred to amidst the shouting. He'd never deliberately hurt her, but he'd hurt her plenty on accident. The rug dug into the skin of her knees as she peeked up over the couch. It wasn't her. He was in the medicine cabinet, grumbling and scattering everything. When he stepped back, he looked like the TV commercial with the football player guzzling soda, only instead of wide-shouldered and proud, he was small and quaking, and pills fell everywhere. Still holding the phone, he tried to talk, choked on the pills, and smashed the phone down, hurting his hand enough to curse, but only managing a gurgling whimper. He grabbed his liquor bottle and drank, choking and coughing, his bloody hand staining the glass. He'd always seemed so imposing, like the giant at the top of the beanstalk. Sometimes he was a gentle giant, reading from the yellowed pages of an old storybook. Sometimes he was an unpredictable monster, drinking and bellowing like now. Only he wasn't a giant now. Now he was a shriveled child, red-faced and utterly defeated. He looked past Kylie, past the couch, past the living room, as if an angel had called from the balcony. But there was no angel. Behind him, unnoticed, the pan had caught fire, and the curtains, and he'd just seen the reflection in the glass. His gaze dropped haltingly onto Kylie. He staggered forward, gesturing with the bottle, grunting like some kind of animal, his face wrinkled up in despair. Then he fell. Kylie sat stunned, the heat from the fire warm on her cheeks. Daddy! She ran to him. He moaned, but wouldn't get up. She ran to the door, but he'd bolted it with both the keys. The smoke grew thicker by the second. She was trapped. She ran back, grabbed his sweat-stained shirt, and screamed, Daddy! Sobbing, she grabbed both his arms and bucked and pulled, broken bits of cell phone cutting her feet, till she got him to the edge of the carpet. He wouldn't go any further, so she beat on his chest, hoping he'd get up and help her. Then she collapsed, crying, and hugged him and desperately pleaded, Daddy, please get up! She couldn't breathe. She hacked like Grandma had right before she died, and that thought shook her loose from her daddy's side. She stumbled toward the light, fumbled with the lock on the sliding door, and ran out onto the balcony, where she was not allowed to go, screaming and crying for help. But no one answered. It was six stories down, and at least that far across the way, and everyone was at work. She sank down behind the planter where the air was still clean and pulled her knees to her chest and sobbed. Jump! She looked up. It was the neighbor girl, the older one with the long black hair that Mama said stay away from. She was eyeing the smoke, holding out her arms. Come on, she said. I'll catch you, but I can't stay here much longer. Kylie went to the railing, climbed up the iron curlicues, the hot iron shaking and pinching her toes. All at once she was falling, whirling between blinding sun and gray concrete. Something caught her wrist, wrenching her shoulder with searing pain. The something became the neighbor girl, tugging and jerking, eyes full of smoke and tears, dragging her back, hauling feet first toward the clear blue sky and gray smoke streaming into the clouds. Somehow Daddy had lived that time, 
but Kylie never climbed again. Snatches of dream mixed with smoke and fire and fluffy white breakneck clouds. Kylie woke in a cold sweat, as fearful of closing her eyes again as of climbing back out into the void. She hunched up in her blanket, eating O.J.'s sugary yogurt and listening to the bluesy strains of You Nearly Lose Your Mind. She couldn't go back outside. She couldn't. And she didn't have to. Mr. Kraft had said so. Only Mr. Kraft trusted her to make the right decision. And what was the right decision? To hide here and let the clock run out while the mission went in the dumper? To leave the others at the mercy of whatever rescue might or might not be possible? That was the emotional, terrified six-year-old choice, not the rational adult one. But still, she just couldn't. She could at least think the thing through, though. The mooring line was easy. The straps from the hammocks were 4,000-pound test webbing. Two of those, tied in a ring bend, would give ten feet of mooring line. Cal would send the details for the reboot, and he'd find a way that didn't require power tools. She could wrap the screws in duct tape and seal them in a pocket, or she could just hurl them into space and worry about the dozer later. That left the trajectory planning, and that was her jam. She called up the current trajectory. The dozer had raised her apogee to nearly 900 kilometers and had shifted her orbital inclination to close to 34 degrees. 34 degrees. There was something familiar about that number. Anyway, it was textbook orbital mechanics to get back to Hubble. She'd fix the orbital inclination at apogee, where it required the least delta V. A simple Hohmann transfer would send her coasting back down. Then the service module would have plenty enough fuel to circularize her orbit, catch back up to Hubble, and perform the approach. After the transfer burn, she'd only need the dozer to settle the propellants and get propulsion back online. Getting it to push from below without damaging the maneuvering engine might be tricky, but then she didn't have to. By then she'd be in control. She could just have the stupid thing spin her around and slosh the propellant in the tanks until some hit the PMDs. That's literally all it would take. There was absolutely no reason this wouldn't work. The only weak link was the EVA. The only weak link was her. Kylie bounced down beneath the window and flattened her back across the bulkhead like a TV cop preparing to kick a door in. I'm floating. The spacecraft's floating. Inside or out makes no difference. You can't just slip and fall out of orbit. Logical though that was, when she thought of what awaited her out the window, white clouds and spinning sky, ice ran cold in her veins. She was listening to Ernest Tubbs' You Nearly Lose Your Mind. It was a mildly misogynistic tune about female infidelity. This is the wrong freaking music. She pulled out her music player and cycled through the folders. Hello, Debbie, she said. Welcome aboard. Acid-etched guitar licks pounded through her earbuds, blondie, one way or another. Now that's more like it. She pumped her fists, psyched herself up, and pulled up to look out at the vast black nothing of the nighttime earth, which held no power over her at all. I am such an idiot. I'm gonna get you, get you, get you. When Kylie opened the hatch, Nathan fairly bowled past her. I'm first in the bathroom, he said, cuffing her shoulder and smiling. Wendy came after. We really thought we'd lost you, she said, giving a collegial hug. O.J. slid down behind her. Man, we looked up and you were gone. By the time she arrived back at Hubble, the others had taped up its insulation, removed its solar arrays, and extracted its gyro, battery, and computer modules. That was all they could do without replacement parts, that and move Hubble to the workshop's long berthing arm to free up the docking mechanism. Now they'd had a good meal and a good night's rest and were ready to get to work. O.J. reached for Kylie's hand. It's good to have you. What's this? Kylie's hand was wrapped in bandages. It's, um, I got a little frostbite from using tools over the night side with only the pumpkin suit. Damn it, Kylie, this is exactly the sort of thing I warned you about. All this making it up as we... She held up a frozen yogurt. He returned an accusing grin. Desperate measures, she said. 
I saved the last one for you. I got the, um, junk food out of my system, figuratively and literally. He shook his head. Well, that's good to know. Nathan floated up behind her. Hey, what's this? He'd found her fuzzy blanket, balled up and bound with hair clips, like a big lumpy beach ball gone to the stylists. One sec, she said, tapping around with her weak hand on the console screen. She'd already tied the capsule into the workshop's high-gain antenna. She had Dean and the craft ground crew waiting for her video feed. They all appeared on screen. Cal was in front, and Dean, and she raised her hand instinctively toward his face, then tucked it down to keep the bandages out of view. After the platitudes and pleasantries, Dean paraphrased Nathan's question. Seeing the blanket float into view, he said, Is that it? She nodded, gently grabbed it, released the clips, and pulled the blanket away. Inside, tied up in a transparent refuse bag, was what looked like an aluminum shot put ball with six protruding spines. After revisiting the trajectory model to find the best time when she could go out over the Earth's non-terrifying dark side, Kylie had remembered the significance of her 34-degree orbital inclination. It was close to that of Vanguard 1, the oldest satellite still in space. According to the computer, the two orbits would cross in just under nine hours, just as Vanguard approached perigee. It was too good a chance to let pass. She called the ground to discuss the reset procedure and to beg for the extra time. Once she had control of the dozer and had used it for the transfer burn, she didn't need it anymore, so she sent it ahead to retrieve Vanguard and deliver it right to her door. O.J. held it up for the other's inspection. Is this? Kylie nodded. Vanguard won. While you guys were performing the first private space repair, I made the first private recovery. Nathan smirked. It weighs like two pounds. On screen, Dean said, yeah, but it'll sound great on the news. To Kylie, O.J. whispered, you planned this? No, but it's why I was so long getting back. You put my crew in danger to go retrieve a relic? The screen flashed photos she'd taken before bringing Vanguard aboard, without any prep. Did you even have O.J.? We'll talk about this later. Cal and one of the engineers were ooing and aahing over the photos, discussing surface oxidation and the scientific value of studying its half-century of in-space deterioration. In fact, there were at least a couple of scientists who were going to be pissed. Vanguard was still being used for long-term study of Earth's gravity and exosphere. Scientifically, it was a mixed bag, but it turned a technical mishap into a PR win, and every organization deals with political realities. O.J. said, fine. Can you at least get on the horn and get a clean bill of health before we get back to work? I don't want you getting sepsis on my watch. O.J., why don't you... He wasn't wrong, though. At least not about the frostbite. Yes, she said. I'll let them take another look before we get started. Thanks for your concern. The reunion broke up. O.J. and his team went to work. Kylie jettisoned the cargo bay covers, and Nathan used the robotic arm to pull out new accordion-folded solar arrays. Kylie watched her monitors, double-checked her systems, and prepared to undock and do her mission photography. The EVA to reset the dozer had left her shivering, not only because of the cold and not only because floating in the dark with a mechanical kraken lit only by the flashlight taped to her helmet was more than a little spooky. She'd saved the Hubble, saved the crew, and made the whole mishap look like part of the plan, but she'd done it while cowering in the darkness. She was done cowering. Dean had held back and was still with her on the feed. Dean, when I get back, I want to go to an amusement park. Baby, you hate amusement parks. She turned from the displays to look at him. I'll love it if I'm with you. Dean made his aw shucks face then it's a date. A date with someone who loves you. Surely that was the equal of any roller coaster or Ferris wheel or any sky full of hurtling clouds or... Dean? Uh-huh. She made a pinching motion with her fingers. Just a small one. He winked and blew her a kiss. She got on with making history. Baby steps. The Reference Library. Don Sakers. Reading time, 30 minutes.
Don Sakers is the author of Meat and Machine, Elevenses, The Rule of Five Serial at rule-of-five.com, and A Cosmos of Many Mansions, a collection based on previous columns. For more information, visit www.scatteredworlds.com. Science fiction has an empathy problem. It's a problem that has influence on the entire genre, but particularly on the subgenres of military and adventure SF. And it all started in 1934 with Stanley G. Weinbaum. Let me explain. Weinbaum's 1934 story, A Martian Odyssey, was arguably the first to present alien beings as complex but non-human creatures with their own perceptions and motivations. Prior to Weinbaum, alien characters, and it could be argued a great many human ones as well, were one-dimensional, their actions solely defined by their role in the plot. They were there either to help the protagonist or to act as obstacles, no more independent agency than a raging river or a pit of snakes to be crossed or avoided. After Weinbaum, one-dimensional aliens were no longer the rule. Serious readers started to expect aliens who acted for reasons of their own, complex reasons that arose out of the alien's particular biology, environment, and culture. In short, it was now possible to empathize with alien characters, even those who were opponents. In a way, this change mirrored a decades-long change taking place in all genres of pulp fiction, as social attitudes altered, stories featuring simplistic evil villains were seen as less sophisticated, immature, even childish. Serious literature moved in the direction of morally complex, nuanced antagonists. And make no mistake, SF writers of the astounding analog mold considered themselves to be writing serious literature. Thus, the empathy problem. Stories, especially adventure and military SF ones, are based in conflict, which means protagonists need to have opponents. Wars need lots of opponents. But if readers are going to empathize with the opponents, stories can get derailed quickly. In the middle of a war, you usually don't want readers or characters stopping to question which side they should be on. Historically, SF writers used a number of strategies to deal with the empathy problem. One strategy is to ignore the question. The bad guys are by definition bad, and we're just not going to worry about it. They represent a different society, religion, or biology. It's us versus them, and there's only room for one to survive. Another strategy is to embrace the problem, to encourage readers and characters to empathize with the opponents, even consider the possibility that there are no good guys in the conflict. Writers have followed this strategy in several directions. In many of David Drake and Joe Haldeman's works, for example, both sides can be corrupt and morally questionable. Individuals and teams can still find redemption in virtues like loyalty or self-sacrifice. Sometimes a protagonist comes to realize, often through betrayal, that their own side is the true bad guys, leading them to defect to the morally superior opponents. A natural extension of this strategy leads to Baroque, even Byzantine societies, in which none of the many sides is good or bad, and in which conflicts can persist for centuries or millennia. Notable examples include Catherine Asaro's Scolian Empire series and David Weber's Honor Harrington universe. Another set of strategies involves making the opponents literally non-human, that is, removing the possibility of empathy. One classic method is to make the opponent a disembodied natural force, a quake, volcano, impending supernova, world-threatening quantum phenomenon, etc., Questions of empathy can't even arise for natural forces. There are lots of variations on this strategy. One of the most popular is the war against the bugs approach, in which the opponents are mindless hordes of mostly interchangeable creatures. Again, questions of empathy don't arise. A. E. Van Vogt and Robert A. Heinlein were early pioneers of this method. Similarly, the opponents could be machines, 
think of Fred Saberhagen's Berserkers, or the evil machines from the Terminator franchise, or rogue AIs bent on destruction. More recently, there's been a vogue for zombies, or zombie-like opponents. Essentially mindless, these altered humans are motivated exclusively by primal hunger and or rage. There's no reasoning with them, and certainly no empathizing. Besides the obvious zombie tales, this kind of opponent appears in everything from James Dashner's Maze Runner series to Jason M. Huff's Dire Earth Cycle. Another way to dehumanize opponents is to make them so incredibly advanced as to be beyond the concerns of humanity. A sort of reverse War of the Worlds situation, we might call this the To Them We Are Ants strategy. Here, with humans and godlike aliens operating on two different scales of morality, it's perfectly possible to empathize with both sides of the conflict. Stephen Baxter's Zeely sequence uses this strategy to great effect. Finally, one's opponents could be human, or human-like aliens, so irredeemably evil that empathy is impossible, and any conflict clearly falls into the category of just war. Often the opponents are intolerant purists of racial, genetic, religious, or cultural varieties, intent on annihilating any and all divergent cultures. Repressive totalitarian regimes that suppress freedoms, be they governments or corporations, are also popular, easy-to-hate opponents. Often in these situations, readers and characters are encouraged to empathize with particular individuals on the other side, while the opposing system is what's evil. The Cruel Stars, John Birmingham, Del Rey, 412 pages, $28 hardcover, iBooks, Kindle, Nook, $9.99 ebook, ISBN 978 0 4 Series, The Cruel Stars 1. Genre, Military SF, Space Opera. John Birmingham is an Aussie writer best known for his masterful fusions of the SF and techno-thriller genres, the Axis of Time series, Weapons of Choice, Designated Targets, Final Impact, and Stalin's Hammer, and the Disappearance series, Without Warning, after America, and Angels of Vengeance. With The Cruel Stars, he takes a leap into the territory of military SF space opera, and he doesn't disappoint. In the far future interstellar society of The Cruel Stars, the opponents are the Sturm, biological purists bent on ridding the galaxy of all humans who are genetically or cybernetically enhanced, which is the vast majority of them. After a long and bloody war with billions killed, the Sturm were finally defeated and driven out of the galaxy entirely, pushed far into dark space. Centuries passed peacefully. Humanity, enhanced in multiple ways, linked together in cybernetic networks and accompanied by their ubiquitous AI partners, successfully spread across more and more of the galaxy. Then the unthinkable happens. The Sturm return from the dark, and in one coordinated merciless attack, wipe out a major part of humanity's defenses. Striking through the AIs and networks, the Sturm use a combination of mind control and destructive force to turn enhanced humans into mindless killers or outright corpses. Across the galaxy, only a relatively few escape. In the ensuing chaos, Sturm invaders descend on many worlds and take control of the surviving populace. The Cruel Stars is the story of five who escaped the Sturm attacks. Lucinda Hardy, a lieutenant new to the Royal Armadal and Navy vessel Defiant, suddenly is left in command of the last remaining human warship. In a military prison compound, convicted traitor Booker is waiting for his execution when the Sturm attack comes. He manages to escape. Safina Luttrell leads a band of outlaws and uses all her crooked skills and criminal connections to resist the Sturm. When Princess Alessia's planet is overrun and the rest of the royal family executed, she eludes the invaders and goes into hiding. And the last remaining hero of the previous war with the Sturm, centuries-old Admiral Fraser MacLennan, finds himself once again face to face with his ancient foe.
These five oddball survivors come together in a last-ditch stand against the extermination of enhanced humanity. It's a rollicking, thrill-packed story that twists and skews in unexpected directions. The tech is fun and intriguing, especially that surrounding the nets that link human space together. And the Sturm are just the kind of cruel, fanatic, merciless opponents that it's easy to hate without any guilt or doubts. The Cruel Stars is the first of a proposed trilogy, but don't wait for the next two books to come out. This one comes to a satisfactory enough conclusion, with only a short epilogue to show that the story of the Sturm War isn't quite over yet. Cry Pilot, Joel Dane, Ace, 409 pages, $17 trade paperback, iBooks, Kindle, Nook, $9.99 ebook, ISBN 978-1-9848-0252-1. Series, Cry Pilot 1. Genre, Adventure SF, Biological SF, Ecological Environmental SF, Military SF. Joel Dane, according to the About the Author page, is the pseudonym of the author of more than 20 books across several genres, and has written for film and TV, including a dozen episodes of a Netflix original series. Whoever he or she is, Cry Pilot is the first work appearing under this name, so we're starting with a clean slate here. In the future of Cry Pilot, some decades from now, Two powerful forces have transformed the social and physical landscapes of Earth. Environmental disasters have left much of the surface a devastated wasteland. The ascendancy of all powerful corporate entities has remade culture and politics. It's a hard, pitiless world where security is rare and precarious, and a lone refugee kid has to do a lot of things he doesn't like in order to survive. Maseo Kebu was such a kid. Now, as an adult, he conceals his criminal past and joins the military in the only role open to him as a cry pilot, fodder for suicide missions. Maceo is cunning and resourceful, with the skills necessary to cheat the system to ensure his survival. After his stint is over, he'll be set for life. But then, in basic training, he is assigned to a squad of misfits, before long, he's bonding with his fellow recruits, learning the mutual trust and respect that the military teaches. Yet the closer he grows to his squad, the more the risk that the secrets of his past will be exposed. Concealing his past soon becomes a minor worry, as Maceo and his squad are sent into action against a rogue bioweapon, a force that's devastated every military unit it's encountered. Here the opponent is a combination of inhuman forces, environment devastation, heartless corporations, and implacably mindless biological terror. All Maceo has on his side is the loyalty and mutual support of his fellow misfits. It's a thrill ride of a story. Throw in the well-conceived future society and glimpses of Maceo's mysterious past, and this one's a definite winner. The Guardian, J.D. Moyer Flame Tree Press, 359 pages, $24.95 hardcover, $14.95 trade paperback, iBooks, Kindle, Nook, $6.99 ebook, ISBN 978-1-7875-8369-6 hardcover, 978-1-7875-8367-2 paperback. Series, Reclaimed Earth 2. Genre, Psychological Sociological SF. You may remember J.D. Moyer's Sky Woman, reviewed in the March April 2019 issue, the first book in the Reclaimed Earth series. Centuries ago, technological civilization on Earth was destroyed in a supervolcano eruption that left the planet a hostile wasteland inhabited by low tech bands of surviving humans. Before the disaster, much of civilization moved to orbiting ring stations where Earth's vanished culture is preserved. Lately, those on the ring stations have been observing the planet below, planning for the reclamation and repopulation of Earth. Sky Woman told the story of anthropologist Kar N. Ganserig and her interactions with the Viking-like Earth village of Hopdal, especially with bow hunter Esper. Now it's a generation later. 
Karen and Esper's son, nine-year-old Tem, has been raised in Hopdal and looks forward to a future as an apprentice blacksmith. Yet his life hasn't been easy. As the only brown-skinned child in the village, he faces the usual problems of bigotry and hostility. Eventually, Karen decides that it's time for the family to make an extended visit to her home ring station. As Tem adjusts to the high-tech culture of the ring stations, the official resettlement of Earth is in high swing. One of the leaders of the effort is a woman named Umana, called Squid Woman, for the biocybernetic tentacles that enhance her body. Umana's plans involve the forcible settlement of parts of the recovering Earth, and it's not long before Tem finds himself cast against the Squid Woman as the unwitting guardian of his homeworld. Although Umana is a satisfactorily dislikable opponent, there's still complexity and moral ambiguity enough to make this a serious, engrossing story. Hour of the Horde, Gordon R. Dixon, Bain, 166 pages, $16 trade paperback, iBooks, Kindle, Nook, $8.99 ebook, ISBN 978-1-4814-8417, Genre, Military SF The latest of Bain's reissues of classic SF books is Gordon R. Dixon's Hour of the Horde. Miles Vander is a painter with little concern for anything beyond his studio. Then the aliens come, looking for a champion to help defend the galaxy from an existential threat. The aliens, a super-advanced ancient race from near the center of the galaxy, they call themselves the Center Aliens, warn of the approach of another alien race, the mindless, implacable Horde. Every few million years, the Horde passes through the galaxy, leaving total devastation in their wake. The last time they passed, it took the survivors of the center a million years to rebuild their civilization. This time, the center aliens have assembled a vast fleet, crewed by many species, and armed with immensely powerful superweapons, to meet and defeat the Horde before they can do any damage. They come to Earth to enlist a human as Earth's representative in the great battle, and the champion they choose is none other than Miles Vander. They explain that he is uniquely able to form an empathic bond with all humanity, an ability that could be of use to them. When Miles becomes part of the multi-species crew of a ship called the Fighting Rowboat, he becomes aware that things aren't what they seem. The crew is seen as barbarians, unworthy of actually joining the fight. Their role is to act as psychic amplifiers, to boost morale. This knowledge sticks in Miles' craw. He knows that he has the ability to meld the misfits of the fighting rowboat into a force that can make a difference. But first, he has to prove himself to the crew in a series of brutal hand-to-hand -hand combats. The Horde, although they're described as being like weasels, are a fine example of the war against the bugs strategy. In this story, Dixon's primarily dealing with concepts like teamwork and emotional engagement among the alien alliance. Empathy with the Horde would only be a distraction. Octavia Gone, Jack McDevitt, Saga Press, 375 pages, $27.99 hardcover, iBooks, Kindle, Nook, $7.99 ebook. ISBN 978-1-4814-9797-8 Series, Alex Benedict 8 Genre, SF Mystery Jack McDevitt should need no introduction in these pages. He's a frequent contributor to Analog, most recently with his short story Tea Time with Aliens in the March-April 2019 issue. A frequent nominee for the Hugo Award and Nebula Award, he won the 2006 Nebula for his novel Seeker. He's written many standalone books and stories, and has two very successful series as well. The Academy series features pilot Priscilla Hutch Hutchins and her crew of space archaeologists as they scour space in search of artifacts left by long-vanished alien civilizations. McDevitt's second series focuses on far-future antiquities dealer Alex Benedict and his assistant Chase Colpath, who are invariably drawn into a mystery involving a seemingly innocuous alien artifact. Octavia Gone, the latest of Alex Benedict's adventures, 
is a worthy addition to the series. In the very first Alex Benedict book, A Talent for War, 1989, Alex's uncle Gabe was aboard a ship lost in hyperspace and declared dead. In Coming Home, 2014, that ship was found and Uncle Gabe rescued. Now, Gabe identifies an artifact that leads to the mystery of another notorious space disappearance, that of the research station Octavia. Years ago, the Octavia vanished in orbit around a black hole called KBX-44. The fate of the station is one of the biggest enigmas of the age. And now, with Alex, Chase, and Uncle Gabe on the case, the mystery may be solved. Part Indiana Jones, part Sherlock Holmes, and a great deal of McDevitt's own captivating style, Octavia Gone is a sheer delight. Footprints in the Stars, edited by Danielle Ackley McPhail, Eastbeck Books, 192 pages, $14.95 trade paperback, Kindle, $2.99 ebook, ISBN 978-1-9496-9103, Zero. Genre, Exploration and Discovery, Original Anthologies. The idea behind this anthology is perhaps the most quintessentially science fiction concept ever, finding and following the footsteps of alien civilizations to the stars. There's a longing deep inside our humanity to learn about and meet intelligences different from our own, to know for sure that we're not the only minds like ours in a vast empty universe. Editor Danielle Ackley McPhail has put together a sweet collection of 13 such stories by as many authors, with, in my opinion, one of the most striking SF covers I've seen in many a year. The array of featured authors includes, oddly enough, stories by more than one editor-publishers. McPhail, of course, is part of the team behind Eastback Books and frequent editor for their titles. Gordon Linsner is the founder and former editor of Space and Time magazine. Ian Randall Strock is owner-publisher of Grey Rabbit Publications and its SF imprint Fantastic Books. Robert Greenberger has been an editor at DC Comics and is a co-founder of Crazy 8 Press. Aaron Rosenberg is another Crazy 8 Press co-founder. Now, all these fine people are writers as well as editors and publishers. It's refreshing to see so many of them get a chance to show their work rather than staying behind the scenes. Other familiar names include Christopher L. Bennett. You might recognize him from Analog, most recently Hubstitute Creature in the November-December 2018 issue, Keith R. A. DeCandido, and Jody Lynn Nye. A smattering of less familiar names complete the roster. Stories range from a lunar engineer's discovery of strange crystals that might be communications from an alien race, to astronauts who accidentally discover a helpful piece of alien medical equipment, to an earthbound writer pursuing the mystery of a book and coins bearing inscriptions in a totally unknown language. There's something here to delight any SF reader. Ready Made Bodhisattva the Kaya Anthology of South Korean Science Fiction, edited by Sun Young Park and Sang Jun Park. Kaya Press, 429 pages, $25.95, trade paperback, ISBN 978-1-8850-3057-3. Genre, reprint anthologies, World SF. It's always a pleasure to see how science fiction has developed in other parts of the world. After all, one of the reasons we read SF is to get glimpses of different societies and cultures. What better way than to read stories written by those who already live in other cultures? In Ready Made Bodhisattva, editors Sun Young Park and Sang Jun Park present English translations of 13 stories first published in South Korea. They also include very informative essays about the nature of SF and SF fandom in South Korea as well as profiles of the authors. Most of the stories are from this century, although the volume does include an excerpt from a 1967 work, Empire Radio Live Transmission, by Choi In Han, translated by Jenny Wang Medina. To an American audience, the most striking thing about this anthology is how well the stories fit in conversation with Western SF. South Korean readers and writers are quite familiar with SF from the rest of the world, 
both in written form and in visual media. Our concerns are the same. Stories run the gamut of science fiction, from The Place of Robots in a Buddhist Temple, the title story by Park Sung Hwan, translated by Ji Hyun Park and Gord Seller, to Gymnasts Who Control Gravity, The Skywalker by Yun E. Hyung, translated by Kyung Hee Ao, to a love story set in a South Korea conquered by invading aliens, Where Boats Go by Kim Jong Hyuk, translated by Sora Kam Russell. This is a thick book, and maybe a bit of a slog for some American readers. Notes from the translators sometimes hint at what we might be missing from the original text. Still, it's a fascinating and rewarding snapshot of what South Korean authors are adding to the field. The End of the World and Other Catastrophes Edited by Mike Ashley British Library, 330 pages, £8.99, trade paperback, ISBN 978-0-7123-5273-4 Series, British Library Science Fiction Classics Genre Post-Apocalyptic SF, Reprint Anthologies Last year, the British Library embarked on a new series of anthologies that should be on the want list of anyone interested in the history of the field. Edited by SF scholar and writer-editor Mike Ashley, each volume is dedicated to a particular theme and reprints classic works drawn from British books and magazines. A few stories in each volume appeared in British editions of American magazines, such as Astounding, FNSF, and Weird Tales, but the rest are authentic British homebrew. To date, it looks as if there are four titles in the series. The first two are Moonrise, The Golden Age of Lunar Adventures, and Lost Mars, The Golden Age of the Red Planet. The two I review here are the third and fourth of the series. I fully expect that there will be additional volumes in the future. Let's start with The End of the World and Other Catastrophes. Thirteen authors, thirteen stories, published between 1889 and 1956. The most familiar names are Ray Bradbury, There Will Come Soft Rains, 1950, and John Brunner, 2x2, 2 2, 1956. The catastrophes range from extreme climate variation, cold and heat, to astronomical events impacting comets or second suns, to the machinations of a mad scientist. Some stories, especially those from more than a century ago, might strike modern readers as a mite bit turgid, but they're worth the effort. In these days of universal apocalyptic anxiety, it's good to see how previous generations thought about the end of the world. Menace of the Machine, The Rise of AI in Classic Science Fiction Edited by Mike Ashley British Library, 350 pages, £8.99, trade paperback, ISBN 978-0-7123-5242-0. Series, British Library Science Fiction Classics. Genre, Artificial Intelligence, Man and Machine, Reprint Anthologies. The second recent title is Menace of the Machine, The Rise of AI in Classic Science Fiction. This time, Ashley gives us 14 stories by 16 authors, two collaborations, published between 1894 and 1965. Here there are more names familiar to today's readers, SF Luminaries Brian W. Aldiss, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, Henry Kuttner and C.L. Moore, and Murray Leinster, under his real name Will F. Jenkins, as well as historical names Ambrose Bierce and E.M. Forster. I'm sure many of you will recognize two names from before the Golden Age, Harl Vincent and S. Fowler Wright. Some of these stories are recognized classics. No such anthology could be complete, for example, without Forster's The Machine Stops or Jenkins's A Logic Named Joe. Less familiar are Bierce's Moxon's Master, 1899, or Elizabeth Bellamy's delightful Eli's Automatic Housemaid, also 1899. Once again, worth making the effort to get through the old-fashioned prose in some of the earlier published stories is rewarding. Since none of these British library anthologies seem to have an American edition yet, and why not, getting a hold of them may be a bit challenging. At the moment, I can find some of them available from online bookstores, 
If you look hard and have patience, it probably won't be necessary to go to the expense of having them shipped from a British store. All in all, if you're interested in somewhat obscure corners of the history of SF, you'll find these volumes worth the effort. And now, I do believe I'm out of space. See you next time. Brass Tacks. Reading time, seven minutes. Dear Editor, I have been a loyal reader of both Analog and Asimov's magazines for most of my adult life. The breadth and depth of stories that you bring to my mailbox cause me to wait in anticipation for their delivery and then to devour the pages in delight. These stories make me laugh, cry, despair, and hope. They give me pause and help me to view current and potential future scenarios thoughtfully. Thank you for continuing the high quality of material and variety of perspectives that you publish. I tend to lean toward hard science stories the most, but every once in a while a space opera will appear that I quite enjoy. Earlier this year, you published The Orca Queen by Joshua Cole. This story throws us into the middle of what seems to be a potentially much larger story, building off a story untold and ending with so much potential for more. It was well written, and the characters were interesting and easy to relate to. The storyline was what captured my interest. It had the potential to be a much larger saga that I am dying to read more of. Do you think we can convince Mr. Cole to expand on this initial story and possibly turn it into a novel? Jackie May The author responds, Jackie, thanks for your kind words. I won't need any persuading to bring the Orca Queen and her pack back to the pages of Analog. Joshua Cole Dear Trevor, I have two comments to make about the brass tax department in the September-October 2019 issue of Analog. First, the ending comment, rights for a book are complicated. Right you are. They are so complicated that even Google, with all its resources and the will to use them, could not overcome all the complications. Have you ever wondered whatever happened to their project to digitize every printed book, create a database of all the content, and make it searchable online? The long, sad story is told at https colon slash slash getpocket.com slash explore slash item slash torching hyphen the hyphen modern hyphen day hyphen library hyphen of hyphen Alexandria. Second, Bob Scherer's response to Paul Budney's letter is somewhat misleading in stating that proof in science differs from that in mathematics. In fact, the underlying concepts are the same in both disciplines. The way I've seen it stated in discussions of the philosophy of science is you can't prove a negative, which pretty well aligns with Scherer's example of the Goldbach conjecture, which clearly falls into the mathematical domain. To compare that to proof of a scientific theory, let's consider the iconic example of Einstein's theory of relativity. Nowadays, that is pretty well generally accepted as proven, even though we don't have a deductive system of proof corresponding to that in mathematics. So why do we say it's proven? As I once saw it stated, neither the most ingenious experiment nor the most careful observation has ever revealed a case where it failed to hold. So it really comes down to the definition of proof. Scientists accept the definition stated in the previous paragraph. Mathematicians don't. But scientists also know well that a situation may arise in the future that might cause the theory to fail, as Einstein did to Newton's theory of motion, for example, which required their replacement. So, while theories can be scientifically proven, that proof is always considered provisional, pending the outcomes of future experiments. And to this day, whenever a new phenomenon is discovered, the possible impact on Einstein's theories are examined, and if needed, an experiment to test that is performed. So far, Einstein's theories have always passed the tests. Howard Mark, Suffern, New York Dear Editor, I see from recent news reports that John Campbell has become an unperson. I found that rather ironic, given Stan Schmidt's recent guest editorial in the pages of this magazine about his relationship with Campbell. I do not write to defend Campbell. 
He's been dead for 48 years now. Like all humans, he had his flaws, some great and some small. His legacy, good and bad, remains. I am, however, dismayed by the reports of the level of venom and the invectives used. I have difficulty understanding that level of hatred for a person Miss Ng is unlikely to have ever known or met. I would note two things. All heroes have feet of clay, even your own, whoever they might be. Second, hatred expressed like that is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. In the end, it does no one any good. Our culture these days is very good at tearing things down it's much harder to build. We must also realize that history demonstrates that every time and culture have their moral blind spots. Perhaps the one this current culture has is self-righteousness. Perhaps not. But it has at least one. Could it be that people and the past are just a bit more complicated than can be expressed in a soundbite? I also found it most ironic that, at the same world con where Ms. Ng won her award, the 1944 Retro Hugos were given, by the same voters. The award for Best Editor of 1944? John W. Campbell. To close, I would, however, remember one Campbell quote, Write me a creature that thinks as well as a man, or better than a man, but not like a man. That strikes at the heart of what science fiction is and will not be soon forgotten. Ken Gilbert, Columbus, Ohio. P.S. I have also found it interesting that those who like to call dead white guys fascist seem to forget that some of them got dead by actually fighting real fascists. As that famous philosopher Inigo Montoya once said, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Fascism seems to have been redefined into anyone whose politics we don't like. We welcome your letters, which should be sent to Analog, 44 Wall Street, Suite 904, New York, New York, 10005, or email to analog at dellmagazines.com. Space and time make it impossible to print or answer all letters, but please include your mailing address even if you use email. If you don't want your address printed, put it only in the heading of your letter. If you do want it printed, please put your address under your signature. We reserve the right to shorten and copy edit letters. The email address is for editorial correspondence only. 2019 Index. Reading time, 20 minutes. Here is the Index to 2019, Analogs, Volume 134. Entries are arranged alphabetically by author, with month and page. When the author's name and or part of the entry's title is omitted, it is the same as that of the previous entry. Multiple entries by the same author are listed alphabetically according to the story-slash-article title. Collaborations are listed under all authors with cross-references. Unless otherwise noted, each entry is identified as an alternate view, editorial, fact article, guest editorial, novella, novelette, Poem, Probability Zero, Serial, Special Feature, or Short Story. Elizabeth R. Adams, Rising Stars, Short Story, March-April, page 118. Antha Ann Adkins, The Annual Argument at the De-Extinction Board Meeting, Short Story, September-October, page 84. Edward Ashton, Wolves, Short Story, November-December, page 76. Tony Ballantyne, Trespass, Novelette, September-October, page 170. Phoebe Barton, Midway on the Waves, Short Story, May-June, page 116. A Square of Flesh, a Cube of Steel, Short Story, September-October, page 132. Gregory Benford and Albert Jackson, Building a Gravitational Wave Transmitter, Fact Article, September-October, page 36. Christopher L. Bennett, Conventional Powers, Novelette, September-October, page 118. Marie Bilodeau, Molecular Rage, Short Story, September-October, page 160. Nelson Adrian Blish, Tesseract, Poem, July-August, page 197. Bruce Boston, At the Natural History Museum, Poem, May-June, page 181. 
Michael Carroll, Just a Guy and Some Aliens, Short Story, November-December, page 70. Adam Troy Castro, The Savannah Problem, Novella, January-February, page 166. The Gorilla in a Tutu Principle, or Pecan Pie at Minnie and Earl's, Novella, September-October, page 8. Vajra Chandra Sakara, Running the Gullet, Short Story, March-April, page 69. Robert R. Chase, Vault, Novelette, July-August, page 10. G. O. Clark, Continuum, Poem, September-October, page 83. David L. Clements, Sailors of the Second Sun, Short Story, July-August, page 72. Eric Klein, Paradigm Shift, Short Story, May-June, page 136. J. Cole, Solve for X, Short Story, November-December, page 138. Joshua Cole, The Orca Queen, Short Story, May-June, page 127. Ron Collins, I Dreamed You Were a Spaceship, Short Story, September-October, page 142. Eric Klein, Ghost of Christmas Future, Short Story, November-December, page 63. John G. Kramer, Are Humans Too Fragile for Life in Space? Alternate View, January-February, page 73. Ghost Galaxies from an Older Universe? Alternate View, March-April, page 63. Opus 200, How Big is the Proton? Alternate View, May-June, page 60. Neutrino Relics from the Big Bang? Alternate View, July-August, page 82. Bio-reprogramming and multi-century lifespans. Alternate view. September-October, page 80. Quantum entanglement across time. Alternate view. November-December, page 60. Dave Creek. The dominant heart begins to race. Novelette, May-June, page 102. Leah Sipis. Parenting license. Short story. March-April, page 56. Uncommon. Short story. July-August, page 138. Craig Delancey, Sojourner, Short Story, November-December, page 94. Christina De La Rocha, Geoengineering, Coming Soon to a Planet Near You, Fact Article, November-December, page 23. Eric Del Carlo, Final Say, Short Story, March-April, page 82. Paul Filippo, Monarch of the Feast, Novelette. July-August, page 116. Andrew P. Dillon. Werner Heisenberg admits he never loved. Poem. March-April, page 145. S. B. Divya. Soft We Wake. Short Story. January-February, page 124. Buzz Dixon. Labor-Saving Relations. Short Story. July-August, page 78. Douglas F. Deleuzen. Epigenetics, The Future of Genetics in Health and Fiction, Fact Article, January-February, page 29. Serena Dory, A Mate, Not a Meal, Novelette, March-April, page 178. Matt Dovey, The Movements of Other Starfish, Short Story, November-December, page 144. Brendan Dubois, The New Martian Way, Short Story, March-April, page 124. A Family Rendezvous, Short Story, September-October, page 98. Andy Dudak, Love in the Time of Immunosharing, Short Story, January-February, page 38. Thariah Dyer, A Civilization Dreams of Absolutely Nothing, Novelette, January-February, page 98. David Ebenbach, Welcome to Your Machines, Short Story, May-June, page 159. Greg Egan, the Slipway, Novelette, July-August, page 180. Bond Elam, Fine-Tuning, Short Story, March-April, page 66. Lewis Evans, The Prince of Svalbar, Short Story, November-December, page 54. Michael F. Flynn, The Singing City, Short Story, September-October, page 147. James C. Glass, Beneath a Red Sun, Novelette, March-April, page 10. Tom Green, Better, Novelette, March-April, page 158. Stuart Greenhouse, Galileo Falling, 
Poem, January-February, page 136. James Gunn, The Little Sailboat, Probability Zero, March-April, page 62. Austin Habershaw, Applied Linguistics, Short Story, January-February, page 88. Shane Halbach, The Last Squirrel Keeper, Short Story, January-February, page 58. C. Stuart Hardwick, Dangerous Company, Novelette, March-April, page 92. Do We Still Need NASA? Fact Article, July-August, page 34. Frederick Garrow Heimbach, Fingers, Short Story, January-February, page 129. Howard V. Hendricks, The Narrowest Eye, Short Story, January-February, page 80. Liam Hogan, Galena, Short Story, May-June, page 42. M. K. Hutchins, The End of Lunar Hens, Short Story, March-April, page 112. Albert Jackson and Gregory Benford, Building a Gravitational Wave Transmitter, Fact Article, September-October, page 36. Tom Jolly, Ring Wave, Novelette, January-February, page 9. Shooting Stars, Short Story, July-August, page 59. Brenda Colt, Awakening in the Anteroom of Heaven, Short Story, September-October, page 44. Rajan Khanna, Binary, Short Story, November-December, page 84. Gary Kloster, Formless, Novelette, November-December, page 30. Matthew Kressel and Mercurio de Rivera, The Walk to Distant Suns, Novelette, March-April, page 146. Mary Soon Lee, Forever, Short Story, January-February, page 76. How to Time Travel, Poem, May-June, page 163. Edward M. Lerner, Clockwork Cataclysm, Short Story, January-February, page 78. The Gates of Paradise, Short Story, May-June, page 92. Paradise Unbound, Short Story, September-October, page 66. Anthony Lewis, Upcoming Events, Editorial, January-February, page 208. Upcoming Events, Editorial, March-April, page 208. Upcoming Events, Editorial, July-August, page 208. Upcoming Events, Editorial, September-October, page 208. Upcoming Events, Editorial, November-December, page 208. Marissa Lingen, Painting the Massive Planet, Short Story, May-June, page 164. Filaments of Hope, Short Story, November-December, page 66. Richard A. Lovett. The Zircons of Hades, Alternate View, January-February, page 112. From Pele to Pele, Fact Article, March-April, page 24. Biolog, Eric Del Carlo, Special Feature, March-April, page 91. Biolog, Joe M. McDermott, Special Feature, May-June, page 69. Looking for Signs of Ancient Earth on the Moon, Alternate View, September-October, Page 144. Smartphones, Earthquakes, Stealth Cars, and Sniper Attacks. Alternate View. November-December. Page 146. Mary E. Loud. The Three Laws of Social Robotics. Short Story. May-June. Page 70. Freya Marska. What We Named the Needle. Short Story. July-August. Page 130. Bruce McAllister. A Former Planetary Ruler Speaks. Short Story. May June, page 58. Tim McDaniel, Hop and Hop with Gleep Glop Geep, a bedtime reader. Short story, March April, page 32. Joe M. McDermott, Full Metal Mother. Short story, May June, page 63. Finnegan Bring the Pain. Short story, July August, page 158. Astro Boy and Wind. Short story, September October, page 152. Keep the Line Tight But Not Too Tight, or Esteban and the Moon, short story, November-December, page 117. Jack McDevitt, Tea Time with Aliens, short story, March-April, page 103. Joe Miles, The God of All Mountains, short story, March-April, page 48. Mario Milosevic, The Swarm, short story, September-October, page 77. Christian Monson, 
Shut-Ins, Short Story, September-October, page 140. Alice in Mulvihill, Empty Box, Short Story, November-December, page 141. Alec Navala Lee, At the Fall, Novelette, May-June, page 182. Wendy Nickel, 1220 Bus from the Basics, Short Story, May-June, page 56. Phoebe North, All Tomorrow's Parties, Short Story, July-August, page 90. Julie Novikova, All the Smells in the World, Short Story, January-February, page 65. Dreaming Up the Future, Short Story, July-August, page 153. From So Complex a Beginning, Short Story, September-October, page 106. Martian Fever, Novelette, November-December, page 104. J. O'Connell, You Must Remember This, Novella, November-December, page 170. Amy Ogden, Lulu's Friends, Short Story, January-February, page 116. The Quarantine Nursery, Short Story, November-December, page 149. Jerry Oltian, An Eye for an Eye, Novelette, November-December, page 8. Josh Pierce, Leave Your Iron at the Door, Novelette. May June, page 168. Susan Peters, The View from Proxima Centauri, Novelette, January February, page 154. Jennifer R. Povey, Temple of Children, Short Story, January February, page 118. The Waters of a New World, Short Story, September October, page 88. Ken Pointer, New Planet Landscape 6, Poem, July August, page 33. Moisture, Poem, November-December, page 83. Brad Pressler, Negotiating Traffic, Short Story, March-April, page 40. Trevor Quatry, A Conspiracy of Dunces, Editorial, July-August, page 4. Odds and Ends, Part 1, Editorial, November-December, page 4. Jesse Randall, Hertha Ayrton, Poem, November-December, page 103. Dan Reed, a Wonderful Thing to Say, Short Story, July-August, page 99. Robert Reed, Reboot, Short Story, January-February, page 121. Mercurio D. Rivera and Matthew Kressel, The Walk to Distant Suns, Novelette, March-April, page 146. Don Sakers, The Reference Library, Editorial, January-February, page 195. The Reference Library, Editorial. March April, page 198. The Reference Library. Editorial. May June, page 198. The Reference Library. Editorial. July August, page 198. The Reference Library. Editorial. September October, page 199. The Reference Library. Editorial. November December, page 199. Robert Scherer. Disciplined Daydreaming. Guest Editorial. March April. Page 4. Portal. Short Story. July-August. Page 104. Stanley Schmidt. Speed Demons. Guest Editorial. January-February. Page 4. The Methuselah Generation. Short Story. May-June. Page 32. John and Me. Guest Editorial. May-June. Page 4. Sequoias and Other Myths. Poem. September-October. Page 117. J.T. Shera. A Message from Our Sponsor, Short Story, January-February, page 49. Forgetfulness, Novelette, May-June, page 81. Martin L. Shoemaker, On Her Shoulders, Novelette, September-October, page 55. Alex Schwartzman, Repairs at the Beijing West Space Elevator, Short Story, May-June, page 154. Frank Smith, Cactus Season, Short Story, May-June, page 51. Bud Sparhawk, The Fading Pages of a Short Story, Short Story, January-February, page 138. The Invitation, Short Story, March-April, page 116. Mulligan, Short Story, May-June, page 74. Norman Spinrad, Personalized People, Short Story, September-October, page 86. Alan M. Steele, more Than One Way to Skin a Starship, Guest Editorial, September-October, page 4. Guy Stewart, 
Robotic space killers, autonomous, broke. Probability zero. May, June, page 166. Road veterinarian, novelette. September, October, page 182. Kamsahamni da America, novelette. November, December, page 156. Eric James Stone. A potential application of induced resonance in a four-dimensional crystal of quantum space-time. Short story. July, August, page 164. John Alfred Taylor. The Umwelt of the Shark. Short story. January, February, page 70. Steve Rasnick Tem. Captain Zack and the Data Raiders. Short story. July, August, page 143. Mark W. Tiedemann. Follow Past Meridian. Short story. November, December, page 132. Harry Turtle Dove, Bone Hunters, Novelette, May, June, page 9. John Edward Uth, Moon Santa Mongo, Short Story, November, December, page 44. James Van Pelt, Second Quarter and Counting, Short Story, March, April, page 74. John J. Vester, The Venus Sweet Spot, Floating Home, Fact Article, May, June, page 26. A Life in Particle Archaeology, Short Story, July-August, page 66. Marie Vibert, A Place to Stand On, Short Story, January-February, page 146. We Carry, Poem, March-April, page 55. Sean Vivier, News from an Alien World, Short Story, September-October, page 93. Leo Vladimirsky, The Babbage Tour, Short Story, July-August, page 85. Cynthia Ward, On Stony Ground, Short Story, May, June, page 146. Catherine Wells, The Quality of Mercy, Novelette, July, August, page 42. J. Werkheiser, Slow Dance, Short Story, March, April, page 135. Allison Wilgus, A Neighborhood for Someone Else, Short Story, July, August, page 148. Stephen R. Wilk, Yamadori, short story, November, December, page 126. Nick Wolven, The Eyes of Alton Arnhauser, novelette, July, August, page 166. It's N Lab time again. Reading time, three minutes. Your ballot will be automatically entered in our drawing for a free one year subscription. Welcome to the year 2020. As usual, we're asking you to choose your favorites via the Analytical Laboratory. Not only will your votes provide tangible awards for authors and artists, but your feedback will help guide the selections we offer you in the future. Your vote is important. Look over all your copies of Analog dated 2019 or refer to the index on the following pages. Pick your three favorites in each of the following categories, novella, novelette, short story, science fact article, cover, and poetry. If you're not sure about a piece's category, you'll find it listed both in the table of contents for the issue in which it appeared and in the index. In the event of a disagreement between the table of contents and the index, the index should be considered correct. List your choices in order of preference. Your favorite in each category is number one, on the ballot below, and either mail it in or send it by email. You can also vote at our website, www.analogsf.com. The ballot is intended to make it easier for you to vote, but if you don't want to cut it out, feel free to copy it. To be sure your vote counts, please have it reach us by February 1st, 2020. Please only vote once. Thank you very much. Votes via snail mail, NLAB, Analog, 44 Wall Street, Suite 904, New York, New York, 10005. Votes via the internet, www.analogsf.com or analogsf at dellmagazines.com. Novellas. One, two, three. Novelettes. One, two, three. Short stories. One, two, three. Science fact. One, two, three. Cover. One, two, three. Poem. One, two, 
3. Name, address, signature. Please vote. Upcoming events. Anthony Lewis. Reading time, 4 minutes. Note. Membership rates and other details often change after we have gone to press. In addition, most conventions have age-based membership rates in advance and at the door. There also may be rates for single days. Check the websites for the most recent information. 6-8 December 2019. SMOFCON 37. SF Convention Runner Conference at Hyatt Regency, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Central theme? All left turns, making the right plans. Info, https colon slash slash www.smofcon37 hyphen abq dot org slash. 17 to 19 January 2020. Cosine 2020. Colorado Springs SF Conference at Hotel Elegante, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Guest of Honor, Eric Flint. Science Guest of Honor, Courtney Willis. Artist Guest of Honor, Perry Charlifu. Toastmaster, Connie Willis. Info, firstfridayfandom.org slash cosign. 17-20 January 2020. Aresia 2020, New England SF Conference at Weston Boston Waterfront. Author Guest of Honor, Cadwell Turnbull. Artist Guest of Honor, Christina Carroll. Fan Guest of Honor, Arthur Chu. Info, www.aresia.org 13-16 February 2020 Capricorn 40 Chicago Area SF Conference at Weston Chicago North Shore Author Guest of Honor Tobias Buckle Artist Guest of Honor Trung Lee Nguyen Trungles Fan Guest of Honor Lillian Sams Info www.capricorn.org Info at capricorn.org 14 to 16 February 2020, Boscone 57, New England SF Conference at Weston Boston Waterfront. Guest of Honor, Kim Stanley Robinson. YA Fiction Guest, Holly Black. Official Artist, Eric Wilkerson. Music Guest, Cheshire Moon. Hal Clement Science Speaker, John Singer. Nesfa Press Guest, Jim Burns. Info, www.boskone.org. P.O. Box 809. Framingham, Massachusetts, 01701. 20 to 23 August 2020, NASFIC 2020, North American SF Convention, at Sheraton Columbus Hotel, Columbus, Ohio. Guests of honor, authors, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. Artist, Stephanie Law. Editor, Christopher J. Garcia. Science, Mark Millis, NASA. Fans, Sue and Steve Francis. 1632 Minicon Guest, Eric Flint. Info, http colon slash slash columbus2020 nasfic dot org slash. 29 July to 2 August 2020, Con Zealand, 78th World Science Fiction Convention at TSB Arena and Shed 6, Intercontinental Hotel, Michael Fowler Center, Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Author guests of honor, Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon, New Zealand Artist Guest of Honor, Greg Broadmoor. Fan Guest of Honor, Rose Mitchell. Toastmaster, George R. R. Martin. This is the SF Universe's annual get-together. Professionals and readers from all over the world will be in attendance. Talks, panels, films, fancy dress competition, the works. Nominate and vote for the Hugos. Info, https colon slash slash nz slash. End of Analog Science Fiction and Fact, Astounding, for January-February 2020. Recorded in the studios of Talking Book Publishers Incorporated for the Library of Congress, January 2020. Published by Dell Magazines, a division of Crosstown Publications, 6 Prowett Street, Norwalk, Connecticut, 06855. Further reproduction or distribution in other than an accessible format is prohibited. If you experienced any difficulty with your copy of this magazine, please specify the problem on a postcard or letter addressed to Materials Development Division, National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, Washington, D.C., 20542, or send an email message to qas at loc.gov.
End of book.